Hey cuties, how's it going today? All right, today's gonna be, well, it's gonna be researchy, but not researchy in the way of the last few streams. Seems people don't like the research streams as much, and I'm, I feel like it sometimes can be difficult to convey when you're trying to uh, explore the faults of something and not come off as attacking that. And I think that's important. I'm probably gonna stick more away from, from some of the AFL stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of sick of this meme where I'm I'm hating on AFL every stream, which is fair because that's what I'm doing. So I think it's important to kind of discuss the things that I do and don't like about AFL, so people can hear in a very very simple manner the things I like and don't like about AFL. I think. AFL has absolutely fantastic mutators. I think the mutators that AFL uses, and when I say mutators, I mean the things in AFL that take a stream of bytes and then turn it into a slightly different stream of bytes are fantastic. I don't think they're really that advanced or crazy or special, but I think that they are the bare minimum, which is also very close to the best thing that you can do in a generic sense. And that is you randomly flip bits, you randomly flip bytes, you randomly splice in parts of other inputs or the current input, you randomly repeat sequences in the current input to maybe find an out-of-bounds condition, you uh, randomly add or subtract different size uh, words, so 8-bit, 16 bit 32 64 you know whatever whatever those sorts of mutations are perfect and they are kind of the the standard set of mutations and i think all of them should exist in a standard fuzzer i think they're great the things where i think afl has some weaknesses well actually the usability of afl is also fantastic the documentation is really good the community support is good the blogs that exist are really good so i think that's important to get out of the way those things i i I really don't see much improvement on those things other than tiny percentages of improvements to those things. But the things that I don't like, I don't like that AFL is very Linux centric. I don't like that AFL is written in C. Obviously it predates uh, kind of when Go and Rust came around, but I would love to see it rewritten in a different language such that it's easier to work with and there's less worry about corruption and there, there's less code around bounds checking literally everything that happens because that's how you have to write C. But I do not like, and since it's written in C, it has some properties that a lot of C code has. It uses globals fucking everywhere. Pretty much everything in AFL is in a global. And when you put everything in a global, you end up in a situation where you can't run multiple copies of the fuzzer. And when you can't run multiple copies of the fuzzer, it makes it a lot harder to, to use threads and other things to your advantage where you can fuzz different targets. What I'd really like to see, to be honest, would be take AFL's mutator, basically all this stuff in like AFL fuzz one, AFL plus plus, take pretty much all like the Havoc stages, all the different stages of the mutator, rewrite them in Rust, and then rewrite the fork server implementation. Uh, all of the like Clang modifications to get coverage, those are good. Those are just objectively good and there's really nothing to change or improve there. Um, but I don't like, I think AFL should be written in a thread safe way. And I know people are working on getting thread support in there. But once again, I hate adding thread support and posts to things because you end up just hacking shit in. So anyways, I think AFL's mutators are really good. I think you can't really beat them with any other generic mutator. Not because they're really that exotic in AFL, but because they're just, they're just the set of good things to do when you're mutating. Um... I wish it was written in a different language, and I wish it was thread safe. I wish it had a dash J support for jobs. Um, I wish it could work better with 64-bit uh, ASAN builds. I don't know what the bottleneck is there. It's probably on the compiler side of things, but that would be really nice to see because fuzzing 32-bit things can, can make it a lot harder to use strong mitigations because you have such a small address space to work with and spread objects out over. Um... And I really wish it wasn't so Linux-centric. I wish it wasn't written in this way that it's built so closely around fork and shared memory and other properties that are Linux-specific. And I wish those things were put in something like a Rust trait where you kind of generically did those things. Um, I really don't think it would be that hard to rewrite AFL in Rust and keep it at parity with the command line and all of that stuff. But I don't know. 
My complaints with AFL are largely on the the Linux centricness and the source centricness um, and kind of the complexity of the code base and how unwieldy it is to work with. But that aside, I think we'll get more into some of the advanced fuzzing stuff, which is more my specialty. I think um, this stream will highlight some of my strengths a lot more than some of the previous ones where I'm looking at AFL and critiquing AFL. And we'll talk about some of the reasons uh, some of the reasons why I've gone down certain paths with my uh, fuzzing. Um, I would say I focus less on generic fuzzing like AFL, and I focus more on target-specific fuzzing. That means when I'm fuzzing a target, I typically expect that I will be writing a full parser for whatever RFC I'm fuzzing. If I'm fuzzing SMB, I'm writing an SMB client and server, and I'm writing a way that I can parse the stream of packets into an object representation, and then I'll perform mutations on the object representation, and I'll serialize that out. And in a lot of situations, that means that I basically need to write a complete parser for a spec, which is a lot of work. But that is often what it takes to find really hard bugs. In, in targets like... Um, Targets like Chrome and targets like SMB and targets like RDP, things like AFL really start to fall apart because they're very generic. And that is not an insult to AFL. Those things are not, to our human knowledge, are not solvable generically. Those are very hard problems and they require massive amounts of human intervention. Um, I wouldn't expect AFL to find something like that or really any other generic fuzzer. But when you get into the realm of trying to find the more complex or the more impactful bugs, you're looking for things that aren't bugs and parsers in code that's typically not a, a privilege escalation service, a surface. Um, you have to get into much more complex things of uh, writing syscall interfaces and writing things like uh, S trace for your fuzzer where you parse out all the syscalls that you're doing and just a lot of things that kind of go into fuzzing. Um, I have a non-zero interest in, in rewriting AFL in Rust, if that's something people would want to see, where I would basically, I'd start by writing all the mutators in Rust, and I'd make something that takes a, an input slice and has a mutable output slice, and it just takes the input and it mutates it in the same way of AFL, and then we can work on getting the hooks from the, the coverage bitmaps and stuff in shared memory, and we can just get kind of that introspection that you get with AFL, and we could start working on kind of going that direction and seeing if we could get a, a thread-safe version of AFL. Obviously, it depends on your target. If your target is not thread-safe, there's nothing you can do, unless you do emulation or um, you do syscall emulation, which is what I typically do. And that's something that I am a big fan of. I don't and I think pretty much anyone who works with AFL can agree with me that um, AFL has a concept of, uh, what is it, stability, I think they call it, which is basically the stability is not 100% if something about the execution of an input changes between multiple runs of the program. Um, and I think we all can agree that when you have a stability lower than 100%, it makes it a lot more difficult to make decisions about how to fuzz because you can't you can't guarantee that the same input has the same effect every time and thus it's very hard to make assumptions that okay well this byte was touched and caused this path to change and thus this byte is responsible for that when you have non-determinism you can't really make those assumptions because they're risky because they're not true it's not guaranteed that that path was caused specifically by that byte um, and that's the reason why I really like emulator based fuzzing I really like emulating the syscalls and making sure that there's no way that the target under test has any source of external entropy and I'd really like to see something like that where basically we write something that um, I don't know, maybe, is that something people want to see? Where we would, we would take AFL's mutators, we'd take AFL's clang modifications to get coverage, so we'd have coverage in a target, we would then interpret that data, we would use the mutators from AFL, and then we would uh, compile applications in a way that they don't omit the syscall instruction, and those syscall instructions would be um, turned into calls, and then we'd use that to emulate Linux in process, which means that it that the the target under test has no source 
directly to the file system or to syscalls or to time or any of these things that could give it entropy. And we could make a fuzzer that is always deterministic in AFL, but still has the native performance properties of running natively. Um, that's something I've kind of always thought about doing. The problem is I really have no use for it myself because I have tools that already do it in more of an emulator context. But I think that might be helpful for people who struggle in the emulator context to, to get some of those bullet points. Um, what I'd really like to see uh, is you make a competitor to Electron Jazz with better performance and memory and be the hero we need. I mean, that's that's really tough. I mean, to be a competitor to e Electron JS, I'd argue that you need to spin up a couple hundred threads that are doing almost nothing. You have to have a lot of things doing polling, and you have to use a JIT. And it would be very hard to get at feature parity without implementing the same performance features of, of Electron JS because they're 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 critical to the to the operation of Electron JS. Like there's no way that the garbage collector that they use in Electron JS works nearly as well if you don't use as much memory. So the more memory we use, the better the garbage collector is, and thus if we want to use the Electron JS garbage collector, honestly, we should probably try to 10x our thread and memory usage, so we can really uh, benefit from that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, I do think it would be possible to make a um, OS agnostic version. Obviously, it wouldn't work on Windows syscalls because they're too hard to emulate, but it would be very Linux focused and it would not use any syscalls and it would use shared memory for all the comms and you wouldn't have any scalability issues and you wouldn't have any determinism issues so you could prove that everything works in a certain order. But we're not doing that today. We're going to talk about emulators, mainly because I think emulators solve the problems that I'm talking about, but in an, a, a, just in a universally better way. And we're going to talk about, we're going to make some hard programs. Um, Okay, so we're going to go into Grizzly, and I was playing around with AFL here, and I just had a test program, and I'm going to, actually, does anyone know, oh, um, does anyone know if you can build AFL instrumentation into Rust? Is that a, is that a thing you can do? Because if I can write all this stuff in Rust, I'm going to be a lot happier. Because writing stuff in C is a pain in the ass. Um, uh, let's see. There'd have to be... Because I think they're LLVM passes, right? Uh, I'm going to see Rust AFL. Fuzzing Rust code with AFL. And what do you do here? Um, doop, 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 doop. The Rust Fuzz Book. Okay, I think there might be a way. Do I need to use this thing? I don't know if this gives coverage. Yeah, it doesn't look like this is giving coverage. All I need to do is build it with the, with the coverage map. Um... How does that actually work in AFL? AFL LLVM pass.so. And does that do everything or does AFL inject some extra stuff? I saw AFL.rs, but I didn't see if this actually gave coverage. It seems like there's a, a cargo fuzz, but I don't see how it's actually using. It looks like it can use libfuzzer, which is great, but I don't see where it's doing coverage. Um, cargo AFL provided by the AFL crate that automatically passes these rusty flags for us. Oh, maybe it does do it. Okay, let's try it. Let's see if this works. So, uh, 
I'm guessing I can just cargo install it. Cargo install afl.rs. Um. Because there's a cargo thing. How to build that clang, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. All right. Well, I don't have 100% confidence in it. So we're going to go to. We're going to go to. Uh, we'll do it in C. And what we have here is the best AFL harness in the world. And this is going to be fuzz me. And this will take a unsigned char input and a size C size. And this is just going to be something that reads a file from disk in, in its entirety and then calls fuzz me with the, in, uh, with the buff and the file length, right? That's all this does. And then it just invokes this function. Uh, so what we can do is just have that run. So this is now running in AFL, and we can have this do whatever we want. So if we had this do uh, built-in trap, this would hopefully be caught as a crash. Yeah, it doesn't even run because it crashes by default. And we could say, like, if input 5 is 1, 2, then built-in trap. And now we have a conditional bug, and AFL finds it. Fantastic, right? No surprise there. So what we want to do is we want to talk about some of the more difficult concepts when you get into fuzzing. And those are having multi-byte comparisons or having, um, or when you have, uh, like, mem compares. So we'll try with a multi-byte comparison. So what we're going to do is we'll say if size is greater than or equal to 4 and the um, unsigned in inputs... Um, and I should be able to do that. I don't know if there's an under unaligned clang thing. Let me see how I can do that. Unaligned clang. Doop, doop, doop. I forget what the attribute is. There's some way, I forget what it is. I like the logo for that, for afl.rs. Yeah, it's really cool, actually. I like it quite a bit. It's like actually really fucking cool. Um, what is, I swear I've seen unaligned in, in Clang or GCC. Let's see. Um, doing unaligned memory access. Nope. I swore there was an, an attribute. I know you can do packed on a structure. Attribute aligned one. Does that work on a cast? In this situation, we're okay because the input is aligned from from that allocate, but anyways. So we're gonna say, if the input is dead beef, now will AFL be able to find this bug? Um, and the answer is no. I mean, yes, over enough time, yes, it will. But ultimately, this requires that four bytes are a very specific value. And AFL is not able to make any incremental progress through here. And we can demonstrate what AFL can find. We could say, if size is greater than or equal to 1 and input 0 is equal to OXEF, right? So if we do this, and hopefully the compiler doesn't um, optimize this into one compare, which it, it might, but maybe not. Okay, so, and then this is little endian. We'll grab all these, and we'll say greater than or equal to 2, 3, for and then built in trap and we'll see if afl can find this bug the answer should be yes unless the compiler optimizes this which i don't have optimizations on so it, afl should be able to find this bug 
It's taking a lot longer than I would expect it to take, but... Come on, AFL, you got this. There it is. So AFL was able to find this bug, and it took uh, about 130,000 execs, right? Now, why was AFL able to find this bug, which is identical to this one, right? It's the exact same input. If we look at um, uh, XXD outputs Q, and then we look at actually the crashes, we can look at this ID. And we can see that the crash is this D-E-A-D-B-E-E-F, dead beef, right? So the question is, why was AFL able to find this, but it's not able to find this bug? And this simply comes down to the way that comparisons are performed uh, by the compiler. So if we take a look at the uh, generated code of fuzzme, um, and let me see how I can do this best. So we'll do objdump dash d uh, copy a dot out to a dot out um, four bytes, and then we'll have these where we have same sort of thing, but one byte at a time, and we'll see if AFL can find it. There, it's making its way through it. It's finding a path, finding a path, so on and so forth. And we'll see. Eventually, it'll crash. And this input is identical to the other one, unless I got my Indianist wrong. But the 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 point is the same. But uh, yeah, this is dead beef, and it doesn't matter that there's additional crap afterwards. Th this is an acceptable crashing input as well. Um, oh, I guess this is, yeah, this is the same thing, uh, different input. Okay, so then we want to do objdump dash d on m intel, and this is on the one that does four bytes at a time, what we currently have on the left side. And we'll look at fuzzme, and what we'll find is that this will do a comparison on the size of the input, and then it'll do the branch, it'll compare a byte, do another branch, compare another byte, uh, or compare a size again, do another byte, right? And basically every single byte compare turns into a different branch. And to AFL, that means that you are able to um, get incremental progress. AFL is able to figure out that an input with EF is making progress, and then an input with EFBE, and then an input with E. EFBEAD, and so on and so forth. So the complexity of this problem is 256 times 4. It basically needs to get past these constraints um, four different times, right? You, you technically have the size constraint here, but that's not too bad. But this complexity is roughly 256 times 4. It has to get it has to make a 256 byte decision correctly. Then it has two inputs. It has to select the right input. It then has to pick uh, the next byte, and so on and so forth. So it's 256 times 4, which is a tiny number. This is, uh, is this 1024? Now, it's actually a little bit more complex than that because each time it sees a different branch, it saves another input, so the odds that it picks up that input decreases, and, and so on and so forth, right? So it's important to understand it's not exactly 1024. It's probably like 1024 times, like, Eight, which is like the number of inputs or paths that it has because it has to make the right decisions on the right inputs, right? Now, if we switch to a model like this, where we have a single 4-byte compare or a 32-bit compare, whatever you want to call it, um, it's not going to be able to find this bug. And the reason why is because this is a single compare of dead beef. And the complexity of this branch is actually 256 to the fourth power. It has to get all four bytes correct in the exact same corruption phase. So in one corruption, it has to somehow magically get dead beef put in there uh, in one pass. And 256 to the fourth is approximately four billion, right? And then this one, you don't have as many inputs. So in this case, let's say this is 1024. This is 4 billion, thus this will take approximately, uh, if we did 4 billion divided by 1024, this is about 4 million times harder to find. And when we're talking about 4 million times harder to find, we can simply just say 
it's not going to fucking find it. <laughs> right? If it took 150,000 fuzz cases to find the first one, well then this one, it would take uh, 600 million fuzz cases to find. No, 600 billion fuzz cases to find. And at this rate, uh, that's going to... Let's see how long that would take. 600, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, divided by 7.4... It would take approximately, really? Uh, two, two and a half years for this to find? So it'd take AFL about two and a half years to find this bug, even though it's a simple comparison and a crash. And this is why an input corpus is very important. AFL has a concept of, of uh, input splicing, where it will splice inputs that already exist. So if you were to be, if this were to be a valid path in your program, it's very likely this constant exists in one of the inputs. And if this exists in one of the inputs, then the odds are that AFL will end up splicing that in. And let's see if we can demonstrate that. Um, I'm going to change this to uh, um, 4443, So that's A, B, C, D in hex. And what we'll do is we'll dd if is dev, uh, we'll edit inputs, this base input, and we'll put in here a, b, c, d. And this should crash right away. Yep, it already crashes. So what we're going to do is put some extra crap out front. So let's say a, b, c, d is a valid thing in this program, and then we'll put some trash out front. So this is not a crashing input anymore. But AFL now has a much higher chance of finding this bug. And I think there's a good chance that it will find it. It basically has to cut out that part or splice the ending part of that input into the front of the fuzz case, which is reasonable, and I don't know how long it will take for AFL to do that. It just has to cut out some of those front bytes or splice something into the front. Um, we have it in deterministic mode, and that might hurt and help it, so we're going to take it out of deterministic mode. We'll put it in the quick and dirty mode. Okay, and it should eventually, <laughs> I would expect, splice that out to the front. You also have the concept of dictionaries in AFL, which I forget the correct way to specify one. Um, AFL, I don't know if you pass it on the command, yes, a dictionary file. So, let's take our dictionary and we'll put ABCD in our dictionary, and then we'll have AFL use that dictionary. Dash X dictionary. Um, uh, is there a format for this that you have to use? Okay. Um. Do do do. Magic headers and all these things. Pass it via okay dictionaries. And what is the format of this file? Um. Every name can be optionally followed by an at number, e.g. this. They'll only be loaded if the requested dictionary level is equal. Okay. So. Um, so we'll say apples. Okay, there we go. It finds the crash almost immediately. I'm actually kind of surprised it doesn't find it without the dictionary with the splicing. But basically it is randomly inserting things from the dictionary into the input and obviously it's going to be able to find this now so let's talk about how you can do this without a dictionary for example dictionaries typically only are going to work if you already have an existing dictionary you have to either manually make it yourself to the spec you have to have a grammar fuzzer that already has the dictionary um you have to take an existing piece of code or something to to, to build it or maybe you run object dump on your program and you add every single constant that's used in a comparison as part of um, use every single constant that's part of a comparison and you throw that in the dictionary and those things 
uh, work relatively well, but you have this problem that you end up in a situation where you have so many dictionary entries that it's very unlikely that it picks the right one. So the more things that you add, it, there, there's kind of this really difficult problem in fuzzing, which is the more complex your target is, the slower it is, which means the fewer fuzz cases per second you get, but it also means the more inputs you have and the more paths you have and the more uh, dictionary keywords you have. So you get to the situation where your perf is decreasing, but the number of fuzz cases you need to do to find anything is increasing, and both are kind of on exponential curves, and they're they're running away from each other, and it makes it exponentially harder to find some of these bugs as you get to more and more complex targets. And this is a weakness that I think a lot of fuzzers run into, and we're going to talk about some ways that we can get around that, and also in a lot of situations where you just can't. You just need the compute. So, what we're going to do is we're going to make the same bug in our, we're going to build this with our RISC-V compiler, um, and hopefully that's kind of in a decent state still, uh, and to do that, I think we need to, honestly, I think we just need to opt rv64i new lib bin this gcc um, test.c, and I should have an a.out that... Um, this is our test input. Oh yeah, and we change the shape of things. Uh, this will be A, B, C, D. Okay. And we'll build it for risk five. And this hopefully will crash. Oh, we have to build it static. Uh, oops, it out. out. Mm, oh, yeah, I have to use the custom QMU. Um, QMU risk v64. And we'll write, add an S trace. And we're able to see it reads baseline in this case, but we're going to have it read the test. And now we get a crash, which is fantastic. It reads in that input file, and then it hits the crash obviously because the bug is there. Now, if we also change this and switch it to the four byte comparison, we should also have the same crash. We'll see what happens here. Oops. Build it, run it. Okay, we still have the crash, but if we take a look at this, this binary will have the single comparison. Uh, here it doesn't add to get an offset to that, and then it checks if it's equal to A5. So it basically is... That's a really fancy way of getting that constant. No, it isn't. I see. Oh, this is getting confused because it's it thinks it's a symbol, but it's not. Load upper immediate, and then add this. This is going to form the immediate, the four byte immediate, and then we do a single comparison, and we say if the value that we read, the word that we read, is not equal, then we skip. If it is equal, then we hit our breakpoint. So this is the bug. Um, let's go back to the old mode. This is the the base mode here, and this should um, we should be able to find this with our fuzzer, but I have no idea what the state of things are. So we'll we'll go into uh, fuzz with emus, get status, get diff. Um, Oh, we added some symbol support. Symbol support. Get push. Okay. Sorry, I don't know why I didn't push that up. Okay, so... Um... SSH Grizzly. Go to Fuzz with Emus. Then we're going to go... Source. Main.rs. And... We probably should split these things up a little bit. I don't know why I'm doing everything in one file here. Um, obviously, because I was lazy. So there's stat, not expecting Burke. So let's see what happens. Oh, yeah, we have this. It now does the object dump parsing shit. Okay. So what we should be able to do 
is, um, and we have all the mallet cooks, which will just work. So we'll copy from AFL uh, SP a dot out, and this will be dot slash uh, for one byte compare. So we have this, and we'll say for one byte compare, and hopefully this just works. I don't remember what the state of this is. Let's see. Um, uh, JIT cache. We'll see. I don't remember inputs. Oh. We'll remove all existing inputs. Crashes, CJIT test. Ah. Uh, we have an LD script, log, arm star.txt. We should be able to get rid of all those. Get rid of foo. What was the LD script for? Are we using this? We are. Oh yeah, that's for linking the um, the JIT. Okay. So, okay, a twenty four unwrap on a nun. Looks like there's no realloc, which would make sense because it's just not used in the program. So we'll get rid of that. There we go. Took a snapshot. Uh, four fifty seven. Oh, we probably assume there's inputs in the corpus. So we'll say if. Uh, corpus.inputs.len is greater than zero, then we'll do this. Otherwise, emu.resize 0u8 1024. I don't know. Just set the input size to. Actually, we'll just set it to like 16 for now. Uh, and not emu. Fuzz input. So we'll set the fuzz input size to 16 bytes if we don't already have something. And this is opposite. I always get confused which order that goes in. And let's see. Took snapshot. Compiling the cache. And we're running our fuzz cases. And we should... Um, we'll go to if... The length is greater than zero. I'm just switching the mutator to something more simple. We'll just corrupt uh, rng.rand mod. We'll corrupt up to four bytes in the input. And we'll see what we can do here. Um, uh, why didn't I make that output so long? I guess we can go into this form. Okay, and do I not have coverage enabled? Because we're not seeing any uh, code coverage. Let me see if I have that disabled in some way or another, which I wouldn't be surprised if I did that. Um, okay. Can I... Hmm. All right. Uh, coverage. Source, not JIT cache. We want coverage bitmap. Update the coverage bitmap. Oh, I wonder. Oh, it's probably not seeing the input because we're passing in args that don't make sense for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have to pass in the file name. In this case, testfn. So we'll call it object dump, not that the program name matters. And then this will be arg1. OK, let's see if this does anything. Oops, 830. arg1. Right from arg1. Well, I broke something. Yes. There we go. We have to allocate room for arg1. 
Now, we need to see if it's actually hitting the open, which I'm guessing it's not right now. Um, print open test fn pink. Okay. This will take a snapshot when we hit uh, 1024, which is open. And we do seem to be hitting that. And is it not testfn as the file name for some reason? Uh, we just need to figure out what's going on in our harness. Doop, 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 doop. Is this called 93? Took snapshot at 134FC. Average dump dash D. 41 by compare. 134. Oops. 134FC. Oh, it's hitting exit. Okay, so let's figure out why it's hitting exit. Why would it not be hitting open there? We do our fopen. Do we symbolize these traces now? I can't remember if we did that. Um, coverage. Corpus.coverage.len. Doop, 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 doop. I don't remember what we were doing here. Can't remember what we hacked in last time. Oh, argc, we'll make that too. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is now hitting code, which is great. That's what we want to see. And we're getting coverage, which is fantastic. No surprise. Bunch grabs getting jitted here. And then open test fn. okay. Get rid of that print, and now we can see what's happening. And it should be able to find the crash unless we don't have a way of detecting e-break, which uh, I think we actually don't have a way. Panic e-break. That is in the emulator. That will VM exit with an e-break. So let's see why we're VM exiting. Um... So our right fault is crash, and then we'll say e-break um, turns into a fault type um, breakpoint, and we'll say software breakpoint, fault type uh, software breakpoint. A breakpoint occurred in the target binary. Okay. And there we go. We, we immediately hit the crash, right? Um, I don't even know when we do that. Uh, unique crashes. Enter your insert. I can add a... Um, We'll do uh, let crash fn is equal to this. And we'll do standard fs write to the crash fn. Write that and we'll print uh, new crash and we'll print the file name. Okay. So we'll see. Yeah, new crash, software breakpoint. Um, and then, um, on case percent this, and do I have a case ID? I don't know if I do. Yeah, I don't think I have a way of getting that case ID. Um... Like, I have local stats fuzz, fuzz cases. Um, uptime. 
Uh, start. Start a timer. That's for the stats thread. All right. Whatever. We'll have it print. New crash, blah, blah, blah. So we pretty much instantaneously hit that, which is no big surprise. 650. I'm going to get rid of this. Comment that out. Get rid of that. And then 618. Realic BP. We'll just put an underscore on this. Quiet that up a bit. There we go. So we instantly find that bug, which is no surprise, right? And I don't think we're using threads, are we? We are using threads. Okay. Sweet. And took snapshot at that. All right. Million instructions a second. Okay, that seems low. Let me see. Um, why are they starting up so slow and why is it using so much RAM? In 45, thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah. How's it going? All right, we need to figure out why we're leaking memory. Um, shit. Why would we be leaking um, resize? Fuzz input this. The only thing that would really cause Oh, all those dockers running, man. Fucking annoying. I was trying out the um What is the fuzzer benchmarking thing today? That like just came out. Magma? Yeah, I was trying out Magma, which uses Docker and now I've got dockers all over. <laughs> Reset time. Yeah, what's going on here? Why are we using so much RAM? Create an emulator with... We can probably decrease the amount of memory we're giving it, but I don't know if that was the problem. So I have to get rejit because it's new uh, new memory sizes. Going all right? How are you doing? Pretty good. We just started up here. Okay. Yeah, we just we shouldn't be allocating a gig per uh, per VM. That's fair. I'll give it that. Okay. So now this should be using all cores. Yeah. There we go. So all cores are pegged. And we're getting, you know, whatever fuzz cases a second. 15 million fuzz cases a second. Which is pretty solid. So. What are you, uh, what are you emulating? We're emulating some fake code right now that we're writing. Just to see kind of how quickly we can find certain bugs in it. Now, did some of those panic or die? No. Those threads just uh, took a little break. Okay. So, pretty solid. We have our code coverage numbers. We have our fuzz cases. We have a decent amount of perf, which is solid. So now, what we can do is we'll build that four byte compare. And to do that, we'll go to here. Comment this in, so it's a four byte compare. Build it, and then we'll copy that from uh, oops. Copy from AFLSP. The a dot out. And we'll copy this to a four byte compare. So now we can see can we find this bug? We were able to find the other one, but can we find this bug? And the answer is uh, kind of. <laughs> um, so there's a slightly different binary, of course, so we're going to get slightly different JITs. But luckily, our JIT caches will just work. So once those JIT caches are warmed, 
All right, they look good. All right. Here we go. So now we're running, and our goal is we want to find this bug where we need to get the dead B4 bytes there. And I'll remove um, uh, XXD crashes. So crashes has the, the ABCD crash, right? So I'm going to remove all crashes, and then we're going to see if this is able to find it when we have the 4 byte. Now, before it instantly found it, and now it's not so instantaneous, right? So, in this situation, we're really struggling to find this, this bug in the same way that AFL was. Now, we have a performance advantage over AFL by a, a significant factor, which allows us to probably still find this bug. It'll probably take like 10 billion fuzz cases, um, unless we get really lucky, right? So, but luckily, this fuzzer is, what, 12 million... AFL is getting 7,000, so we're about 2,000 times faster than AFL, which makes it a little bit more reasonable for us to find a bug like this. Obviously, we don't want to brute force through a 4-byte compare. That's way, 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 way too much work. So I'm going to leave that running, and then we'll talk about kind of how we can solve this problem and, and different solutions that I think are a lot more simple. So it's important to note that this sort of stuff is discussed in papers, this this what I call um, compare shattering. Uh, it's discussed in papers, and there's compiler modifications to do it, but it basically requires that you have a compiler mod, uh, a compiler modification and the ability to build code, which in my tools, I assume that you can't build code. Obviously, in this situation, we're building it for RISC-V, but if I were to be fuzzing something that was natively compiled in closed source in RISC-V, I could still use this emulator and all of the techniques I'm using. So it's important to understand that nothing that I'm doing here requires control of a compiler, whereas AFL and doing things kind of more on that compile side, you need to be able to build the code that you're fuzzing. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to talk about this compare shattering, what it is, how it works, um, and some of its limitations, which arguably aren't aren't very many. There aren't many limitations with it. So, well, um, honestly, this might be a draw IO. Um, can you diagram blank diagram? So, and then we'll check in on this and see if we are able to find this bug, which we should be able to, but it will take a lot of time. How big of an input do we do? 16 bytes? It has to pick basically... Ooh, yeah, the odds of this are, are very low. It will find this in probably like an hour, but it won't do it very quickly. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is... Um... We have a new diagram, and we're going to talk a little bit about program flow and the shapes of programs. So I'm going to keep checking in on that because I'm excited to see if it finds it. I think it will. Does it matter? No, not really. Okay, so we're going to talk about coverage guided fuzzers. No. No. Okay. Nice. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw our application right now. So um, we're going to ignore bounds checks because they don't matter. And we'll just say that um, this green path is the taken path, and this red one is the non-taken path. And this, all of the non-taken paths will effectively go to the same, same place. right? So this is the, the get out path. Um, Okay, so this we're going to say um, is byte 1 A, and then this one is is byte 2 B, and we'll do 0 indexed because that's what people are, are used to. Um, we'll say if byte 0 is equal to A, and we can say b, and we'll use the character syntax just so it's a little bit more clear. So, and then if byte one is a, and then we kind of repeat this over and over, where this will keep syncing. Oops. This will keep going down this bad path. I'll mark that one red. I'm trying to figure out the best way to lay this out. That's probably not it. Oh, 
Okay, I, I think this is acceptable. Um, if byte 1 is B, if byte 2 is C, if byte 3 is a D, and basically what we're going to show is why coverage-guided fuzzers are so important, and why basically everything does coverage-guided fuzzing. And it's for a very easy reason. Okay, and this is, uh, we'll say this is exit. And this one will be, we'll pull this down. Okay, and this is a crash. All right, so, and I'll color these green or whatever color this is that I'm using. I'm guessing this is not green, this is probably yellow. Is that yellow? Is this green? Is this green? All right, we'll, we'll use this one because I think it's more green. Um, all right, so, and let's see if we can reduce the, okay, I don't wanna, all right, we'll just zoom out a bit. Yeah, second one's green, god damn it. Why do they make colors so hard, man? Bullshit, it's rigged. Okay, so here is basically the program that we wrote. If the first byte is A, then we go here. If the first, if the second byte is B, then we go here. If the third byte is C, then we go here. If the fourth byte is D, then we go here and we crash. In all other situations, we just exit out of the program. Now, the reason why a coverage guided fuzzer is amazing is because it will start off, let's say it starts off with an input which is empty, right? So that is the input file, right? So I'll say input is equal to this, and we'll just blah. And we'll put this uh, left align. Okay. And then we'll change everything to courier new. And there we go. Now everything fits. Okay, so when the input is blank, what happens here is, and is there a way that I can like tighten this, collapse this? Yes. There we go. And can I collapse this down here? No. Okay. So we have input, which is blank. What will happen? Well, this block will get colored because we hit it, we hit this comparison, the comparison fails, and then we'll take the, f the fail path and we'll go to exit. And what we can say is that this, the summary of this is that the coverage is equal to two blocks, right? And we're just gonna talk about blocks, not edges or anything like that. So in this case, if we have an input that is this, and we'll put this over here. Input is blank and the coverage is two blocks. So now I'm gonna try this page out. This is, we'll rename this to um, input, empty input. So now what happens, delete duplicate, nice. And how do I center in the exact same place? Um, there's got to be a way that I can like view, reset view. Mm. I want to view, oh, here we go, fit window, perfect, fit window. So these should be, okay, sweet. So now we're gonna say, what happens if the input is B? Well, this is the same thing. The byte is not the correct byte, and we go down the fail path, and we get to an exit. But the second that we put an A here, and it doesn't matter, we could have trash afterwards, and we'll just say we magically put an A here. Well, this first comparison will pass, and we can say coverage is three. And since the coverage is increased from the initial input that was empty, save input. And at this point, we now have an input that has AJAG2390, which is my gamer tag. Um, it has this input saved in the corpus. 
Well, that means that we now can build upon this as a foundation for another uh, fuzz case. So let's do that. Let's go here. Um, control shift H. Now, all we need to do here is just corrupt this with a B. And if we do that, the coverage, this will get hit. And now we have four blocks of coverage. And we save the input. And now we build on this. And now the odds that we hit this, um, when we've gotten to this point, we don't need... Um, we don't need for, we don't need to randomly get this to become an A and this to become a B and then this one to become a C. We only need for this one character to become a C because we're building off of an existing input that we already know about. And then in this situation, this gets colored. Now this is coverage five blocks, save the input, build upon it, duplicate this, do this. And now we have to do just get one of those. And now coverage goes to six and we found a crash, right? That's it. That's it. That's how coverage guided fuzzing works. This is why, this is why coverage guided fuzzing is so important. All you're doing is you're taking, you're starting with nothing. You randomly corrupt it. In this case, we throw a bunch of random bytes here. A lot of them, which are incorrect. But one of them is right, which gets us incremental progress, which then gives us an indicator that coverage increased, which then gives us a reason to save this input. And then we just have to build on this input and build on this input and build on this input, and eventually we get our crash. Um, and yeah, we can say in that case, the exit is not hit, right? So we'll say this is uh, code cov. And this is like uh, first block, second block, third block, and then final block, trash. Okay. So now, does that make sense? That's, that's how code coverage works. That's why code coverage feedback makes you find bugs faster. Because... The odds of getting these four bytes correct in one corruption, it's, it's complex because it's based on your corruption strategy. Um, but assuming that you're just, your corruptor is literally setting the first four bytes of the input to four random bytes. If you do that, the odds that you hit this bug is one in four billion. The odds that you randomly generate A, B, C, D that's 256 different combinations for each byte. 256 to the fourth power is the same as getting a 32-bit thing correct, which is 2 to the 32nd percent. And then, or two, 2 to the 32nd percent, what the fuck does that mean? 2 to the 32nd, which is 4 billion, 4.2 billion, right? So the odds of randomly generating this is, is 1 in... Um, 1 in 4 billion. But when you have coverage-guided fuzzing, in this case... We have uh, corpus is one input, right? So for this to happen, it just picks up the blank, blank input from the corpus. It got two blocks of coverage. It's, that input's already in the corpus, and so we have one input. In this case, we now have, uh, what did I say? Corpus. Corpus is equal to two inputs, right? And the reason is we hit new coverage. We decided this input is worth saving. And we'll be, uh, I'm going to get rid of some of these letters. Or I guess in this case, they're numbers. But just to make it clearer, what we're going to do, the corpus currently in this situation is, um, it's a set which contains an empty input, right? But then we run this input through and we decide that our corpus now should actually be uh, our blank input and a jag. So the odds that we find this are 1 in 256, right? The complexity here, um, oops, fuck, damn it. Anyways, um, a jag. The odds that we find this bug are, assuming that we're corrupting one byte at a time, that's all our corruptor does, it picks a random byte, um, complexity is equal to the odds that we 
pick the correct byte multiplied by or the correct index of the input file to corrupt, and then the odds that we select the correct byte. So the odds that this happens is 1 over 4 times 1 in 256, which is 1 in 124, right? So that is the odds that we're able to find this, right? So we start off with nothing, 100% chance of this. Then in this situation, um, 1 in 4, the odds that we correct, corrupt the correct byte. This is assuming that somehow your fuzzer knows that it has to be specifically 4 bytes, right? If it doesn't know that, then you're then it, it's the complexity is different. But this is a 1 in 124 chance of happening. But when it happens, it then has two inputs in the corpus. And there's no selection here, but this is 1 over 1, which is the odds that we start with the correct input. And we'll just say uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, right, is the initial input, just so we can keep it simple. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, right? So then we now have done this. We now have an A bag where we put a B in here. Our coverage has gone to four blocks. And the odds that this happens, and now afterwards, this is the new corpus, the complexity is one and two. The odds that we pick the A jag instead of the one, 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 one. The odds that we set the correct, uh, that we pick the right byte of the input file, and then the odds that we actually corrupt the correct byte. And this is one in 2048, right? And then we'll continue on. This third block, this is ABCG. We have coverage, which is uh, now five blocks. This is now ABCG. The odds of this is one third because we have, we have to pick the AB input. There's technically, there's a little bit that's gained here because technically you could pick the AJAG and then corrupt two bytes, but in this case, we're only corrupting one byte at a time, so we have to pick the right one. This is now uh, uh, 3 times 4 times 256, which is uh, 3072. Okay, so that's the odds that we hit this. And then the odds that we actually hit our crash are ABCD. At this point, we have an ABC um, and an ABCD. We have to pick the right of the four inputs. Remember, ABCD is not an input until afterwards. And this is now a 1 in 4096, right? So the odds that we find this bug, assuming zero knowledge about the input, is 1 in 4096. And the coverage goes to uh, six blocks, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We have coverage of everything. Does that make sense? So as we're going through, we're building these, and then our probabilities of finding the next bug are decreasing because the odds that we take the correct input to build upon goes down. Now, obviously, you can use some biasing and weighting things to try to pick the most recent thing that got you progress, but that also can detract from exploring previous states in the program. So I personally like to do uniform, and I'm working on a lot of stuff to figure out how important it is to actually do uniform. But anyways, the odds that we find the bug is 1 in 4096. Now, the odds that we find that we uh, find the bug if we switch to a, we'll do this, duplicate, and this will be input is 1111, coverage is two blocks. So this block, uh, actually, I think I can select multiple. Oh, that's so nice. In this case, the corpus has a 1111. And in the case that we have the same mutator as before, as we flip one byte at a time, if we only mutate one byte at a time, and we were to change this, and this says if D word is equal to ABCD, right? So this is the new constraint, is that the D word has to be equal to ABCD. And then if it is, then we crash, right? So this is our much simpler program. And in this situation, the odds that we ever find this is 1 in inf. We will never find this because our corruptor only flips one byte at a time. It is impossible that we ever will corrupt four bytes that will cause us to go down this taken path. And this is why there are massive limitations in all fuzzers. 
if you end up handling all these edge cases, you end up never corrupting things in the right way. If you end up not doing any of these, you end up not having a situation where you ever can get down this path because it's impossible for you to corrupt four bytes at a time and thus cause this bug to occur. But let's say that we had a magical fuzzer that just knew to corrupt these first four bytes every single fuzz case. Well, the odds of this are one in 2 to the 32, because it's uh, 32 bits of complexity, which is equal to um, uh, 1 and 2 to the 32. This is equal to 1 in 256, the number of combinations for a byte, times the number of bytes, wait, uh, 2 the number of bytes, which is equal to 1 in 4.2 billion. So the odds that we find this bug, even though it is the exact same input, this input is a 1 in 4096, and this input, even though it's the exact same behavior of the program, this is a 1 in 4.2 billion. Uh, and for perspective, this basically is um, a million times harder to find, right? 4.2 billion divided by this, it's it's... This is a million times harder to find, or will take a million times the number of fuzz cases. And for a little bit of perspective of what a million is, that means um, this fuzzer, let's say we're getting 4,096 fuzz cases a second, right? Which is reasonable, actually. That's a pretty reasonable target. So we find this bug from scratch every second. If, if we were to delete our corpus every second, we would find this every second. But in the case of a million, this would then take uh, 3,600. Oops. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, divided by 3,600, divided by 24. This would take 11 days to find. Exact same bug. One second to find, 11 days to find. So how do we make something that is capable of finding these bugs. So uh, someone asked, does AFL do this? Does AFL do coverage-guided fuzzing? Yes, and a lot of people argue AFL is the first thing to introduce coverage-guided fuzzing to the public world, which I agree for introducing it to the public world, yes. But I wouldn't say AFL is the first thing to do coverage-guided fuzzing. But AFL will have the same problem with this. It, it would take AFL a couple days, probably 10 days to find this bug, and it would take AFL about a second to find this bug. Now, the correct way to solve this problem on any target is to understand that there is a special meaning to the bytes A, B, C, D for this program and to add it to the dictionary. And then that means that AFL would be able to find that. And we demonstrated that earlier in the stream. If we add A, B, C, D to a dictionary, AFL can find this bug in about a second, which makes sense because it's randomly injecting the dictionary word into the program, which is great because the odds, all it has to do is inject the dictionary. It has to pick the right input from the dictionary and pick the right offset in the file, in this case, offset zero of the file to inject that input and copy the whole input verbatim. And in that situation, AFL would be able to find it. But in a lot of situations, you're either A, too lazy to make a dictionary file, B, you have no way of generating a dictionary file, or C, the dictionary file that you would generate would basically include all numbers, all four byte numbers anyways, so at that point, you're not getting anything from it. So the goal is, how do we make it such that we are able to find this sort of bug in about a second? Um, so, what we can do is we can break down compares into mul uh, single byte comparisons. Or more specifically, instead of actually turning them to multi-byte comparisons, we can just simply have the comparison result as part of the hash in the coverage database. There's compare instrumentation in LVM Clang now, and there's fuzzers like Hongfuzz that have ability to create uh, dictionaries on the fly from compare operands. Yep, exactly. All right. So what we're going to do is, um, so I don't actually like the dictionary creation route because the dictionary creation route makes you uniformly use the dictionary across the entire program, even though the dictionary comparisons can only happen at certain points in the program. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly, just as a, as a test, we're going to look at what our program is generating. Um, Objump dash D, four byte compare. And yeah, we, we ran how many fuzz cases? We ran one point, uh, 
We ran 14 billion closed cases, and we weren't able to find that bug. So, our goal to, to find this bug faster, all we need to do is find it in fewer than 14 billion fuzz cases. That's our goal. Can we find this in fewer than 14 billion fuzz cases? Right, and I'm just gonna write that number down, 14 billion. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what this program is using as a comparison, and it's using a branch if not equal, right? And so what we're gonna do is we're going to go into our, um, uh, oh, our coverage database. Let me look at how we did coverage again. Uh, coverage events, we generate a hash, we set it in the coverage bitmap, and then exit reason coverage, uh, coverage to and from. Okay, so what I'm going to do is very similar logic to this. Um, and I'm going to say the uh, cov source is an expert, and then we'll pass that into here. This will be the cov source. Right, and the cov source is cov source. So this should still, well, this won't work because we don't have the right number of things. Uh, coverage, event, and now the coverage source for this, uh, this is a jump and link. I think we put it as the first argument. Coverage source is coverage. Um. Oh yeah, and we'll probably just have to put it in quotes. Okay. So now we have, this is, uh, specifically this is code coverage. All right, so this should work. And now what we want to do is add compare coverage um, to this. And the way that we're going to do this is uh, invalid opcode. It's important. We have to get this right on the C side of things here. Um, compare coverage, I think is what I called it. Yes. All right. Uh, 1226, compare coverage. All right. Exit reason, compare coverage. Uh, panic, com compare coverage. And now, nothing's going to generate this, obviously, because none of the code hits this uh, situation. So, now, uh, coverage event. And then we have these to and froms, which are the coverage from and coverage to. And we don't really care about those. What we're going to do is, we'll say, um, I forgot what instruction we were on. Branch if not equal. So, on a branch, what we're going to do is we perform a comparison here. Um, and before we do that, I'm just going to put compare coverage here quick. Uh, oh yeah, coverage event. We can just grab this. So this will be a compare coverage event. And the event, in this case, we will record the PC that we're currently executing. So we'll say where we are. And we will record the, uh, for now, nothing more. Okay, so this should cause us to have compare coverage events, which will cause us to panic. All right. Um, I think I have to scope this. Yeah, we'll do a, we'll put this whole thing in a scope just so we can reuse some variable names. Okay, and we're hitting compare coverage, sweet. No surprise there. So what I'm gonna have is compare coverage. And remember, it's just using those things as part of a hash. And since they're just part of a hash, we can do whatever we want. So we're gonna say, in this case, the key is equal to this. Um, and the two, in this case, is going to be the bytes that matched. So we'll say print uh, compare at this, bytes matching this, uh, key dot zero, key dot one. OK. 
Okay. One, two, three, four. Key dot zero. And full through to re-execute. Okay, so this is showing me basically where compares are occurring in the program. Now it's exiting every time. Actually, it stops exiting once it's hit them. So we'll let this uh, compile all the cache and get to the point that it's fuzzing. Here it's fuzzing. So now we see all the compares and then they self-silence. We no longer exit the JIT once we've recorded that we've hit that compare of that state. So what we'll do is now we can add a... Um, uh, bu 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 compare coverage. What we'll do is here, we will have it show the number of bytes that match in the comparison. Um, and I'm trying to think of the best way to do this algorithmically. Um, um, huh. Actually, I could do a bitmap. Here's what I could do, which is really interesting. We're going to do um, an RS1 and, or XOR, RS2. And this is going to be a bitmap. And we'll put this in parens just in case. So we already loaded RS1 and RS2 into autos. Oh, now we have. Load RS1 and RS2 into autos, and then we're going to XOR them together, and this will give a unique bit mapping of how many of the bits have matched. Um, or what bits have matched. This is going to be too noisy, I think, because, yeah, this is going to be way too noisy. I was going to bloat our coverage stuff. Yeah, pop count would work here. Um, question is, do I care about the positioning of them? Um, what I might do is this. Program plus equals if RS1. I, I'm trying to think how I want to go about doing this. So I want some way that I can determine how close these things are. This is basically just going to turn into the, the full set. This could be like any of the bits. So I want to reduce it down a little bit. Um, and if I did it, I could turn it into a byte, I think is what I'll do. So I'll perform byte-wise comparisons. And once I have byte-wise comparisons, I will then turn these into... Um, bits telling you whether or not they matched. So what is the best way? I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to think if there's like a hacker's delight way of doing this, and I think there is. Um, I want to do the comparison on the bytes, and then if the bytes match, if the bytes match, Hmm. I mean, it, it doesn't matter too much. I might just do it naive first, and then we'll see where we can go from there, because these will be self-silencing. So the compare coverage is going to be equal to, and then in here, oh, you can't do expressions in this fucking awful language. So I can't put everything in here, can I? If I write it as a, what can I do here? So I could XOR them together. And then And then and all of the bits next to each other, but I don't know if I can do that quickly. I can do that in a couple mask instructions. I can do it in four, right? Because two to the four is eight. 
No, two to a three is eight. Can I do it in three then? Basically, I, I have this, we'll simplify it. And here's, here's what I'm trying to think through. So we have bits and we'll just go by nibbles right now. And what I want to do is in this situation, we're gonna say these are bytes, right? Byte zero and byte one. Even though they're not bytes, we're just gonna say they are. So what I want to do is I want to produce something that is either one zero or zero one. I don't really care. But this will tell me that like byte one matched, uh, byte zero matched, uh, byte one did not, right? So there are a couple ways that I can do this. If I XOR them together, I would get um, zero, 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 and then zero, 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 one. And then, so if we b0 xor b1, this will give us um, all zeros except for the ones that are different. So this is telling me the differences. Now, can I collapse this easily? And I can do this by basically anding all of these bits together. But what I can do is I can and these two bits together, and then I can and the compacted bits. So I can, I now have this XOR, so we'll call this temp. And then what I can do is temp shift by one. Um, and that's a logical shift. And with temp. And that will produce a, um, I actually kind of want the inverse of this. I can just do an and. Right, so the and will tell me which bits match. Uh, actually, I want a. Uh, I don't want an and. I do want. I want a xnor. I think here. Um, can I do this with ors? Yeah. So x or not, right? If I do this. This would then be um, uh, one 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 one. O O O. One 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 O. Right. So this will tell me which bits match. Correct, because that would be it'll invert all of these. So this is xnor, right? I think that's xnor. If it's not. We can make XNOR in the same thing. I would just have to move around the shape. But this will show me the bits that match. So then if we did this uh, temp shift this, um, this is anding these two things together. Right? And in this situation, it becomes a uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And... I think what that should do is that should tell me the that should tell me the adjacency in the I can't what bit positions would that be This is basically reduced it and I think I take this bit and this bit and this bit no I take these bits, right? This bit and this bit and this bit and this bit. And this now gives me a new pattern, which is one, one, and we can collapse those. And then we have a one and a zero. So what I can do is I can repeat this again. And I think we just have to do this, um, in this case with four bits only twice, because two to the four. Um, because what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to and these two together and these two together, right? And that's what we effectively do. We and these together and the result goes, uh, here. No, the result goes here. Yeah. We and these together, the result goes here. We and these together, the result goes here. And these together, result is here. And these together and the result is here, right? So that's effectively what we've done. And then we can select these bits out of here. And what that means is we can now do a temp shift by two. 
um, and we'll reassign, right? Temp gets reassigned. So now temp starts at where it ended. So we have the end results, and then we shift in two more zeros. Bink, 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 bink. So now we're anding these together, and we should get a 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, 1, 1, 1, 0. And then we take the bottom bits from these, these two bits, and that tells us a 1 and a 0, right? And with these operations, we're able to collapse without conditionals uh, what bytes, or in this case, what nibbles match. For bytes, we would do this again, where we'd shift by, I think, 4. Um, one, yeah, I'm pretty sure if we want to do this on, uh, bytes, we would just shift it by four, right? So it would be one more pass. Now, how do we extract these bits out of here? Well, that's relatively easy because we don't actually care where the bits are. We can mask this with just a constant, which is this. We can and it with this. Um, so temp is equal to this temp is equal to temp and mask. And in this case, that's going to be our mask. And then we'll take our temp, which is 001, 1110, and we'll get an 0001, 0000. And this now <laughs> basically tells us, this gives us a mask. It, tells, it, it puts a 1 where the byte matches and a 0 where the byte does not match. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't think there's a faster way to do this. Um, isn't that cool? I, lo I love bit, bit math. But yeah, we're basically, we're anding bits that are next to each other together, and then we're anding the results of those together, and basically we have a log n number of shift and, ma uh, shift and masks that we need to do to get these comparisons. Isn't that neat? So let's do a shift and mask test dot pi. And this is going to be, uh, you know, we should do this in Rust. Uh, just because working with uh, fixed width integers sucks in Python. Uh, Sam test. Yeah. Well, it's going to be SMA test today. Uh, UN60, uh, oops. Uh, let's. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Actually, this is just going to be a, yeah, we'll just start with a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, fuck it. We'll just do zero for now. It's easier. So you have A and B. And what we'll do is, um, mask. This will take an A, which is U64, yield a, and yield a new kind of compressed mask. So what we'll do here is we'll take uh, let temp is equal to a xor not b. And we'll just do parens, even though we don't need the parens here. I like being strict there, right? So this is first um, determine the bits which match. Next. Um, and then we can do let temp is equal to um, temp shift by one and temp. And then one, two, and then four, if I'm not mistaken. One, two, and four. And let's print the uh, 064B of temp. And I'll print the A and the B as well. Okay, and then we'll just do a mask A and B, cargo run, yep, and then we need the, that final mask at the end, but we should have, yeah, matches, and then all of these match as well, right? But if we were to then mask this with um, this magical constant, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, right? this, which is actually OX 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So that 
is the result. And this should now let us know, oops. This should let us know which bytes match by looking at these bottom things. And I don't think um, we need to compress this. I'm pretty sure we can just leave this as a U64 because we're gonna hash it anyways. So I don't think it matters if we can compress this. Like, I don't think it matters if we just pack all these bits into a U8. I think we can just leave it as this. But let's see if it works on something else. So we'll change this to a one. And yep, everything matches except for the last one, right? So we will make a unit test here just for funsies. And we can do um, uh, if uh, a shift uh, 56 as u8, is it 56? Yes. Uh, is equal to, uh, let mute check is equal to zero. So we'll do um, if that, if b, shift 56 as u8, then we'll do check or equals one. Uh, for i i in uh, 0 to 64, step by eight dot reverse. I'm pretty sure that will give us this. And then we'll do a, before we do this, check, uh, this is OU64, check shift left equals eight, right? So hopefully this will now uh, check. So if a shift i i as u8 is equal to b, shift i i as u8. Now this should give us that same result and we can assert temp is equal to check. But I'm pretty sure this logic is sound. So, and then we'll get rid of this and then we can do this fancy stuff, uh, use random Rand, uh, rand, random, cargo.toml, random is, rand is star, and then we'll do a loop, um, random, rand, u64, rand, u64, right? Okay. Ah, uh, random. Wow, I'm really getting those backwards today. All right, so it hasn't crashed, and then if we were to have a mistake, like if this were a three on accident, this would immediately fail, right? Because it will detect something doesn't match. So I don't think there's any reason to believe that this is incorrect, um, right? Yeah, this should work. Um, um, I wonder if, yeah, it looks good to me. Sweet. Yeah, I would expect this to have crashed pretty quickly. Um, so I think this logic is sound. So this is all we need to implement, which is honestly not too bad. So can you do expressions in C? Uh, in C++, sorry. I know you can't do them in C, but basically I want to just do that here because this is gated by the conditional check. I, well, you we probably want to add another gate here, but it's not a big deal. So we'll do a um, program plus equals. What do I do? So here, that's the result. So this is um, res. And then we'll do program plus equals uh, auto temp one is equal to uh, a, which in this case is rs1, xor, 
not RS2, right? So we assign that. Then we have temp2, which is going to be the same code, but this is going to be temp shift1 and temp, uh, temp1, 1. This will be temp2 and temp2 into temp3. And temp4 will take 3 and 3. And this will do a 1, 2, and a 4. Um, an inst rs1. I'm pretty sure that's a ULL. But let's double check. Yes, it's, a, it's an unsigned long long. Okay. So RS1 and not, or, or XOR not, so XNOR uh, with RS2, temp1, shift1, and temp1, temp2, shift2, and temp2, temp3, shift4, and temp3, and then we do our uh, result, which all we have to do is and temp4 with this, and unsend long one. Okay, so that should now cause us to uniquely record coverage based on the number of bytes that match during a comparison. And I'll have to rejet everything, but that's fine. So now we'll get these exits. Um, ooh, matching. And this will print this in... Uh, 016x for now. And I'll put an ox prefix out there. Okay, wait for this to complete. And now you can see these masks that are getting generated when we're fuzzing. So basically, it's showing we see comparisons with different levels of uh, matching bytes, right? So now this is uniquely. There's only 256 different values for this. So for every compare, there's 256 points of coverage that we can potentially collect. Um, and when we collect that information, we can just hash it. And I think the way that we're going to do this, we're going to update the way that we do code coverage. Um, in fact, we're going to do coverage um, type to and from um, info zero and info one, right? Coverage uh, for all types of coverage. So we have a coverage map here. And then the types for this will just be a U64, a U64. And we'll have a. Um, a type, which we can just do like a U32, maybe. Uh, or we can say a coverage type. And then I'm going to... Uh, D, D, D. Okay. Temporarily go to this. And up in the emulator, we'll have a coverage... Um, pub enum coverage type. Implement all these fancy things. And I'll say... Um, different types of coverage. And we'll have a um, code coverage. We will have compare coverage. And that's all we have for now. Um, coverage from compare, uh, from new code being hit. Uh, coverage from, from unique uh, compares. Right, so code and compare, 565, coverage type not found. Yep, we got to pull that from emulator. And then 788, this is missing coverage. All right, coverage. All right, now we have to use that. So this is for code coverage and for compare coverage. And we basically want to do the same logic. We're going to do some copy pasta for now, and then we'll update it. Right now, we're not actually going to put the code coverage in here. So key is going to be this. 
cov from, cov to, and then the coverage type will be uh, uh, compare coverage. And we're going to update the code coverage. So we have the key. We're going to insert this into the coverage database. And then if, if we were the ones to add this, oh, and we use the coverage to as the hash, we'll use the coverage from as the hash, which is fine-ish. We can make a better hash for that if we need to. But we'll use coverage from as the hash. This is our key. And then... We hash the fuzz input. If this input is unique, then we add it to the input database. OK. There it is. So if I remove all the crashes, and I have no inputs, right? my input folder is, is clear, we find the crash. Right? There it is, A, B, C, D. So we're able to instantaneously, like before we even get to our first status print, we are able to find this bug that would otherwise take nearly forever to find. Isn't that fucking cool? Just by adding that simple logic. <laughs> That's it. We added, I don't know what, maybe 20 lines of code to our code base, to our emulator. And let's see how much it hurt performance. So before we were getting, yeah, I don't think it really hurt performance at all. Um, So this is on a branch if equal. So on our conditional branches, so we can say, we'll just comment it out. This will get rid of the compare coverage. And we're getting 23 billion instructions per second. It's kind of dropping, but that's, I don't, I actually don't know why. But it's in the ballpark of like 16 million fuzz cases a second. So if we don't have that, if we remove that code, how much does this hurt performance to have us doing this on every branch? Well, this will tell us. We'll get this running. We'll wait for it to compile all the JITs. JITs are done, and now we'll rerun it. So now we are getting 13 climbing. We're actually getting uh, the, the perf is fucking identical, right? The, the, it 22.5 million a second, 22.7, 21. Like, it's the same. The cost of this is nearly zero. And that's it. That's all it takes. And now we're able to get through comparisons. Isn't that fucking cool? And we don't care about the code base. We don't need source. We don't need to rebuild it. We don't need a compiler pass. We don't need anything. This is purely an emulation. And the cost of it is, is effectively zero. Right? And we went from a bug being very difficult to find, nearly impossible to find, to being trivial to find. Right? This is something that AFL doesn't have by default. Right? And just by adding this, we likely made this fuzzer with a byte flipper stronger than AFL. And that's, not, and that's not a dig to AFL, because this is a hard problem to do on the compile side of things. But this is something that gives me a massive advantage. And that's it. That's the entire logic. <laughs> um, and our input bloat isn't bad at all. We only have 26 inputs. Because everything is deterministic. And when everything is deterministic, you get fewer of these things saving inputs because of noise. Because everything here is related to the input's behavior. Isn't that nifty? So yeah, now we're able to find a bug that requires a strict comparison. All right. Um... Let me see. I might ship that to here just so we can run this and have a full screen for code. All right. So that is a very simple thing that you can do in an emulator to get a massive amount of performance in your fuzzer. Now, this means that every single compare could potentially create 256 different inputs because it's possible there are different levels that this comparison matches at. Um, and that could be a problem, depending on your code base, that could lead to input bloat, which is the concept of you end up creating so many inputs that you don't know what input to end up using during your fuzz case. But in this case, everything's kept to a minimum that it's not a big deal, right? But isn't that neat? That's it. That's the, in that's the entire code that we added is just this. Uh, we already have this coverage event, which allows us to record 
arbitrary coverage types, right? So what we can do is if compare coverage, and we can make this conditional. And if you turn off compare coverage, um, this perf goes away entirely, right? So this is uh, create a bitmap indicating which bytes in RS1 and RS2 match. And this will help find not equal cases as well as equal cases. It'll also try and find uh, like negative cases as well because this will look for when bytes don't match as well. So, um, and this is uh, register the coverage as compare coverage um, for this PC with the uh, bit mask we identified. And then that goes into a hash, and then we don't really care what happens from there. Um, const compare coverage bool is equal to true. Uh, if true, compares will generate coverage for each unique um, for each unique combination of matching bytes during conditional branches. For example, uh, uh, this means that as uh, more bytes are found to match, uh, coverage events will be generated and the input will be saved. OK. So now do you understand why we wrote an emulator to demonstrate these things? <laughs> we couldn't do this. We couldn't do this with, uh, how much code is this? Five lines of code? Arguably six, seven with this? You couldn't do this with seven lines of code in a compiler. I can guarantee you that. It would be a lot more work than seven lines of code. And we can fuzz binaries we don't have source to with this same model, right? Um, and we could also do this on set. Um, what is it? We have the, let's look for anything that's conditional. Um, the branches are, of course, conditional. And then we will want to grab it on the loads. Uh, set less than immediate. So this is also a comparison, right? So this one will work by uh, set text width 79. You know what? We'll put this in a macro. And we got to change it a little bit. We could put it in a macro. We should put it in a macro. Um, Okay, we'll do this. Mm, macro rules, uh, compare coverage. And this is A, B. Okay, and we just up, up, up. And then this will take an A and a B. And I'll put these in parens just in case someone use con uses constants for these, which is possible. I think the next one we're about to do will use constants. So then we'll have an A and a B. So then here we'll just say compare coverage, and we'll use RS1 and RS2 will be the things that we'll use for compare coverage. There we go. And this is uh, generate compare coverage. Make sure this still works. It should. The code maybe is slightly different in what gets generated. Can't remember. But it still should work. There it is. Yep, still finds it instantly. 
Okay, so now we want to go to set less than, which are the only, these are the only ways of doing conditional things. So we'll have, well, um, compare coverage, and this will compare RS1 to hex ULL. And here we'll do a format of this, and it's inst.immediate, which should be a U64, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we'll just say as a U64. And there we go, we've generated compare coverage for that. And for here, set less than unsigned. We don't care about the signedness because we're just doing byte compares on these. So RS1, compare it with this hex ULL, which is the immediate. And this should still build. So it'll generate different code. Um, yeah, it seems like that very mildly actually affected code. JIT cache this. Oh, that's the output. Okay, and now there's some more set less than. These are for these, RS1, RS2. And same thing here, load RS1, load RS2, do the conditional compare, and that's it. Those are the only conditional operations that exist in RISC-V. So at this point, we now have hooks on every single conditional, um, we have hooks on every single conditional operation to determine the number of bytes which have matched. And if we see a different number of bytes which have matched for that PC than we've ever seen before, then we end up recording that as new coverage, which then causes us to generate inputs, which then causes us to have something to fill feedback on that goes through partial comparisons. Isn't that fucking cool? So we're able to just instantly make it through a comparison like that. And that allows us to kind of reconstruct an input that's a little bit more complex. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add support for mem compares. Now mem compares are a very hard problem, and we'll talk about why. But uh, let's do the same logic, and we're going to say in this case, if size uh, or if not mem compare input with uh, ABCD four build in trap, right? So we'll build this. Oh, and this is string.h. First, let's see if AFL is able to find this. It might instrument mem compares. I think it does. So it looks like it does, or that mem compare happens to be going one byte at a time. But I don't know if AFL instruments those. No, no, no. Um, it looks like they identify the boundaries. Do they hook these or do they replace them? Compare coverage level, less than two or that. Okay, cool. This is actually really good that AFL is doing this. So they're effectively constructing a trace. Um, and I'm guessing they're also logging mem1, mem2, and n, which is the length. Some compare coverage trace. And this goes through and curl lock plus i. I'm guessing that's nearly a, a hash. Debug fd. So it's adding these um, <laughs> Apache HTTP wrappers. Nice. OK. So here's where we can make it interesting. Void fault compare uh, unsigned char A, unsigned char B size t size, and we'll do uh, size t matches, and this will return size t is equal to zero, uh, while size minus minus, um, 
matches plus equals A equals to B one L zero return matches. So what this does is this will count the number of bytes that match. So this is our own mem compare, fault compare. If this is equal to four, then we'll then we'll exit. Now this is where we can actually start talking about some interesting parts of the way that AFL accomplishes some of the things it does. So ABCD. Um, Yeah, technically it's a different sign. I mean, I don't really care in this case. I'll just do char. Um, okay. Oh, wait a minute. Are we giving it the dictionary? Yes, we are. Um, and we also need to not give it ABCD in here because that's not fair. Completely empty input. There we go. So it's an empty input. That's the same thing that we're starting with, and we'll see if AFL can make it through here. Um, oh, do you have to like put one letter in there? Okay. Ah, and we don't want to give it A because that's actually correct. Let's give it one, 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 one. We'll let it know the size of it. Okay. So AFL is unable to find this. Will it find the mem compare way? I don't know if this is a default behavior of AFL or if this is something that you have to enable, but if this is a default behavior, this is actually really good. If not, that's built in trap. Oh, it doesn't seem like, how do you turn on the mem compare stuff in AFL? Um. Uh, what? Does it only work in QEMU mode? Instrument, uh, Vim examples instrumented. Oh, they must have removed that. Okay. Um, Test comp cov global local um how do you turn this on? Is their unit test seriously a shell script? Holy fuck. Holy fuck. What? <sighs> okay. Oh, shivers, shivers me boots. Custom mutator. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh God. It will harden. Dash O. How is this not like? How 
How is this not something that's more readily found? What? This? To make it faster, help rearrange the code, blah, blah, blah. Um, instrument specific parts. For splitting mem compare, stern compare, please see this. Laugh Intel. Uh, here we go. Compare log. There is a very eff effective new instrumentation option called compare log as an alternative to LAF Intel that allow AFL++ to apply mutation similar to Red Queen. If it's eight or lower, you can activate a mode that prevents overflow. Okay, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, docs. What do we want? Grab comp log. Yeah, that's what I want. Read me compare log. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be good. Okay, LVM comp log. All right. Hmm. Do I need a later version of LVM? Oh, whoops. I'll just add it to both. Might as well, I don't care. Oh, whoops. That would make sense. Make. Um. Hmm. Do I need a later LVM? Oh. Uh. Comp log. What the fuck is that? How do I get that to work? You have to build two versions of the instrument and target program. First one's built with AFL++ instrumentation. Second one is with compare logging. What? You can give a dash C compare log. They don't say Clang requirements on it. Dash C, and then you have to, what? You have to make two different programs? Why? Why? Um. There we go. Nice. This should be a default mode for AFL. Like, this should 100% be a default mode for AFL. Seriously. This is really good. Um, let's see if it can, it can probably do a four byte compare now. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Can it do a fault compare? Yep. 
Nice. See, this is really good. I don't know why this isn't talked about more often. Why is this not a thing that's like default? This is really good. Um, what do they do? I bet they turn every single instruction into a one byte comparison. Are there any comments? Are there any comments that tell me what this does? Nope, okay. Um, get these different types, different versions. In the instrumentation list, okay, then cast that, equal, not equal, blah, blah, blah. Hooking, compare instructions. Eight sixteen thirty two sixty four. 264. Uh, this is really good. Like, if people aren't doing this by default, that's uh, missing out on, on, a, on a lot. This is, like, pretty massive, honestly. Um, let's see. I'm guessing that what this does is... Um, If it is a compare instruction, checks what type of comparison instruction it is, gets the operands to it, gets the types for them, okay, and then it pushes this to a list, uh, I comps, and then for an instruction compare, get the operand, If the bit width is greater than, oh, okay, this is figuring out the largest size because there can be two different sizes. And then if it then pushes back op1, op2 as the args, create a call to compare log hook instruction. Whoa. Um, what? a.out.comparelog mintel vim dash k and it's only going to do this on whatever our code is which is fuzz me compare okay so we do a comparison ESI, compare return hook, and then fault compare. So here's fault compare, and what it does is it calls this. Basically, any time a comparison is about to occur, it seems to load up RDI with the bottom part and then ESI, I don't know why it adds one to it, but it basically calls this compare log hook instruction eight. And then this is going to update the AFL bitmap, the compare map. Okay, cool. And we can go look at the code for this too. This is likely in LLVM mode. Compare log routines pass. This is probably injecting these routines. Yeah. Um. And what were the name of those routines? RG compare log ins. This is the runtime, okay. So, it does, huh. It 
So it determines where it was called from. It then shuffles that around a little bit, ands it to be, so it, it basically makes a hash out of the return address. So the place where the compare occurred, it then masks it. It then uh, logs the type, similar to what I'm doing, um, the compare type, the compare map, and then it updates that this bitmap. So this is relatively expensive, but it's not too bad. The memory axis here, huh? And then his plus one, yup. And then shape is zero. And then it logs the compares that occurred. I see. And I wonder if it just adds those to a dictionary. Um. I bet that's what it's doing. I bet it's adding those to a dictionary. Because nothing in there seems to indicate where in the input that happened. Um, so, how does it use this compare map? Let's see, is this doing anything? If in compare log mode, then it will map all this shit. And map this, yep. The shared memory FD for the compare log. Um, I don't think Red Queen is being used here, but maybe it is. So this is at try to add the dictionary. Yeah. Compare fuzz. If they're equal, skip it. What are they doing? I think they're adding it to the dictionary. Try to add the dictionary. It failed to add the dictionary. Otherwise, it probably tries to... Loop compares are useless. Detect and ignore them. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So here's an idea. So one mem compare is doable. And I like that, and I'm impressed with that. That's actually really cool stuff. And I highly recommend, if you're using AFL, get that shit enabled ASAP. Um, so this finds the mem compare, but will it find it if and mem compare char star input ABC uh, plus four. So we're going to look for... Those four bytes to be something, and these four bytes to be uh, one, two, three, four. So this input, and I expect it might find this because it might have mem comp No. Okay. So I broke it. I broke AFL. And this is the next thing that we have to talk about, which is hard to do. Um, so first of all, let's... Let's make sure it can find fault compare. It should be able to do fault compare because this is uh, this is straightforward. Yep, and it's able to do this, no problem. Okay, so let's make sure that ours is capable of doing that. Um, okay. Uh, opt rv 64i bin gcc test.c. Okay, so that's going to build it for risk 5 and then we can take that binary um, a dot out and a dot out folk compare. Uh, this is a single folk compare. And then we'll see if we can find this and I think we will be able to. Um, Okay, here, here it goes. We'll have new JITs. 
but all this needs to do is make it through that fault compare, which I suspect this is going to be able to do. No. Okay. Cool. I need to take a look at why. Uh, single fault compare. If that is four, AFL should be able to find this. Yep. And, okay, let's take a look at why. So this will call full compare, and then this will go into here. And... Ah! Yes! Yes! Because it's looping. Yep. So it's not going to be able to find this because it's actually doing byte compares here. Um, since it's doing a uh, one byte at a time comparisons in fault compare, it's actually, it has no way of discovering new coverage. So it should be able to find this. It'll take a while, but this, instead of, uh, this will find the first byte of coverage and then it will be a two to the 24 complexity, which is uh, one in 16 million, which it'll, obviously it needs to pick up the right byte from the input and corrupt the correct bytes in the correct order. But basically, this is what I was going to demonstrate with AFL as well. And it seems like we have arrived to this situation sooner. Um, actually, let me see if I optimize this, if I still get that. Dash O2. This will hopefully get optimized. Actually, that'll just get inlined. Um, I'll copy, oops. Copy that, run this. Okay. There's a chance we find this if they turn it into a four byte compare and it's just at the whim of the compiler, but the other one does demonstrate a point that we want. Okay, nice. Still doesn't do it. Um, actually, I think on a risk five, it's, it's probably going to align this. Oh, it doesn't do any aligning. Cool, it's just one bet at a time. So this still demonstrates the problem, and it's the same reason why AFL is unable to find this bug, right? AFL isn't able to find a bug that requires that you have A, B, C, D, followed by one, two, three, four. And the reason for this is because the compare coverage that's going on in AFL and in my stuff currently is based off of your current PC, your current execution point. And that current execution point means that both mem compares are actually having the same compares in the same location in the code, which means that it can't gather new coverage on any subsequent mem compare. So only the first mem compare is actually benefiting from any coverage, um, which is pretty pretty interesting. Basically, since it's loop unaware, um, it's not going to be able to get past this because this has already caused all the coverage of mem compare to light up, right? So since all of the coverage of mem compare has lit up on this one, this one won't generate any new coverage and thus it won't cause any new, um, it won't cause any new inputs to get saved and thus it won't be able to build on anything and thus it will find an input that's A, B, C, D. I bet if we take a peek into uh, outputs Q, um, one of these will be A, B, C, D probably. Yeah, it already knows to do A, B, C, D. And let's, let's extra hint to AFL. Um, we'll say, because uh, we are going out of bounds of the input, we'll say if size is less than 16, return. So we're going to let AFL know that anything under that is not hittable. So now we actually bounce check, which is correct, because we were just going out of bounds. Um, and then we can ddif is dev zero, of is um, inputs this, block size is 16, count is one. So now we even give it a 16 byte input so it knows. Um, and it's still not going to be able to find it, right? And if we take a look at the outputs queue, it finds the first one, 
right? Well, that one was some other coverage. I'd actually probably found this like right away. There's the ABCD, right? So it's able to find ABCD and then some random corruption, and it saves that input as a unique input. But it's not able to get past that point because it sees no difference between this mem compare and this mem compare, unless I did something wrong. But I'm pretty sure if I pass this uh, test, one, two, three, four, this should be a crashing input. Um, Ooh, maybe it's not. Maybe I have a bug. May, uh, plus four, one, two, three, four, eh, four. Mm. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Am I doing something stupid? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong about AFL. Um... Oh, because uh, it's uh, too small. Yeah, illegal instruction, right? So this does crash. This program does crash if you pass it ABCD1234. And AFL is unable to find that, even though it has this mem compare, or more specifically, generic compare instrumentation. And AFL has the exact same issue that I have right now. And that is that the path is not factored in as part of the input. Uh, or as part of the, the mem compares, which means that this mem compare is no different from any other mem compares. And this is not an insult to AFL. No, f like, I'm, I'm fucking impressed that AFL has this compare stuff and it just works out of the box. I don't know why that's not default or pushed harder. That's ridiculous to me. This is huge. Like, this gets you past so many constants and, and shit when you're fuzzing. Super, super, super important. Anyways. So there are a couple ways that we can solve this, and now we're talking about some of the negatives. When you start making a hash of the path or the execution path that you've taken, you end up having a lot of noise. And when you have a lot of noise, you can end up having input bloat. So we can demonstrate that um, basically, if you include something about the context of how you got to the PC, whether it's a loop count, whether it's a call stack, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do to instrument things like that, you can very quickly fall into a trap where you end up having so fucking many different unique path hash things, and you end up just having basically a loop that loops a hundred times makes every block involved in the loop have a hundred times the amount of inputs, and you just end up having so many inputs just spewed all over the place. So what we want to do is we want to um, we want to basically make a path hashing algorithm. And there are a couple ways we can do it. We can do it on branches. So every time a branch occurs, we can hash the branch, and that is generic. That'll give us a unique hash of the program execution for every branch. You can also keep a call stack. So we can basically keep track of all the calls and returns, and we can basically have a call stack, and we can hash the call stack or have a running hash of the call stack every single time we do a call or a return. And the call stack one works pretty well, but sometimes the concept of a call and a ret can be very complex, and sometimes you don't always have perfect information there. Um, but I think typically call stack has the best granularity. It seems to not have a huge amount of bloat. Like that basically means every time you hit a mem copy in a different function, it'll be treated as different coverage, which will then treat it as a different place where you hit it, which will cause new inputs to get saved. Um, and then for, uh, if you do traces or hashes, you can do, there's a couple ways that you can hash, I mean, there's basically an infinite amount of ways you can hash your path. But one of the ways that you can hash your path is to basically keep the last, you know, n number of branches. So you basically keep track of the last branches that have occurred and you use that as your hash. You can also keep track of, um, you can keep track of, uh, like, you can hash all branches together, so all targets for all branches together, and then you can use the current PC, and then you mask that hash of all observed paths, and you just end it with, like, FF. 
right? And that way you limit the amount of noise that you can get to 256. You can't possibly have it explode more than that because you mask the noisy component to a certain amount. I think the call stack is going to be ideal for us on Risk V, just because the concept of a call is a little bit more rigid than on some other architectures. So uh, basically, a a, a, a um, JR uh, um, jump and link, jump and link register. So we'll see a jailer to RA when we see a ret. So if we just say if uh, inst.rs1 is equal to register RA, um, says RD. Oh, yeah, if... If RS1 is RA and inst.rd is equal to uh, register zero. So basically discard the link and uh, return to the return address or jump, jump indirect to the return address register and uh, use zero for RD here. Okay. Um, so we'll say, uh, ret at this, and then we should have a PC. So we'll see if this tells us where we have rets. So, okay, so that's telling us a little bit of information about rets, and let's take a look. Let's see if it's accurate. So we will do a, uh, stream term, um, vim, uh, uh boop. Grizzly, fuzz with emus, obs jump dash d, eight out out single fault compare vim dash, one three five c eight, one three five c eight, oops c eight wow, uh okay e call, no, that's I took the wrong one, uh one two eight e four we'll go from the top there's a ret, one two eight ninety. There's a ret, 133c8, there's a ret, so on and so forth, right? So we effectively know where returns are. Um, consequently, we can also know where um, a, a jump is in the same way. We can do that here, and we can say um, if rd is the ra register, then uh, print direct call here. Um, PC. And this isn't perfect, right? The stack could get unlined, it could get sloppy, weird things can happen here. But this should let us know. Direct call at 10CA8. Yep, and there's the jump in link, right? It's saving to the link register, it's saving the next instruction. And this one is returning to the return address register. Now, there's nothing stopping this from doing like a JR to a, a different register, which would be kind of strange. Um, but that's totally valid, right? Yeah, for example, this. This is a perfect example. Something would call udivsi3, it moves ra into t0, and then it uh, jrs to t0. So this isn't, this isn't jumping to the return address, right? And this is where things can get really fucking annoying. Um, and in theory, nothing is causing you to... You don't have to do a, a JAL where you save to the RA, right? You can JAL to something else. Um, why can't I search for this? Oh, because there's a tab. So, um, A through Z... T, uh, T, A, okay, it doesn't seem like really anyone uses it, so we can rely on the fact that a jump in link with RA is a call, and a jump in link register, jailer, um, RA, doesn't look like there are any, uh, indirect calls, but they, they could exist, right, um, so a gel, to RA, these are calls, and we have a way of detecting that. A JAL 
that goes to RA is a direct call. Then, I'd really like to detect a return, but in this case, it's actually not doing a return to RA. It is, but it's not actually, if that makes sense. So it's returning to what RA was, but RA um, is actually copied into T0, and then it returns to T0. So what we want to do is, I think we'll have to check on the stack, and we'll say if we are jumping to the location that is on the call stack, then it's a return. And that way we only have to worry about identifying calls. Um, and yeah, this can go sideways when things uh, like do a jump in link and then, uh, and then just don't ever return to it. Um, and that's where things can get really difficult. It's very difficult to like, keep track of a stack, uh, a call stack in code, but we're gonna try it. So to do this, we need to give some stuff to the JIT. Um, always in sync with the C++ JIT version of the structure. So we'll do a call stack, U64, and we'll have, um, I don't know, like 512. And then we can have a, um, I mean, we could just do a hash. Having a call stack is nice. We will ultimately end up doing a hash. Um, how do I want to do this? Basically, the only place where this falls apart is if there is a call instruction, something that's a, a jump and link, and it links to the RA register, but then it never actually returns. It never Maybe it moves RA, or maybe it discards RA, or maybe it uses RA to figure out where PC is, but you'd never do that on RISC-V, so I don't think it matters here. So we'll do a call stack. Call stack ents, which is the number of entries in the call stack. And then we're going to vertically split this uh, permissions. And this is the same thing. We need to make sure this is identical. So this is going to be a unit 64T call stack 512. And then we'll do call stack ints. This is a unit 64T, right? So the call stack and then the number of entries on the call stack. One hash be slow? It doesn't really matter. Perf's not a huge issue here. Calls happen very rarely. Um, okay, so we have a call stack. We're gonna have to hash it regardless. There's no other way around that. So we have a call stack and call stack ints, and then guest states will have call stack zero for 512, call stack ints is zero. And those we actually wanna copy when we clone or fork. So this shouldn't build because I think the fork definition is missing it. Oh shit. Um. States. Oh, is that? The state is clone and copy. Okay, so it just creates a raw copy of that, which is actually great. That's what we want. We want this to be identical to the host. So it starts off as zero, and then as we call something, we'll, we'll push to that location. So the way that we can do this is when we get to a JR, a junior, um, jump and link, we have a direct call, and what we'll do is uh, uh, program plus equals format. Do we need format here? Yes, because we want to record the return address onto that. Yeah, yeah. So what we'll do is first we'll say uh, program plus equals um, if call. Uh, where do we do a return? Here we go. This is what a return looks like. 
in the JIT. So I'll add that. So program plus equals this. So we'll say if the um, state call stack ints is greater than this, and here we'll do format. We'll just do all the code in here. Um, if the call stack ints is greater than the uh, max call stack, and here we can do max call stack, uh, const max call stack, u size is equal to 512, uh, depth of the call stack for the program under test. Okay. Max call stack, and then call stack. Uh, and this will do a format. Wow, I'm surprised this is the first thing that we've had to format in this. Okay. Uh, max call stack is equal to max call stack. Okay, and now this one, what we'll do is we'll say if, and I think, yeah, it just got screwed up. Okay, if the call stack ints is greater than or equal to the max call stack, then we want to exit with the reason of call stack uh, full. And we're just gonna make this fatal for now. We can put the re-enter PC. Uh, we don't actually want to do any side effects if we're going to return. So we'll grab prior to this. Um, max call stack. So we will emit um, if the call stack ends exceeds the max call stack, then exit with the reason of call stack full. And this will have a call stack full, compare coverage, call stack full, compare coverage, and then here, exit reason, call stack full, and we'll just panic, call stack is full. So now we have a way of knowing if that happened, and we bounce check that and everything, which is great. Um, bam, bam, bam. And this we have to do is equal to max call stack. The re-entry PC um, is just PC. So it'll be PC is PC dot zero. Ah, just PC. Okay. Nice. Program not found in the scope. Yeah, it's... Uh, We did that on the wrong one. So record coverage. Here we go. PC is equal to PC.0. All right. And that's before we set anything up. And then we have the ret adder. OK, sweet. So now what we can do is, if that's not the case, right? if we don't return early, we will say state call stack state call stack ints plus plus is equal to um, ret adder. And in this case, the ret adder is just going to be uh, ret adder. And we'll have this be a hexadecimal uh, unsigned long long. So ret adder is equal to ret adder. So we'll print that as hex, unsigned long long, and we'll assign that into the, the call stack. So now we will accumulate a call stack, and this should get exhausted, maybe. I don't know how many calls occur, but right now it's not, um, 
Right now, it's not popping anything from that call stack. So the call stack is filling up very, very, very quickly. And there we go. Call, call stack is full all over the place. No surprise. So what we're going to do is when we do a jump and link, um, we will record this call stack. And we're going to ignore jump and link register, even though you can do a call indirect. We're just going to ignore that for now. We'll come back when we polish this and we have it in a state that we like the syntax of. So then we're going to look at jump and link register. And then here, every time we do a jump and link register, what we're going to do is we know the target. The target has been resolved. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, determine. So that's only if only if we're doing a jump and link with an RD return address, which honestly, we could probably filter this stuff a little bit more. Well, this one we won't. Um, here we'll say program plus equals this. And in this case, the program is going to be, oops. Um, if call stack ends is greater than zero, because the call stack ends points to the next free one, not the mo uh, not the current one. We'll do auto uh, call stack entry is equal to state call stack ends minus one. The minus one is safe because we know it's greater than zero. So since the call stack ends is greater than zero, there's something in the call stack, which is the, the length. We then get the last entry in the call stack. And then we say if target is equal to state call stack ends or call stack CSE, then this basically says. Uh, we made it, and we found um, a matching pair to a call. And we'll do call stack ints minus equals one, right? And that minus equals one is safe. In fact, we can just say is it equal to CSE. Yeah, uh, we'll do minus equals one. I think it's more clear. The compiler will be smart enough to figure that out. So, if the call stack entries is greater than zero, then subtract one from it to get the last entry. See if the target for this branch is equal to the um, last entry in the call stack. If it is, then pop something from the call stack. Got to go, is this going on YouTube later? Yes, it will. And then that's it. We've now popped something from the call stack and we don't need really anything from this format. I don't think we had any format args in there. So this should just work. Now we won't have call stack full because things will actually pop things off the stack, unless there's a bug. But I don't think there is. If the ends is greater than zero, which it will be because this increments it, get the last thing. So this would be one minus one is zero. If call stack zero, which is what is filling in here, is equal to the target, then subtract one from the call stack entries. So call stack is full. Okay, so let's see if that is real or fake. Um, okay. Um, huh. Yeah, okay. Why would that happen? Jump in link register. Target plus equals that. It happened if the targets don't match, but um, free temp thread ID one hundred five CPP call stack. Okay, if it's greater than or equal to five twelve, then the call stack is full. Reenter PC is this return. Otherwise, we set, whoa. Where's this? Um, maybe this is just an old version. Uh, get cash. OK. 
Okay, here we go. So this is branching to, so where is this in the program? We are currently at 10d70, which is a jump in link. This is saying the return address is a 10d74, which is true. This is post indexing, so this will be zero. Call stack at zero, when it starts off, will be equal to this. Maybe the stack's getting unbalanced. It's, it's hard to say, it's, it's dangerous. How's the stream going tonight? It's going awesome. Been fighting with DNS, that sounds awful. <laughs> sounds like a struggle. Okay. 10D74. I wanna find the code for 10D74. Uh, actually, I wanna see the code for 114AC and temp. Reentry PC is that. Okay. Um, 114AC. Oh yeah, that's saying we're doing an indirect branch, which is a call. We're jumping there. 10D74 ULL. Okay. And we don't actually have code for that, do we? Um, call stack. If the call stack ends is greater than zero, get the CSE, which is call stack ends minus one. And if the target that we're branching to, in this case, state regs one, which is RA, is equal to that minus equals one. Are we using the emulator? Run emu. Can I just do run? I'm curious if it's because I don't have this implemented in the emulator. Um, well, why would that matter? Let me get rid of the stepping up to a certain point. We'll just fork directly at the start of the program. We'll see if we have the problem here too. Because the emulator doesn't update this log and I could see that maybe leading to problems. But that just means it would, no, call stack is full, okay. Um, okay, let's take a look at the call stack. And we can hex print the call stack. Okay. And then we'll go down here. And num cores will just set to one for now for testing. Cut down on some of the spew. We gotta slice this so that Rust can print it. Okay, so here's the call stack. 101EC. Um, oh yeah, that's the return from main. That makes sense. 100DC. This is a call in main, and it should return here in Fopen. And why are we not? Um, 10 CAC. Unless we're really that deep, but I, I doubt it. Uh, 10 BDC, we're in FOPEN, SFP, 10FO, oh yeah, let's get the trace, let's turn on trace mode, I forgot we had that, enable tracing, true, so now I'll have a trace of all the instructions, calls us to get here, rip perf, Rip perf. Hmm. 
Hmm. Oh, is it the reset? I bet it's reset. Reset is not setting that. Yep, 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 yep. Ah, uh, reset uh, call stack. Self dot state dot call stack is e uh, copy from slice. Um, other dot state dot call stack. Um, dot dot other dot state dot call stack ints. Self dot state dot call stack ints is equal to other dot state dot call stack ints. 100% that's what's happening. Enable chasing. False. Bye bye. So copy. Copy for that. So it would be zero in a lot of situations. Um, oh yeah, this has to be um, let CSE is other.state.call stack ints. We're going to copy from CSE. Right here, we'll just do this. Dot, dot CSE. Ah, oh, we barely fit CSE. And then this will be, ah, we can just keep that. So get the others call stack entries, and then we copy into ours for that many entries from theirs. And then we set our call stack entries to the other one. Yeah, basically on reset, we weren't clearing it. So of course, we we're having problems. And now it's running. Fantastic. So now we have a call stack. Um, wow, that is cool. That is really cool. OK, so what can we do with that? Well, we can go and um, we can. Um, Hmm. Maybe I'll just have a call stack hash or something. I need a reversible hash. I could probably just XOR all of the calls, maybe. XOR with a shift. Is that reversible? If I XOR with a rotate, it's reversible, right? So we'll have a call stack hash is U64. Unit 64T call stack hash. Um. So then what I can do is every time we hit a call, we can take, we'll do state call stack hash XOR equals uh, XOR is equal to um, uh, rotate left clang. Is there a built in for rotate left? Is there a way to rotate? Uh, C++ rotate left. Standard rotate? No, that's elements. Um. Um, hey, John Rager's version came up. There isn't C20. What is it called? 
Ronald. Holy shit, they did it. What a world we live in. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, rotate left with the state uh, call stack hash. Um, I don't know, a good prime number here. We can do seven, and then we XOR with the um, return address, hex, ULL. Hmm? Um, how do I get access to the standard namespace? Okay. There is a built-in rotate left. I'm gonna use that. Cause I don't know how to get standard here. Uh, built in rotate left. There we go. So rotate left, rotate the stack hash by seven and then XOR the return address. And that should be reversible because we XOR the return address. That gives us the stack hash seven, and then we we flip it around. I'm fucking serious, dude. Um Oh, uh, I got to give it a, a number. Rotate left. Uh, it should be a 64 here. So we'll say stack hash is this, XOR that. Son of a bitch. Under, under, built in, rotate left, 64. How do I use fucking standard? <laughs> what? Built in. Rotate left. 64. That's. That's. Why does that not work? Is it is it like a new thing in Klein? How do, how do I get access to the standard library so I can use the standard rotal? How do I how do I do this? How do I use standard? Do I have to use the namespace or whatever the fuck I have to do? It's gonna kill my build times because it's a template. Oh, is this in some include somewhere that I have to pull in? Using standard just sets the namespace, right? This is in header bit. Okay. Include bit. Here we go. Fuck. Is bit C++ 20? Yeah, I think bit is C++ 20. Okay, how do I... What is the flag for Clang then? Um, dash standard is equal to C++ 20. 
Come on, give it to me. This clang's probably too old, maybe. Use 2A. Okay. Is it because it's the draft? Ah, fuck it. All right. Fuck everything about this shit, man. Why does it got to fight me? Um, okay. Blah, blah, blah. Um, okay. Why can't I use built in rotate? You serious? Well, then we can grab, uh, Um, okay. Maybe it's new? That's crazy to me. Why does, why does C and C++ hate rotates? They're so scared of rotates, man. They've been around for 50 fucking years and they don't have a way to rotate. <laughs> like... Jeez. All right, I need to figure out how to do rotates then. Um. Okay. Wait till I see the code it generates in standard. Yeah, I guess we'll, uh, um, places. Um, trying to find the best rotate to use here. Rotate. So I think this is what I want. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll rewrite it a little bit. But it's probably close to what we want. Uh, we want unit 64. Rotate left 64. Unit 64. Unit 64. If. Okay, and then we'll do n and equals 31. I'm actually okay with this. Uh, and this will actually be oh, x one f. Oh, this will be three f. 
40. So... This should be good. Um. Oh, and then we have to do uh, if not n, return x, right? So n and equals 3f, if not n, return x, and then uh, return that, yeah. Rotate right. So shift that right and then shift this left. Pretty sure that's all you change, right? Yeah, shift that, shift that. Um, that should be good, right? Rotate right. Yep, I want to shift that by N and then I want to take the top part and shift that over there. Yeah, that should be good. Okay, so then we do a rottle 64. So rotate left the stack hash by seven, XOR it with the return address. And this should now fucking build. Son of a bitch. Um, it's format string. Did you include the header for built in rotate left? I didn't see a header for it. Typically, the built ins don't have a header. Unreachable code. Oh, God. What? Functions in trend.h. Oh, I see. Well, I'll keep this. It's more portable. It's done now. Damage is done. Um. What the fuck did I change, man? Um. What? What? Call stack return address. Did I like fat finger something? No, I don't think so. What? Like setting this hash shouldn't change anything. We can comment that out and it'll do nothing. Call stack hash. What? Is this something to do with this rotate code? That would make no sense. Oh, those are, mm, yes. Those are ending up earlier in the data section. Can you do uh, inline, can you do functions like this in, in uh, C++? Fuck. Okay, we'll just add it at the end. So at the end, here, program, okay, so we'll add the functions. Um, add functions we use. Bink, 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 bink. Make both those static functions. And then we just need to grab these. Almost there. There we go. OK. 
Okay, rottle and rotter. This should work. Um, okay. Unused function. Yeah, some jits just will never have that rotate. Okay, that looks like it's working. Now we can have call stack hash is equal to the old stat hash rotate by seven, and then we'll XOR with the um, return address that we have. Okay, so then we can reverse that when we go to uh, call stack ints minus, minus equals one. So here, what we'll do is we'll do state call stack hash is equal to um, rotate right 64 of states call stack hash XOR the target. Right? X for the target. And then we rotate that to the right by seven. Right? So we undo the XOR. The, the XOR is undone. And then we rotate it to the right by seven. And that should undo it. Right? That should now manage the hash. And then we'll have call stack. And then. The hash is equal to the hash. Okay. So this should now be tracking that call stack. And then we have a hash, which is unique in air quotes for the, um, for the call stack we're in. How's that? And we can always improve that hash or do whatever we want. As long as it's reversible, we're fine. Okay, once this JIT is complete, I will be curious to see um, the hash, the call stack hash at the end of execution. Are we doing emu in here? Run emu, yeah we are, okay. All right, so now, now we have a call stack hash. And that hash is just always up to date. So we can actually do everything on the Rust side of things now. Um, so compare coverage, we can just add the, um, I'll add the key. Info one, info two, just another U64. We're just adding shit in here to mean whatever you want it to mean. In this case, it'll be um, self.state.call um, stack hash. This might be a little bit thick. This might just lead to some massive input bloat. Surprisingly not, okay. Take snapshot 101 AO. AO. We have two inputs. Um, okay, and here we can say compare at x with csh x, and we'll just do uh, key dot one, key dot three, so we can see what's going on here. One, two, B70. Okay, so I'm most interested in my um, fault compare. Yeah, here we go. Um, T log.txt. Okay, and let's see if we can find this compare. 1026. Zero, okay, why are we not there? Whoa. Where are we, where are we in execution? Hmm. 
We're not running that emu, but that's fine. We should be getting to... Let me turn on tracing then. Chew. And this will hurt performance quite a bit. That's fine. It's worth it. Do do do. All right, I'll be back. Be right back. Ah, damn, these compile times are nuts. I just want it to be done. I want to see what the trace is. PC trace string. Um... Reset. Yep, print that. Which is, yeah. God, this is taking a long time. Oh, there we go, explicit panic. Okay, it's done. Wow. PC trace, so we can see where, oh, holy shit, we colored, we, we added the uh, symbols, holy shit. All right, so we can see what the execution was doing. Um, SFP, memset, we 
We are hitting F Reed, main plus 80. And we're hitting Fuzz Me. Uh, fuzz Me. Um, what has this done? Mod, load byte, add one to both of these indices. Sequency, add that to A5. Oh, set equal to zero. So is that A5 if A5 is equal to zero? I see, that normalizes it to a one and then branch not equal. Okay. What is what is that instruction? Is that just an and with one? And then we have a B and E. One or two CC. Why are we seeing dupes in here? 48C10, 1C20, 28, 2C2C, 2C. Oh, um, there are uh, VM exits occurring there. I bet, um, compare coverage. Covered for the tree condition. I'm not setting any registers. Thanks, <laughs> I got a rebel. <laughs> um, so I'm guessing we're having an exit due to compare coverage. Uh, so we can tee this to log.txt. I already did before. Log.txt, PC trace, 102cc. Okay. Yeah, so this one, we actually need a little bit of path hashing. Shorthand for set less than immediate, unsigned. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. Oh yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Um, okay, cool, so our path, uh, our um, call stack hash, in this case, our call stack hash actually is not helping us because we're not getting any coverage benefit when we loop back. So we're, we're firing off coverage events, right? We're, we're generating new coverage events here. Um, and then eventually we'll come back. Well, I guess we don't. We fire off one event, and then we get one byte closer. Um, branch if not equal, A0, A1. We see like another byte of differencing. Uh, and what size input am I using? Because now I have a 16 byte requirement. Um, I do use 16 bytes, perfect, okay. So this, in theory, uh, we're actually going to need a loop hash here as well. But I'm just going to turn this off temporarily, false, and be right back. Okay, let's uh, give it a little bit more perf. I seriously edit that in another editor. Typical, typical me.
All right. Um. So I'm not going to optimize this, but I think I should be able to find this if I don't have optimizations. Oh, yeah, and I want to do... Uh, I want to do the two mem compares actually. Um, dude, where is my risk v? Okay, there it is. And we'll just do dash g dash o zero. No optimizations. O zero is defaults anyways. But um, we'll grab the it out out, and we'll copy it to. It add out uh, multi mim compare. Multi mim compare. Okay. Let's see what happens here. Come on. All right. So we need a, um, we need like a loop hash or something. I'm trying to think about the best way to do that or like a path hash. Um, path hash. Um, call stack hash you you in sixty four t path hash. Okay, so now you have a path hash. Um. Self dot path hash is other dot path hash. Just make sure that we copy the latest there. Uh, state. All right. So now we have a path hash. Um. I think on a coverage event, I'm just gonna update that path hash. Um, yeah. State path hash is equal to rodl64 state path hash by seven, XOR it with the, um, the two. I'll put that in parens just in case. So, we will basically create a hash of all of the destinations that we're jumping to. Um, okay. That should work. Path has path hash. Rotate left by 7. XOR the target that we want to um, go to. That's easy. Okay. Now here we can just XOR self dot state dot path hash. All right, here we go. Let's try it. YOLO. Let's see if this works. Um. Path hash. I feel like this should work. Um. Hmm. 
Why would this not work? Is it my corruption? Um, no, we corrupt up to four bytes. Um, we have six inputs. Huh. Oh, wait. I'm I'm really dumb. Okay. Um. When I generate the coverage event, I have to use more factors than just the. Uh, yeah. We'll use that. I'm not x running it in the bitmap. Self dot state dot call stack hash x for self dot state dot path hash. It's a bit aggressive, but it'll do the trick. Okay, so uh, we take that x for the call stack the call stack hash and the path hash. This should just spew coverage. Fuck. Um. Wow. Wow. Okay. Call stack hash XOR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I wanted to see. This is what I wanted to see. Basically, we have an infinite amount of data. It's not unique enough. So I'm going to end the path hash with zero just for funsies. So yeah, the path hash is causing us to t detect all different loop depths, loop depths as unique paths, which is just causing a massive amount of input bloat. So to counter that, we're going to end it with ff. Right? And oxff. So we're going to eliminate we're going to limit the effect the path hash can have to only 256 values. And here we go. Got a lot of data. Have we hit our crash? I don't know. I'm going to turn this print off. There's our crash. There it is. Right there, boys. So, we're able to find, and we can see, uh, we'll remove crashes, and we'll just run it, just so you can see what the crash is. Crashing input is this. A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? And this is a bug that AFL is not able to find. So... Basically, the reason that we limit this hash here, because if we set this to FFFF, this is this will bloat a little bit less. But ultimately, the more information you in, include in your hash, the more shit that you have. Um, the, like you're gonna have a shit ton more inputs. You're gonna have a shit ton more coverage. Um, I can add that. Let me add a printout for that. Um, code space and where can I add this print fuck I'm like out of lines dude um unique crashes we'll go to six, seven maybe eight we'll call these just crashes uh fuzz cases per second we can just get rid of the that and go to like a probably like eight's good Code, honestly, probably an eight's fine here. Actually, like a six is fine here. Ah, eh, seven. And then we'll do coverage, which like a ten. Because <laughs> coverage is going to get hot. So here we'll do corpus.coverage.len. And this tells us the number of like records in our coverage database. Hey, 
Hey, we just barely fit in that line. Yeah, look at the amount of coverage we have. Now, we're, we're able to find this bug because ultimately, coverage doesn't matter. What matters is inputs, right? I, I don't care if I have 10 billion blocks of coverage. If I only have 659 inputs, I can reasonably fuzz there. Um, what's your experience? I've just been doing this stuff for like 10, 15 years. That's about it. I just find it fun. Okay, and then if we go back to the FF model, which I think is reasonable, this basically means we'll kind of uniquely hash the path that we took and we only have 256 different paths that we can take. Yeah, it immediately finds the bugs and look how reduced our coverage is and look how reduced our inputs are, right? And this is why a lot of the things that are proposed, ugh, God damn it, I'm ranting again. But this is why a lot of the things that get proposed in papers are not feasible because this, look at this, I'm finding bugs that AFL cannot find and I'm finding them instantaneously. In fact, let me go to single thread so it's a fair comparison to AFL. We'll go to one thread. And we're going to see how quickly we can find this bug. One, two, three. In two, two seconds, we were able to find that bug, right? And with AFL, we can't find that bug at all, even when we use the compare solving stuff. So, effectively, um, this the, the FF versus the FFFF is exactly why a lot of things that get proposed in papers are not generically applicable. We're running the most basic fucking program in the world, and we're running into massive amounts of input bloat already. The more information you collect and reason about from your program, the more what I call input bloat you have, which is ultimately your fuzzer saving inputs for reasons that don't, don't have any valid meaning, right? It thinks that these these cases are doing something different, and it's saving them because it's like, wow, I'm I'm seeing some new stuff going on here. But in a lot of these cases, it's really not that new. So, um, another thing that I could do to reduce some of that input bloat is add a pop count to our auto attempt to this. If I change this to a pop count, uh, auto, yeah, let's just put a pop count on it. Um, uh, I think it's like, let me find where it is. Pop count, okay. So if I do this, mm count bits 64. Right, so now we're doing a population count of the bits that are set. So this will now only track the unique, uh, fucking hell, um, Imantrin. Come on, please work. Nice. Ah, fuck. Oh, that's, uh, Knight's Corner. Yeah, that was Knight's Corner. I don't know why they have a different intrinsic for that. So I want uh, under under pop count 64. Yeah. I was about to say that MM made no sense there. Pop count 64. Okay. So now, instead of every single unique byte combination of compare coverage, we actually only go by the number of bytes which match or don't match. So basically, if you have the top byte and the low byte match, that won't be differentiated from having two bytes in the center match, which for fuzzing is typically fine. You don't care about, you don't care about which bytes match, you care about how close you are. Now, I'd argue both matter to some extent, but I'm curious to see how much this reduces my input bloat. And I might be none at all. Who fucking knows?
All right. Come on. Yeah, running this multi-threaded helps a lot here. We'll just, uh, we'll add some cores. All right. Come on. There it is. Okay. Caches look compiled. Looks good. So our inputs, honestly, didn't change that much. What was the, we're running like 128, 127, 113, 110. Okay. And then before this change, I'll just put this here. This should already be uh, cached in our JIT. 182. So, to be honest, I prefer to keep this one if it only means a 2x. Obviously, a 2x is a decent amount of growth on your inputs. But anyways, that demonstrates that we're able to find that bug that AFL cannot find. And um, what was it? Test.c? Yeah, we just do two different mem compares, and we run this. Uh, and we do this in the fanciest clang mode possible, which is... Er, L, uh, AFL mode where we give it the compare um, variant and yeah we generate let's see if we optimize it if we get anything from there and we'll add symbols why not yeah yeah it's just not gonna be able to find this and let's make sure that ours can do it when it's optimized um, this Build it optimized. Copy that one to multi mem compare, and here we go. Let's see if we can find it when it's optimized. Four hours. <laughs> Four hours. Easy, dude. And there it is. Yeah, we can find it in a debug build, in a release build. It doesn't matter. What's our perf? Perf's looking pretty good. 8 million fuzz cases a second and climbing. It's going to go over 10. There's 10 million a second. That ain't bad. Oh, yeah, and we're not even, uh, we're not even zooming in. Um... So, what is read? Read is 63. Delete this. And if this is 63, I don't know if this is going to break stuff. It shouldn't. Uh, 93. Ooh, it doesn't like that. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll keep it at 1024 then. All right, there's a crash. And our perf should be a little bit higher now because we zoomed in a, a smidge more. And then we can add another exit path here. Um, end case, perfect. I already have an end case. So what I'm going to do is... Um, We'll re object dump it. We'll look at uh, fuzz me and then this return path right here. Actually, I'm going to show you guys how we do snapshot fuzzing here. I'm going to show you exactly how snapshot fuzzing is done. We're going to go to fuzz me and I'm going to show you why snapshot fuzzing is so fucking awesome. So we're going to go here and we're going to say, um, I want this to stop at. Um, this is going to be a, a snapshot breakpoint. So we'll set this at, uh, whoa, we have symbol resolution. Fuzz me. This will be snapshot. And then we'll have a snapshot function get invoked. 
which will look something like this, and we'll say snapshot. And we'll error vm exit snapshot. Okay, so we don't have a snapshot, right? So we'll add it. Um, uh, used by break points to indicate to take a snapshot. Beautiful. All right. Okay, so I don't like that shit. It's not. It's, it's no good. Um, so what we want to do is we want to... We have the breakpoint, and we want on a snapshot... We'll just say... Um, oh yeah, that needs to handle syscalls. Get rid of this shit. We will refactor this code at some point. Um, VM exit snapshot. And this should be able to reach panic snapshot. So basically, we're going to run it in the emulator until we get to the snapshot breakpoint. There we go. We hit it. And when we hit that, we'll just break. And that should... Um, is that breakpoint just going to re-trigger? Let's see here. The answer is yes. Um... So do I have a way to do I have a way to remove breakpoints? Um, no, I don't. Pub fn remove breakpoints. Mute self pc vert adder bool self dot breakpoints dot remove pc uh, removes a breakpoint returns true if a previous breakpoint was removed. Okay. And then down here, we'll hit our snapshot breakpoint, and then we'll say remove the snapshot breakpoints. That's it. You son of a bitch. I think remove and returns a bool. Um, oh, is some. Just for some lifetimes. Okay. Let's go. All right, that makes sense. We're not going to find any bugs here. Maybe we're not hitting that breakpoint. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, and we're going to add another breakpoint, which is uh, end, uh, end case. Yeah, this will be end case. And we will resolve symbol um, fuzz me. Uh, we'll just do this. We'll hard code this temporarily. And we're going to say, if you make it to the return path, if you return from fuzzme, if you hit this instruction, uh, you're done. Get out. And there we go. Let's see what, it, let's see what we can do here. And this needs a vert adder. So we'll go and say uh, virtual address for this. And that's the end of the fuzz case. Beautiful. Why is that perf so slow? And why does it decrease? We're going to figure that one out. But first, let's make sure it works. And to get this to work, all we need to know is where the arguments are passed in. And we know that A1, or A0, A0 contains the, um, oh yeah, let's make sure, uh, fuzz me. What is this? Oh, single fault compare. That's the wrong fucking one, mate. Uh, Multi-mem compare. Fuzz me. So this one should be optimized. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It turned them all into load bytes. Ret. Certainly one ret. Blue. Branch of less than or equal to unsigned to AC, which is going to ret. Okay. And then A5. You know, does this even exist or did this get inlined? No, it exists. Okay, cool. So fread call fuzzme fuzzme will check if the length is less than or equal to 15 if it is return because we require 16 bytes otherwise blah 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 all kinds of stuff will happen so what we can do is we can say that this 
102ac is the end case. Bam. So if you make it to there, so we want to take a snapshot at fuzz me, so at the start, and then we want to end it when we get to end case. And this should help perf a little bit. There we go. Now we're doing 80 million fuzz cases a second. But obviously we're not finding a crash because we're not injecting the input. And I'm going to show you how we inject inputs. So before every fuzz case, um, all we're going to do is, so this is our, we have a worker. And our worker, we generate our input, and then we run. And we're typically expecting that we feed it in through syscalls. But we don't, we don't want to do that. We were doing 11 million before. This is this is an 8x speed up. So now what I can do is I can get um, buff is equal to emu dot register uh, register uh, reg register a zero. So we're gonna get the pointer to the buffer, and we're gonna get the length of the buffer here. So this will give me a pointer and a length to the buffer, right? We're at the start of this function. This is literally where execution starts. So I'm able to know that a1 is the length, because it's an argument, and a0 is the buffer. So now we know the buffer and the length. Um, ooh. Resize. Clear that. Honestly, I, I'm just going to pad everything. To, oh, yeah, yeah, it's not always 16 bytes. Um, so we go through and we don't have an input set up. Ah, yes. So what we have to do, this is just a hack. Um, before we start, emu.fuzz input dot resize 16 OU8. So we're going to set the length of the input prior. And now we should have a 16. There it is. Um... So what we can do is assert len is 16. We make sure that the length of the input is 16. Here we're going to resize it to 16 regardless. And then all we have to do here is um, and, oh, assert len is equal to emu.fuzz input.len and emu.fuzz input.len is 16. And then we'll do an emu.mmu.write. I don't know how to write to memory. How the fuck do we write to memory? Um, mmu, uh, write, read, read perms. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. emu dot memory dot write um, we're gonna write to vert adder buff as u size and then we'll write uh, this is a write from emu dot fuzz input and what does this return Uh, and then we'll unwrap to make sure. So we're going to inject the fuzz input directly into memory. And we're going to skip all the rigmarole of doing... Um, we're going to skip all the bullshit of hitting syscalls. And let's see. There we go. We hit the crash. And now we're doing 50 million fuzz cases a second. But that's kind of ass, and I don't know why. So let's take a look at our reset code. Um, tracing is disabled. Yeah, if it's, yeah. Reset memory state, reset register state, reset call stack and path hash, reset the file state, clear, extend from slice, other files. Is this killing me? I, I'm going to comment this out. So I'm just going to start commenting things out to see where we're losing our perf. Okay, so it's not there. Um, let's see if we're losing it due to the call stack hashing, which we shouldn't because the call stack hash will be zero and empty. 
and then main one. Yeah, that's not it. Um, register state we have to restore. Memory state, arguably we don't have to restore memory state right now because there's nothing that's getting mutated in this situation. Welp, we gotta figure out what we're doing with that. We're uh, really fucking up perf. Because we could be getting 520 million fuzz cases a second. All right, so now we know where our bottleneck is. It's in our memory setting. So we can go into the MMU and we can play around with uh, block sizes. So let's say, let's use a 16 block size. So we only restore 16 bytes when they're modified. And it looks like that helped us. Yeah, and that's climbing. So that helped us quite a bit. Now we're getting 200 million fuzz cases a second. Are we going to hit a, a million? Probably not. Or a billion? Probably not. I mean, we're getting slaughtered by our reset times, right? Our reset times are killing us. Um, and that hurts. That hurts. I don't like that. But... Uh, reset. So what do we do? Um, I'm going to get rid of this active allocation stuff just to see if that's hurting us. Yes. Yes, it is. Holy shit. Um... So, wow. That's good. Um, fuck. How do we do that better, man? Uh, active Elks. We need a... We don't want a clone. Clone would kill us. Um... I stored in a B tree map. A hash map might help us here. This this might help. Let's see. Not found. Oh yeah, it doesn't implement hash for vert adder. Now it does. Bye bye. Mm. Shit. I mean, it helps, but not much. Um. Okay, so, uh, active elks, map of an active allocation to its size, man, fuck hash tables, dude, do you have any thing we can do here, we can do this lazily, mm, no, we can't. I mean, we theoretically could. I could literally see if it's cheaper to just clone it, but I highly doubt it. Hmm. Um... I could do diffs. I could have the allocations be diffed. But then that's annoying because it makes it let much more complex to work with. I mean, maybe I'm just okay with this. Maybe I just don't lose sleep over this. 
I could get a 2x speed up, effectively. I know I could get a, basically a 2x speed up here. What was that? 20, 29 billion foes cases? Okay, let's compare it to AFL. So here we got AFL. AFL's running, it's fuzzing, doing everything it can. It's getting 7,000 execs a second, pretty good. You're just is not going to worry about it, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so here's our comparison. We have AFL running. It finds zero crashes, and it's doing 7.2 thousand fuzz cases a second, and then we got ours. Ours instantly finds a bug, and we're getting uh, 200, 220, 230 million fuzz cases a second. That ain't bad. <laughs> what's, our, what's our speed up factor from AFL then? Uh, 250 divided by 7201. Yeah, oh, 35,000 times faster. That ain't bad. Wait. Um. So. Okay. So we can do, we can do nine, nine point six hours of AFL fuzzing in one second. <laughs> this is why snapshot fuzzing is the way to go, guys. Now, obviously, yeah, we're we're starting execution right away, and then once it hits ret, we're killing execution. But this is the only part of the code base that can be affected by user input. So they don't care about anything else. But we got some good numbers here. I love seeing numbers like this. 20, 23, 24 billion fuzz cases. No problem. No problem. What's my H top look like? A wall of green for bugs. Because we're not doing any syscalls. <laughs> We're not doing any syscalls at all. Is the AFL using all course? Well, AFL, AFL unfortunately can't use course. <laughs> I mean, it can. We can. Oh God, where's the parallel command? Um, sequence one ninety two parallel. Echo this, some shit like this, right? Can you test yours one core to one core? Sure. I'll limit it to one core. Let's see, one core per, find the bug, and we're getting uh, three, three, three million fuzz cases a second. <laughs> <laughs> There's your fair comparison to AFL. <laughs> now, it's not fair. I'm doing a lot different of a job than AFL. AFL is fuzzing the entire application. Well, it's fuzzing from the start of main to the end of main, right? And we're only fuzzing the function we care about, but we have the ability to do that. Um, we're also emulating a RISC-V processor, and AFL is running natively on x86. <laughs> so, you know, little column A, little column B. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, 336, 6, 100. Divide that by whatever AFL is getting, 7,000. So we're 500 times faster than AFL when running an emulator. Snapshot fuzzing. It's nice. Everything we do is fully deterministic. And, and... We find a bug that AFL cannot find. <laughs> and I'm not ripping on AFL because I don't expect AFL to find this bug. Because 
as the program complexity grows, what we're doing will not scale. But I'm basically demonstrating, if I were making a paper, I could pretty easily make a tool that would beat the shit out of AFL. Because you just overtune it. But yeah, would this work on a real target? Maybe? <laughs> Maybe we can try? <laughs> we can find something to fuzz. Um... Let's see if we can get, uh, well, let's be more fair. I'm sorry, I'm being an asshole. Let's go into test.c, and we're gonna make this work. Uh, first, make sure we're building with optimizations, and we are, sweet. Um, test.c, and then we'll make this do AFL's speedy zoom zoom stuff, which um, I do in my uh, uh, cookie dough. Cookie dough, AFL test, foo.c. So what I want to do is we're going to make this a persistent mode in AFL. So instead of forking every fuzz case, it's only going to fork once every, in this case, 100,000 fuzz cases. Fine, we'll do a million. Like, who fucking cares? And then we can get the AFL um, fuzz test case buffer, and we can get the input len from here, and then I'll pass these in. We'll have flen. Um, this will just be input one. Right, so now we're using AFL in shared memory persistent mode, which is about as zoomy as you can get AFL going these days. So this will look a lot better for AFL. Um, make. Ah, fuck. Um... Buff, is that? Implicit definition of read. Oh, I s hmm? does that Does that use something it doesn't pull in a header for? Okay, so now AFL's getting more fuzz cases a second, right? It's almost at 100K, it's climbing, looking good, right? So this is basically AFL running in the fastest possible mode it can. It's no longer, um, Saving input files to disk every fuzz case that uh, the input files are directly being copied in memory and the um, And the what else is happening here? Yeah, we're looping in this tight loop. So basically we're only fuzzing fuzz me This is our AFL loop. We're only fuzzing fuzz me and AFL is passing us the input file directly into uh, memory So uh, what's going on here? Why did that get slow? Did I break something? No. What? It was going fast before, right? What changed? You guys see what I'm seeing? What happened? And let's make sure that uh, AFL is still working here. And we'll switch to a single 4-byte compare. Okay, something's broken right now. That's fucked off. I don't think the compare log stuff is working multi-core multi, multi -core then. If I run this... Hmm. Hmm. Okay, we'll add this to the make file. Um, arm RF outputs. Kill this. Kill a dot out. Mm, ignore the output. Okay. Okay. What is going on? Something's something's going on with the compare log, and I don't think it's working. Let's get rid of it. No compare log. Bye-bye, make. 
Oh, holy shit. Be running as pleb? No, I don't see anything here. What's what what broke? Um like this bug this bug should still be found. We turn off the compare log, but it should find this bug. What? It was going fast, right? Am I crazy? I'm gonna comment out all this shit. And this will be Flynn. Well, we really broke it. Um, what's the, there's a shared memory control thing. I wonder if we wrote, run out, ran out of uh, shim control. No, that's IPCS. Okay, we uh we really broke AFL. <laughs> hey Nitrix, you're looking cute too. So, uh, what happened? Did we like just... F like what? What's, what's happening? Porch fuzz. Like it was working. It totally was, right? I mean, maybe in this case, um, I think I need to get rid of this. Okay, so this should be able to find the bug. Path going up, it'll find the crash in like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got this, AFL. Come on, here it is, here it is. Like 150K. Oh, come on, dude. You got this. I'm so proud of you, AFL. You got this, man. Oh, one more path. It's almost there. Oh, five paths. Hey, there it is. Okay, let's try the, what was the compare shit? We did kill that process. So we'll try, um, What was the flag? Oh, compare log, dash C. Nice, so then it, it finds it much faster with compare log, right? Good, that's why you should be using compare log. If you're not using it, use fucking compare log. 
Um, okay, so now we want to see if persistent mode is working. And it, sh it should be... Um, buff is equal to that, and this will be Flen. Dude, where did the perf go? What happened? Like it was at a hundred thousand. What changed? What happened? I don't know if this works. Yeah, so there's persistent mode. Something's fucked with the shared memory mode. If I do this, what happens? Yeah, something's really broken with shared memory mode. Um, Dude, I, I have no idea what's fucking happening there. It was going at a hundred thousand and then it's just fucked off. And it's something to do with the shared memory stuff. I'm gonna see if it's a compare log and shared memory combination. No. Um, what broke, man? Didn't you run the seek parallel? I did not. I was about to, but I, I didn't get to it. What's going on, guys? How, how does... How does this work? Is the AFL just not cleaning up correctly? I mean, yeah, there's something. Something is persisting. And I, I don't... I have no idea what it is. Um. Hey, AFL's not that bad. AFL's pretty good. Let's be nice to AFL today. Read current input. Open at... Council One, thank you so much for your Twitch Prime. Hope you're doing wonderfully today. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. What broke? Ah! Ah! It was fine. It's not like the CPU is busy. It's it's about a quiet about as quiet as you can get. A bunch of Docker bullshit. Someone's just getting fucked. I mean, arguably. Arguably, arguably I had it in this mode, right? I had it in the double mem compare. Yeah, it's still not. What the fuck? If I do this, this will fail to run. We are of this. Okay, just the act of AFL fuzzing is killing perf. So we can isolate it down to this. Mm. 
Ach. Yep. Fuzz line from fuzz pointer, it enables this. If it's not equal to zero set fs opt should mem. Map shim fuzz. Get env. Is that a get env every fuzz case? No. No. Is that really a get a two get env's per fuzz case? I guess get env is effectively free. It's like a couple. Uh, it's like a walk through a list of environment variables. If you use mmap, shim open. Wait, there's no way it does that every case. This is when fork when it connects the first time for sure, hundred percent, hundred percent. Right? No, 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 no. ID stir. If ID stir, else. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No. You're not doing a shim open and a mmap every fuzz case, are you? Mike, what? Get out, you have shut the front door. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Yes, I don't think that's the case. Because I would be spewing. I don't think that's where we are. LVMRT. I'm just going to put a printf here. Shim fuzz. Oh, that's fuzzing setup. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's definitely setting it up. 100%. And then... While, okay, here we go. Here's the while forever. Um, child stopped. Yeah, it's not doing that every case. There's no way. Wait, pid, right. Oh, here's the persistent loop. First pass. If it is persistent... Read, write, ah, if document mutations, I see. So where does it copy into it? There it writes it. That's writing it to a file. Where is this used? Damn it. Um, here. This is what I want. And... Test case buff. Nope. It's equal to the map plus size of u32. This isn't happening every case. No. Oh, we should probably build it. Oh, is this even building it? Eh. 
That's building an RT, making the wrapper. Okay, let's. Um. I'm just gonna do this. I, I I'm kind of doubting the build system right now. Okay, it does work. Um, so that printf is not getting hit. Unless I have to write it to standard error, but I don't think so. I think I removed it or some shit. Um, so that sets it equal to map plus. Map comes from memory map. So the memory map is the shim file path. Um, shim base. Sh uh, AFL area pointer. Mem set. Okay, okay. I think it's a length followed by the buffer. Um, so shim base. Where does it actually write to this shit? Next. No, that's not what I want. Where's that fucking mem copy? Shimfuzz? Right with gap, use for trimming. Tail in. Otherwise, if there's an output file. So this is in shared memory mode. Printf moose. This will work now. This will this will print some moose. Holy fuck, that build time. Is it done yet? Moose. Okay, I'm expecting more Mies than that. I guess... Shimfuzz. This is what I care about, though. Fuzz run. We're getting there. Right with gap. Oh, this is where we were. Uh, shimfuzzlen. There we go. We're narrowing it down. Team in fuzz run show map fork server. Yeah, I like this. Ah, right to test case. So if you have shared memory, it will mem copy the case in there. Print a moose. All right, this will give us a lot of meese. Ah, if we build it. We should just get a moose spam all over the place. Moose! There it is. Okay, we found it. We did it. 
Okay, let's see what we're doing. Let's see what our rotation looks like. Stage curve, right to test case, run targets. Stop soon, crash mode, okay. Oops. Um. So I think, can I strace this? Hopefully this gives me something meaningful here, but I'm afraid it won't. Okay, what's going on? This is what I want to see. So... Yeah, it makes sense. It's just a bunch of IPC. So this is communicating with the fork server. Um... And... 231, 332, 233. Yeah, that makes sense. So this is reporting the like fuzz case number, I think, to the uh, fork server. But this is basically all the fork server comms that are going on. And this is why AFL bottlenecks on the kernel. Because it's doing uh, basically four syscalls per fuzz case, right? Minimum select, read, write, read to do like the basic package. Um, and for some reason, it looks like that's just catastrophically falling apart. Like... The message. <laughs> One of the unit tests crashed. Getting a bunch of the traps. I'm not sure, man. I don't know why it got slow all of a sudden. I'd reboot, but I don't want to lose my terminals that I have open. Oops. Make. I don't know why it got so slow. Like, it was fast at the start, and then it just fucked off. I mean, we can still do persistent mode, but this won't be the um, shared memory persistent mode, but something seems broken there. Yeah. It was like 120,000, I think. I'll be right back. Did it find the crash? Did it find the mem compare crash? Did it do it? Well, I'll be damned. I guess AFL can do it. Um. Yeah, there it is. What is it writing in here? 
Is that is that just pure coincidence that that says AFL? Oh, I bet it's getting that from compares. Yeah, it's adding all the compares to dictionaries, and then it's whacking those in there. All right, with a little bit more time, it finds it. Hell yeah, that's pretty fucking good, dude. That's that's goddamn solid. I don't know why this isn't the default mode for AFL. It really should be. Or did it get insanely lucky? How many fuzz cases did it take for it to find that shit? Come on. This is what Android devs when they're waiting for their IDE to boot. I fucking hate IDEs, man. Can't stand them. So why did it find it that one time? I'm gonna give it a minute. This really should be a default mode for AFL. I don't know why it's not. It's so weird, dude. Still hasn't found it. How many cases did it have before to find it? Did it get really lucky? Like, what's going on here? I think it is throwing it in the dictionary. I think that's largely how it works. Where's mine? Mine doesn't use a dictionary. <laughs> Alright, let's see. Who can find it? For oh, I already found it. Shit. Can I find Oh, oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, let's get rid of some of these prints. Bye bye. Ah, oh, that's the wrong thing. This one. I could maybe try a different program. I could try and add some more stuff and, and fuzz something else. Because I feel like I've demonstrated most of the things I want to demonstrate. I've demonstrated uh, why compare solving is important. I've also demonstrated that AFL already has it and it works pretty fucking well. It's not, it's not perfect, but nor is mine, right? Mine has a shit ton of input bloat, but I'm going to manage the input bloat by changing some tunables in my code. And I'll basically turn up the, the FFs up or down. What is something isolated that I can just call directly from main and I can read the file myself? Um, let me go take a look at, uh, brr, you know? Magma. Fuzzer benchmark tool. This. Bugs. All right, let's see if we can find any of these bugs. Um, it'll build it and then Is this the corpus? Oh, this is the corpus that you have to use. Okay. Um 
We're going to have a massive input bloat if we do this, but... So the patch... Um... Let me see if I can get Magma to just build this for me. What? Is that really trying to make slash repo? Oh, because it expects to be in Docker. Wee -oo, wee -oo. God, fuck Docker, dude. Docker's an excuse to code your shit in a way that you have no control over what you clean up when you remove your shit. I fucking hate Docker, dude. Um, honestly, a lib tiff is probably more fun. Ooh, what's, the f what's this? Useless. Check out all of those. Copy the fuzzer. What? <sighs> I'll just go build it myself. Libtiff, is that the buggiest one? LibXML, Poplar. The fuck does Poplar do again? Oops. Poplar. PDF rendering library. <laughs> Open SSL, SQL Lite, PHP. Lib XML might be fun. So there's a corpus. I can fuck with that. And what what is the okay, what is the fuzzer? Read memory fuzzer. I see. So So there's a read file fuzzer. And this fuzzer data provide. God damn it. Why is this shit all in C? LibXML does not expect more than 100 characters. Okay. XML reader for file. LibXML, XML reader. Okay, let's just. I'll show you guys how I harness shit, because this shit's ridiculous, man. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into Grizzly. We're going to find these uh, bugs that they talk about. It looks like 2017, 2016. So we'll go find libxml from, like, a long time ago. Libxml, we want libxml2 specifically. Okay, where's the download? There we go. That looks good. Um, I 
Lib XML2. Hey! All right, and then we need to go to like, what, 2006 or something like that? We'll go to, or wait, 2015? Oh, these are ancient. All right. 2015. One release in 2015? Ah. Okay. I've never used libxml. It's probably gonna be a shit show. Oh, fuck off. And then let's see what they changed in libxml2 2.9.4. Can I get some build notes? No, I can't. Okay, tar xf lib xml2. Uh, configure. Come on, please fucking build. I love autoconf. Nice. Nice. Ah, uh, that's pretty good enough, isn't it? If you watch my stream, you've probably gotten used to uh, not building things to completion. Son of a bitch. Do I need more than that? Pseudo make build, uh, pseudo apt build dep lib xml2. Include python.h? Yeah, python bindings. You gotta have python bindings. You can't make software without python bindings. You got a couple depths. It's gonna make building for risk 5 suck, dude. Hey. I think we did it. Mm, lib xml... Where is this? Ah. Uh. Where's my library? What? 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 Where's my where's my library? I think that's a file. Um, should be no make file. Just give me what? Um. Dude, I have no idea how this shit works. Holy fuck. Normally you just configure and build it. Maybe we'll do libtiff then? Jesus. Fuck this shit. I mean, we could figure it out if we spent five minutes on it, but I don't want to spend five. Oh my. 
Oh, you know it's good when there's, uh, CVS. <laughs> oh. <laughs> CVS. How you doing, girl? Damn. <laughs> Dude, I haven't used CVS since my FreeBSD days. That's fucking crazy. CVS is always a pain in the ass to work with. I really like Subversion. Mercurial is okay. Git, honestly, I like Subversion more than Git. But Git, since since Git has become the standard, I don't mind it too much. What is CVS? It's a version control system. It goes back pretty, pretty old. Mirror download site. Master download site. <laughs> okay, mirror download site. Whew. Sweating. So this is libtiff. All right, let's, let's take a look at the bugs here. Libtiff. So... There's a 2015 Let's see what version this affects. Tiff next. Uh, up to excluding 407. So let's go grab 406. And yep, that's 2015. So up to excluding 407 so we grab 406 this is the good one rate that build system let's see let's see how it behaves oh, come on come on Oh, jeez, that's a lot of make files. Okay, what do we got here? Ah, just some shit. Nice, it's building. Wow, this looks sane. It's not everything's a warning. I mean, it's it's largely warnings, but not everything is a warning. And then we have... Libtiff. Mm. Build. Oh. I got so excited. There it is. Hidden directory. Okay. libtiff.so. All right, let's see how Magma deals with this. Fucking Docker, dude. Get out of here. I don't understand how anyone finds Docker convenient. It's just a mess, dude. Like, look at this shit. Half this stuff is just documenting how Docker works. Fucking hate this shit, man. Maybe once you do it a million times, it gets consistent. But I find Docker typically is an environment. What you, you make Docker when you're unable to make your program work in more than one environment. I don't even know what Kubernetes is. I mean, I've heard of it a billion times, but I actually don't know what it is. Is that like configuration shit? I don't know. Showing my age. I hate all this new dev shit. I think it's just to make as much money as possible. A Docker hypervisor? That sounds disgusting. I feel like I've been hearing about Kubernetes for longer than Docker. It's like a control panel for Docker containers. It's Docker plus Google. Yeah, that sounds awful, man. How's everyone's days going? We're going to see if we can get Tiff going. We're going to see what they say. So they have... It's marketing hype. Yeah, that sounds about right. So this is the fuzzer. This is the code that I'm supposed to use. LVM fuzzer test one input takes a data and a size. 
I string stream, open the stream. Yeah, I can fuck with this. This looks reasonable. I mean, I hate the fact that it's C++, but clang plus plus fuzz.cc. Tiff.io, nice. Dude, I hate the smart autocomplete shit. Is there an include? No. Lib tiff. Is there headers in there? We're gonna see if we can get this to build here. Nice! Um, tiff dot li libs? Wasn't it libs? Lib tiff dot a. Um, undefined reference to inflate, uh, LZ. Do I need JPEG support here? Extern, it's not defined here. Unless this defines it. Two four one eight. What? Does anyone else see what I'm seeing right now? Oh jeez, man. Oh god. CVS is a bunch of shell scripts turned into a version control system. Yeah. You want to see some shit? How the US Air Force deployed Kubernetes on an F-16? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they had some engineer who thought that was a good fucking idea. Dude, I can't stand... Cla I just... Oh, man. Just lean back and put some fucking effort into your code. Not everything needs to be deployed instantaneously. Not everything needs to run in a unified environment. Maybe spend the extra effort to make your code actually fucking work and your scripts actually fucking work. And you won't have all these problems. It's just, it, it boggles my mind. I have never had a problem writing code that works on Windows, Linux, Ubuntu, OS X, FreeBSD. I don't understand how so many people like struggle even on the different versions of Ubuntu. What are you possibly doing that requires a specific version of a program? Like, what are you doing? Like, really, do you need to use that feature that came out last week? Fuck no. <sighs> the mind boggles, man. I don't know. Maybe I just don't like doing things in programming as much, and I enjoy programming more than the result of programming, but I do not understand the drive for a lot of these things. I definitely like the process of programming a lot more than the result. You'll see that pretty often. I just abandon projects left and right when I don't really feel like it. But, all right. Okay. Why does this code use set jump and long jump? Can we can we have a conversation about how you should never use set jump and long jump in really any situation? Like what are you doing? Stop. No. No. Please understand old code standards. Who does set jump and long jump? Why would you ever do that? If you use set jump and long jump, the only reason you use it is because your code is architected in the most bass backwards way. Generally more interested in soft 
Studying software architecture, then straight development. Security research is also a pretty good way to get paid good money to do it all day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why I'm security research. Fuck. Can I do this without JPEG then? I don't know. Is that gonna... Ooh. Can I say without JPEG? <gasps> I never trust autoconf to actually check for files changing. I'm reading a 2010 Linux book and there's a chapter about set jump long jump. I mean, it's good to understand what they are, but it's also good to understand you never should use them in really any situation. All right, JPEG support? Yes. Mm. All right, let's double check to make sure these aren't JPEG related as well. That's ah, Tifty code. Um, external codex. No, I don't want any of them. Stop. Can I say like no disable external? Oh, disable JPEG. Can I disable all external? Disable JPEG and Pixar. Why would I want Pixar? Disable. What other external things? Old JPEG, JPEG Zlib. So we'll disable Zlib. Disable old JPEG. What else we got here? LSDMA and C++. So this should be nice and clean. This should basically only have internal things. So this shouldn't have any external dependencies. But a lot of times stuff like this won't build because they kind of expect some of these things. Hey, uh, didn't I say disable CX? Oh, disable. Make this clean. Disable CXX. Now, this stuff is C++, isn't it? It's fine. We'll port it to C. All right. External codex? No, 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 no. Okay. Nice. Get rid of all those external depths. Now we're fuzzing TIFF. Not TIFF encapsulating a JPEG. Um, Clang++. Plus plus. Nice! Okay. Um, support Microsoft document imaging. Yeah, I saw that. Using the TIFF library. This is what I want to see. Do, do, do stuff. Okay, so TIFF stream open. And then get field gets tile size... Safe multiply malloc read rig bit image. Um, and what does that take? Does this take an FD? Tiff open. Hmm. Okay. I love this website, it's nice. Read our Rigba image. This is effectively what I want, right? It does some more shit, but effectively, this reads raster data. Let's take their example. Uh, 
Um. I love things that don't do int main. Okay, and clang formats. What's the in place? In place edit. Hey, readable code. For enough, done. Oh, the fucking two tab indents. <sighs> Why? Why would you format to that? The two space tabs. Don't do that shit. It looks like ass. Uh, needs lib math. Um, include standard lib.h, include standard io.h. Did we do it? Oh, we built it. Um, eh. Oh, I see. It doesn't. Mm. Hey, we did it. Nice. Magma targets libtiff corpus tiff read RGBA fuzzer. That's what we're doing, right? Read RGBA image. Uh, Eleven. Done. Done. Well, I'll do it for me. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at their docs. <gasps> Tiff memory. Oh. Is there a TIFF mem open? Um, hmm. Should we add the C++ support so we can do the TIFF stream open? Where's the docs for this? Where are the docs? In memory TIFFs, here we go. TIFF stream. In memory TIFF decoding. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna do some C. Fuck. All right. Now I have C++ support. I don't know if I have C++ support in, ooh. Do I have C++ support here? Ah, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Okay, so we'll grab this fuzz dot this. Clang plus fuzz. Uh,
Clang plus plus fuzz.cc. Okay. Uh, tiff stream open. Um, tiff 406 lib tiff libs lib tiff xx. Do I even need this one? Fuck. Um, tiff 406 lib tiff libs lib tiff dot a. Oh, we did it. Int main int argc char argv return zero. Okay, so this is what they tell me to use. And in this situation, I just want to call this with data and size. So I'll do uh, uh, char star data is malloc. I don't know. What's the largest input in the corpus? LSL um, mag magma. I always think of Austin Powers when you hear magma. <laughs> what a fucking movie. They only had three movies, right? Um, lib tiff. It was a what? The I can't remember what the first awesome powers was. Then it was the spy who shagged me, and then gold member. I remember watching that shit when I was a kid. Tiff, read. Rigba LSL. Looks like we can probably get by with uh, 16 kilobytes here. Thank you for the 15 bitty go routines. Great stream learning uh, well so far. Any textual references to get good at fuzzing? Probably those that you used and read. I actually have never read anything related to learning how to fuzz. All of my knowledge is just from randomly trying shit out until it kind of worked. So I've kind of YOLO'd my way through life there. See centered lib. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful. And then we should be able to do um, fuzz one. What does that return? Int. Hmm. Fuzz one. Handle error. I see. Register some shit. If not defined standalone. So I should be able to do fuzz one data 16 times 1024. Make shit. No matching call, because uh, it needs to be, hmm. I actually prefer UN8T here. All right, it out out, woo! Uh, so we're gonna do an F read, file FD is open. Magma fuzzers. Oops. Targets lib tiff corpus read eleven dot tiff. Fopen this. Read it as binary. Freed this into uh, size t flen is equal to this. Read it into data, 116 times 1024 using fd. And then we'll do data flen. Hmm. 
Did that do anything? Printf red image. Red image, okay. And if I did, this file shouldn't exist. Seg fault, okay, that's my fault. Um, okay. Wow, look at that, that's clean. Some Burks. So we open, we've stat. Burke, Burke. Let me see if I can cut down on some of those. F stat on one, because this is for uh, the right. All right, let's see what we can do. Get rid of read image. I'm trying to get rid of as many syscalls as I possibly can, so I can fuzz it as fast as I can. That looks great. We got our read. A sys info. The who? Who does this? Who does a sys info? What? Um. So we read the file. And then we pass that in, we do all this shit. I don't know why that would be doing a sysinfo. We open it, we read it, that's fair. Let me see if I can get rid of some of the Burks, and I'll do a write to one. Um, okay. There's the write, and then sysinfo. Who's, who's doing that shit? I'm gonna try and figure out who's doing that. Tiff stream open. S trace it. Okay, that's afterwards. It seems to be, oh, <laughs> is it C++ shit? That's fine, we can hook here. Fuck. It's something about Tiff stream open. Okay. Tip stream open, RM. Oh, is that C? Oh, that takes an I stream, okay. And then open for reading. Whoa. Whoa. Um, read directory, default directory. Does it actually read that input file? Do you think it reads the input file at all before it gets to here? I'm curious if I can mutate after that point and just skip all that shit. So there's ASDF. And let me see if I can Data is null. Oh, capital D, that's nice. Ooh. Oh yeah, we'll just clobber this. Uh, U int 8 T. So we'll try and make just a fucked version of this. Okay, why does it not crash? 
Why doesn't that crash? Why doesn't that crash? What the shit? Oh, because it's already been turned into a... <laughs> wee wee. Sig sev. Mm. I'm guessing I can just return error from that sysinfo, but this should be harnessed well enough. So we're gonna do a uh, CD tiff, make disk clean, eh, MV tiff, tiff x86, tar xf tiff, uh, CC is equal to opt rv64i bin, GCC, CXX is opt RV64. I have no idea if I can build um, C++ here. Um, okay. Okay, those are the flags that I want. These. Bam. Make disk clean. Okay, let's try it. We're gonna try and build this for uh, risk five. No multiplies, no divides. Made make files. C++ support. Using these compilers. Come on, please fucking work. Come on. <gasps> Fuck. Oh, wait. Yes, 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 yes. Um. Holy shit. Is it happening? Is the dream happening? Did this thing just take no fuss? <laughs> what? <laughs> Easy. Wow, I think we did it. Three point one megabito. I don't know. Not bad. All right, let's see if we can get this running in this. Um. Okay. And it doesn't need any args, doesn't matter. We'll do libtiff here. Make sure we hook realloc. Fuzzme in case we don't have yet. See what we got. Assertion failed. Took snapshot at this. Sys call. If we failed to handle the sys call, then we get out of there. Yeah, that's fair. Um, what file name did we give it? We could recompile it with a different file name. 
wherever we were building that here. And I think I, what did I call that file name that we use? Testafen. Let's try that. Oops. Um, make. Cool. Aesthetically linked. Copy. Run. All right. 43. Yeah, because we're not in this state. Um, in a BDC, libtiff, vim dash, in a BDC, F read. Load half word S zero. Let's see, what sort of what sort of shit do we hack in? Syscall go through. We have no fuzz me. We're in F read. And somehow that's crashing. S zero is null. Oh, F D is return F D is null. We don't have a null check on F D. So let's, uh, yeah, we kludged that one, didn't we? Let's see what we got. Yep. Nice. Fuzz one right here. This is where we want to start fuzzing and fuzz one. Well, we have it mangled, so let's uh, let's put a breakpoint there. That is the start of our fuzz case. Bam. Oops. Took snapshot at. Hmm. Oh, uh, did it get remangled? I mean, we can just hard code this address right now. Uh, vert adder. Let's see what we got. Oh, we're not hitting that. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. This is probably fine then. Um, the reason we're not hitting it is because the open is failing for some reason. And I'm not 100% sure why. Print, F, uh, print open this. We'll just pretty print hex this. What oh, cool following life? Ah, that's a fucking hard question, dude. Why is that the old path? Oh, because I didn't fucking change it. I thought I did. Well, that would make sense. I was about to say, like... And this should just be a uh, test FN. Okay. Let's go. This is it. Nice. 883. Remove breakpoint. There is no breakpoint for fuzz me. That's fair. It's for fuzz one. This. Yes! Fucking easy. All right. 
So a zero into S zero and S zero. I'm guessing that's our fuzz input. So we'll let this compile caches for a minute. Actually, let's add some threads. 192. It's going to take a while. JIT's a little slow in, in jitting it because we're going to see, but I think it's worth it. The advantages are kind of cool. Coverage going up, code going up, input's going up. Nothing too terrible in explosion. Um, yeah, so now we're taking a snapshot where? Took a snapshot at uh, 10 BD8. Yeah, there we are. We're taking a snapshot right there. It's exactly where we want to be. In fact, we could go even deeper and we could take a snapshot when the ice stream is being made. But honestly, this stuff is relatively cheap that I don't think it's worth bypassing. So, but we do have the same. What's, what's kind of fun is that this code will still work, right? Uh, print buff len is this len. Buff len is 16, right? So this logic will still work. Um, we want to also clobber that length. So we'll do emu.setreg register. So we're writing into that memory. We're going to assert that we have a fixed size length that we're passing in. So I'm going to change this code even more. I'm not even going to freed that. I'm just going to allocate, and then we'll pass in 16 times 1024 as the length. And that's it. That's our program. We allocate a buffer. We'll even, uh, now nah, we'll malloc it. OK. And now a0 and a1, so assert that emu.fuzz input.len is less than or equal to len, right? So that's going to make sure that the fuzz input length is in bounds of the actual length. And then emu.setreg register a1 will set with emu.fuzz input.len as u, uh, u64. So then we're going to update it. So we'll write in the fuzz input into memory. We're going to make sure that it fits in memory. We write it into memory. And then we're going to write in the length. And then we're going to continue execution from that stage. And we'll copy in that. Um, I think we set fuzz input down here. And we don't need to. So we'll just get rid of that. Get rid of one more allocation, which is kind of cool. And then this is theoretically calling libtiff and doing stuff. It's not actually really doing anything right now. Um, didn't I output coverage or something? I write it to stats. OK. Um, I kind of want the coverage information, though. We'll add that in a bit. Yeah, fuck it. Let's add it now. Let's go find um, code coverage has to and from edges. OK, so what we should be able to do is, ah, oh, shit, do I not have a way to do that? I don't know if my atomic hash table has a way. Oh, yeah, and let's change this to like 128 for now. I don't know if I have a way of iterating through entries in a hash table. I do not. Um, coverage bitmap. Let's. That's eight, eight megs. Let's go to 128 megs for that as well. Bump that up a bit. And decrease our collision chance. Because we just allow collisions. Totally fine. Not worried about them. But yeah, I want a way of getting coverage out. And to do that, effectively, when code coverage is reported, which is just here, 
I could write this out to a log file. So PC trace get symbol this okay. This is effectively what we want to do. So when we hit code coverage, if we hit something new, then we want to write this to a file. Um, new coverage is equal to this, which will be self.state.cov2. And then this will be the same. Oops. Self.state.cov2 as you size. Get the symbol. Bam. So we're going to format that. Ah, uh, fuck it. Let's add this too. It's going to look like shit anyways, format wise. So let's just do this. We'll figure out uh, formatting more later. Gets uh, two from from print. This should work. So we should be able to see all the new coverage as it comes in here. Nice, and that's kind of stable there. Nice. So we can see what we're what we're hitting in the code. Fantastic. So then we need to corpus we're going to do a um, coverage log file a coverage log file Coverage log is, this is going to be uh, mutex, new file, create, cover, uh, coverage.txt, expect, failed to create coverage file. And this will be a mutex, so we'll get exclusive access to this. So when we hit new coverage, which is at this stage, we'll say um, let CL coverage log is equal to uh, corpus dot coverage log dot lock unwrap, and then we'll do a write to the coverage log, and we'll unwrap that. Um, and we'll put this in a scope just so we can decrease the lifetime of that lock existing. In fact, we won't acquire the lock until this stage, although technically we kind of have a lock here. Ooh, gross. Oh, we just barely fit. We're a little tabbed in. Okay, so we grab the coverage lock, we write that shit out to the coverage file, and then we get the hell out of that lock. It's good, 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 good. Not found a mutex guard? Yep. Um, use standard IO writes. Okay, CL uh, 1328, I think. Mutes. All right. So now this will log all of the coverage to a file uh, coverage.txt, and we can see everything that we're hitting, all of the conditions that we're hitting. Um, so with this, we can see client open, read directory, read alloc, and... We end up returning out error external. So we hit some error. Obviously, we're not providing a valid TIFF. So I'm going to copy from the Megma. We're going to grab targets lib TIFF corpus 
tiff read our GBA. That's what we're doing. We'll copy all of those into inputs. And now input has these inputs. And this means um, resize. Get rid of that resize. And now we're going to grab something from the corpus, mutate it, and then inject it in. And we'll see if we get more coverage here. This will now be writing in an input. We might hit a syscall here that we've never seen. Yeah, we're hitting new code. Fantastic. Nice. So we can see, yep, read directory. Create an anonymous field. So we're hitting TIFF code. I wouldn't expect this fuzzer to find anything. It's also not really running yet. But we can see the code that we're hitting, which is pretty sweet, actually. Uh, read begin. It's obvious that it's parsing the image, right? Yep, decode, put tile, there we go. Yeah. Ooh, out of entries in the atomic hash hit. Wow. Yeah, we had some coverage explosion. Not too surprised there. We haven't had input explosion yet, so um, what we'll do is we'll set the uh, coverage this bitmap. We'll just change the size of this to, um, I don't know, 32 million entries? That might not be enough, but uh, 33554432. I'm not surprised. We generate a shit ton of coverage there. And then, yep, file has been reloaded. Yeah, we're already at 25 million coverage entries. And we're about to explode again. We're starting to kind of fuzz this. Where's my perf, though? Are we bottlenecking entirely on the coverage reporting? Was perfect expected here? No idea. Uh, looks like I found some infinite loops. I don't remember if I have a timeout set. If I don't have a timeout set, then we then we're gonna have problems. Let me see if the coverage is reporting. Um, yeah, read RGB image. So we're getting to that. Um, and let's see if we are actually hitting. So this is kind of the end of the fuzz case in a successful case, and we are hitting it. We're, okay, so we are parsing images, which is pretty cool, but obviously our perf is getting demolished. So let me see what my timeout is set to, if I even have one. Um... If it exceeds the timeout, 1.5 billion instructions. All right, let's figure out where our perf's going. We've got more time in the VM. I think it's creating these coverage entries. I'm going to temporarily disable the compare coverage. Now we'll have nothing in the cov entry. Ooh. Oh, yeah, this is going to have us read JIT stuff. Yeah. 
do do do. Oh, it's chugging. It's chugging. We don't really have a mutator yet, so I wouldn't expect this to find any bugs. I can't remember what our corruption strategy is, but I can guarantee you it's not good enough to find bugs. Um, we're getting a little bit better perf now, which is good. And we're still not really even fuzzing. Yeah, that, see the compare coverage was starting to bite us because it was becoming prohibitively expensive to record. It's probably because the path hashing was a little bit aggro. So looks like we're getting warmed up on caches here. And once these caches are warm, we'll restart it. And our VM time is looking better. 65, 66% in the VM. Not amazing, to be honest. But I think we're still ca caching just a decent amount of stuff. 42%. Okay, that reset time is ridiculous. Um, source. MMU. Let's see if we uh, if we up the block size. If we decrease that reset time. Ah, oh, fuck. That's gonna reach it. Whoop. Damn. 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 Makes sense though. Woo, some zoomies. Okay. Looks warmed up. Reset time. Let's see how it looks. Yeah, reset time has dropped significantly now. 120, it was just too small of a block size for the memory manager. Just spent so much time resetting sparse things. Oh, reset time's increasing. I'm just, come on, I just want this cash shit to be done. So I can see what my perf's gonna be. I triple E, oh, we're doing floating point. Yikes. Definitely some floats going on there. Hasn't even run a fuzz case. There we go. Come on. What happened here? Um, infinite recursion. Call stack is full. Very, very, very likely that that is infinite recursion. So I'm going to put that as a... Um, We'll put the max call stack to, I don't know, like, doesn't really matter how big that number is. Obviously, we're going to have to reach it now. Um, and then, we'll just get that going. And then, call stack full. We're going to turn into a fatal error. And this is very likely infinite recursion. Uh, 
Call stack full. Uh, the call stack was exhausted. Likely infinite recursion. Or a, um, or a, uh, or an uncommon call return uh, instruction sequence leading to a broken call stack. Call stack full. Call stack full. This will now be counted as a crash, technically. Uh, whoa. Max call stack. Uh, on fault type, the call okay. All right, here we go, and we can honestly get rid of the JIT cache. We don't need most of the stuff in there, anyways, because we've changed our mode. <laughs> Does this do to every chat? No, rarely. How do you get access to the HPC? I just bought it. This is 15 grand. You could get it for cheaper if you skimped on RAM, but I don't see the reason to. Fuck that. I need RAM. Everyone needs RAM. Okay, I'm contemplating going from 32 to 64. 32 is just right on the cusp of a little too little RAM, in my opinion. 64 is the sweet spot for, for a normal desktop or laptop. For a server, it, it kind of depends on how many cores you have. Like, I wouldn't run 64 gigs of RAM on this. This would be, that would be ridiculous. I'm probably already over 64 gigs of RAM right now. No, I'm only using 10 gigs. I guess this is pretty uh, friendly to RAM. Oh, you can see when it's uh, starting to fuzz. And then it gets stuck on a new block. And then it's jitting. And then it's jitting. And it's jitting. And it's jitting. And, and, is the JIT done yet? You can do it. Hey, we're running. Cases are occurring. Wonderful. And then we'll run it again just to see. But yeah, this should be a little bit more warmed up. Those reset times are nuts. I think it's doing a lot of allocations. I think our allocator is starting to bottleneck it a bit. I mean, the perf isn't terrible. It's not great. Our fuzzer's ass, right? Safe to say our fuzzer is absolute ass.
We could maybe make some of the path hashing stuff dynamic. It's another memory access every time it's used, but it's probably better than rejitting every time. And then we wouldn't really have to jit anything ever again. But yeah, perf's not terrible. Honestly, reset time's not ridiculous. It's not great. And then, yeah, we're using all the cores. No problem there. Looks like some are jitting. Seventy-two percent of the time in the VM. Eh, I don't like that. I mean, it's like eighty-five percent of the time is accounted for. There's like fifteen percent of CPU time doing something. I have no idea what it's doing. But we are hitting coverage, which is cool. We're hitting new stuff. I don't know how much TIFF stuff there is, and I also don't know what we're supposed to hit. Um, I'm guessing I'm forced to use that corpus to kind of comply with the terms of this. Um, magma. So there's a corpus. Do I want these? They look like they're likely the same. Same file names. So I'm guessing that's the corpus I'm supposed to use. So let's uh, let's start hamming up our, uh, our corruption. Let's get a little bit more aggressive here. Instead of the four bytes of corruption, let's go to uh, maybe a 128. Who knows? Yeah, we're hitting new coverage with that. New JIT's happening. It's just a bit more aggressive corruption. Yeah, we're going to cross over the 3,000 coverage barrier. Which is good here. But we, we should be doing input splicing and other stuff. Um, I also don't know if these bugs, there's more surface if we hit the JPEG side of things. So, quite frankly, I don't know if these bugs are even reachable in our stripped-down conversion of uh, libtiff. Our perf is dropping pretty bad. I think we found, like, a pretty hard looping input. Like, our million instructions a second are increasing, but our perf is dropping. We likely found a, a pretty deep fuzz case. Um... Let me see if I can change this timeout. Let's go to uh, 1.5, uh, 150 million instructions per fuzz case. I don't know if this is gonna hurt us. We wanna see uh, coverage around the 3000 mark, but this will prevent us from getting too fucked over by those deep inputs. It's still gonna be pretty bad. And sometimes setting that timeout will cut, cut out some good deep inputs. So it's it's a really tough mix. All right, let me see if I can turn on some of the compare coverage. Um, and I think I had the masks here. I'm gonna do an OF, OXF mask. We gotta rejet everything. But we're just trying to get comfy in our boots here. Figure out how we actually wanna do stuff. But until I actually write a fuzzer that does splicing, and actually does some mutations. Uh, byte flipping is not gonna work terribly great on images. Typically bit flipping is gonna work better. Like bit flipping just in general typically works a little bit better. So it can vary quite a bit.
Come on. Yeah, we're just about to blow up our coverage numbers here. We've got a lot of inputs, but it's not terrible. We have 140,000 inputs, but that's actually in the manageable ballpark. Coverage is actually starting to fall off. We're like, we're really brushing up on our 33 million coverage uh, limitation. So we'll probably bump that up. Yeah, there's our 32. 144 mil, uh, 144,000 inputs. 144,000 inputs is too much at this perf rate. If we were doing 50,000, we could do it. But this is starting to hurt us too much. Our perf's just ass. I mean, this is also including the JIT, so let's see. Okay. Maybe we're getting like 20,000 a second. And we're still jitting hard. We can see where some of the like compare stuff really starts to fall apart because we're tracking so many different things here. And that's causing us to have save so many inputs. Um, this is why in vectorized simulation, I have a way of filtering these things quite a, quite a significant amount. And then our perf's just getting destroyed here. I don't know why. Um, <sighs> we're just getting crushed on perf. Is it just these coverage entries? Um, it's got a 128 million, which is uh 134, 217, 728. This gives it a little bit more padding room. But yeah, I don't know what's going on with that perf. Um, so I think I can set a timeout of uh, a million here. We'll just go to a million instructions. But we'll see if this hurts our, our uh, code coverage. Yeah, we just have so much input bloat. We have decent we have decent uh, visit rates on these though. Like this is arguably sustainable. Just that JIT though. We're actually probably getting screwed over by having a soft float system. But I spent a lot of time emulating floats. Fetch normal tag. Our code coverage is lower than the 3000 that we have observed. So I am curious if we need those longer inputs in here. Our instructions per second is dropping as well. Pegged on all the cores, which is good. Yeah, 122 million entries in the coverage database, which means we're just hitting collisions, pretty much nonstop collisions. Hmm. I could mask off the um I 
I could mask this hash too. We'll mask the stack hash down a bit and the path hash down a bit. FF and F from two. And we gotta reach it. <laughs> Woo! Why are three 120 millimeter fans 160 Canadian? Cause, cause it's plastic currency, you know. All right. What? What? I didn't say anything, Geek Pirate. What do you? What do you? What do you mean? I'll let you know if currency is indestructible. So is ours. It's fine. There's a reason everyone, every country wants our currency, not your fucking currency. What are you gonna do with Canadian dollars? Exchange them for U.S. dollars for penny on the dollar? Like. What else is the value for Canadian dollars other than being able to exchange it into USD, the real currency? Just you wait. I get a few months and maybe, or maybe a year. Is Canada deleting all their money? Hopefully we'll be back to one to one. No fucking way. Nope. One to one in your dreams, dude. <laughs> I dream big. What even is it at now? S 73? Let's see. Seven, yeah, seventy four fifty. It was at sixty eight in May. Woo! Yeah. I don't know. You can always trade trade it for uh, real money if you if you ever need some real money. You know, you can always switch over to Papa USD. You know. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is dramatically helping with coverage. 2013 was the last time we were one-to-one. -one. It's been a while, hasn't it? Oh, what's that crash in there? That's probably not a cr That's probably the infinite recursion. But we'll see if it repros. What kind of bug do we got there? Um, LS... Lib tiff. Oops. Buzz with emus crashes. Oh, a read bug. Oh, what's how you doing, girl? Damn. What you reading out of bounds? All right. Will it repro? Um. Make x86. That's fair. That's fair. Make. Um. Right. Testafen. Wait. Am I writing to the screen every fuzz case? No! Why was I doing that? Okay, and then here we can do... Final times FD is fopen... Arg... Arg v1... Rb, if not FD... Return negative one... 
F read into data, 1 16 times 1024 FD, size T flan is equal to this. We'll just do this. But yeah, that's that's probably hurting perf a little bit. It on out tags. Okay. I don't know if it's working. Print tough got bytes flan. Uh, that should be an LLU. LU will be fine. Uh, oops, make x86. A dot out tags. A make file. Cool. Um, follows with emus crashes. Okay. We might have to build it with ASAN. Uh, sanitize san address. Why did we get a leak sand once, but not every time? I'm getting leak sand when I S trace. Huh. Not already prone, unfortunately. It's the same version and let's see where we are. Our crash is at this. So we're crashing in pack bits decode. Okay. Load byte unsigned pack bits decode. Given, and that's a read normal. What are the, what are the different bugs in TIFF? Bank, 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 bank. Oh, there's some JPEG stuff in here. Oh, and this is LUV. And that's Pixar. And Pixar. Yeah, we turned off most of this shit. Yeah, we turned off a large amount of these. TIFF directory, JPEG, chop up. Okay. So, what's going on here with pack bits decode? Do I have to build everything with ASAN? Is that the problem? Can I not just build the root thing with ASAN? TIFF x86 make disk clean. Uh, C flags is F sanitize address. Is clang, CXX is clang plus plus. Uh, F sanitize equals address. Mm, 
That 3,000 coverage, though. Damn. That reset time's nuts, though. I think there's just a lot of memory getting mapped per Fuzz case. I think it's just very Alec heavy. The VM time's really bad. But the inputs are fine. We only have 150,000 inputs, which is pretty sane. Okay. Yeah, you still run it with the random print statement, I know. Oh, I know. Uh, let's go fix that right now. We just comment this out. Comment this out. Write. Print. Make flan. Oh, yeah, we'll just do a uh, if zero else and if sixteen times thousand twenty four make. Here comes regit time. And I'm going to up the timeout. We'll go to 10 mil. Okay. Um... I want all these flags. Uh, I don't see them. Well, we'll build it stock-ish. F sanitize address. And is that getting passed to plus plus? It should be. Guessing clang plus plus is at the end. Where's the C++ stuff? Oh, there we go. Clang++. Plus plus. Ooh, no sanitize on Clang++. Plus plus. Okay, so we'll have to set CXX flags as well. We'll just be, uh, we'll just go a little bit ham. We'll set all the flags. I'm curious how much that'll help perf. Probably not too much. It'll save us a VM exit, but I don't think our VM exits are honestly that bad. But yeah, maybe I should have it building with the JPEG stuff because it looks like a large amount of those bugs were in the JPEG related handling. There's a good chance that we're really not fuzzing much here. Okay, clang, clang plus plus. Good. Now you should see F sanitized address on everything, including C plus plus builds. Um, and linking, we see it. Oh, yeah, I deleted the crashing input, didn't I? <laughs> It'll repro. Um, yeah, there's Clank++. Plus plus. Perfect. F sanitize address. Okay, and then... Hmm. Hell, JPEG... Oh, it's just uh, Zlib. Just Zlib. That's all we need. Oh, never mind. Um, I don't know what the LZMA library is. 
LJPEG. Oops. Wow, we did it. Cool. Cool. All right. Now hopefully we can get a crash to show up here. Uh, I might turn up the corruption. Or situationally turn up the corruption. Um, if rng.rand mod 2 is 0, corrupt by 128. Else go really aggro and just corrupt always 512. Okay. I'll get this loaded. But yeah, it's hard to say if ACM would miss something that I can find. Don't think so. I guess it depends how it was allocated. There's a chance. I don't remember if I handle M maps. I might M map to a specific size. I have the uninitialized um, memory tracking stuff off, so it's not due to that. Perf's honestly okay with the 10 million timeout. Um, ooh, code coverage up to 2,800. Nice. 51,000 cases a second. Obviously, our mutator is trash. We should be getting some basic constants and stuff as well from the compare stuff, but it won't be getting everything, of course, because we have it filtering quite a bit with the FF and the F masks on the call stack and stuff. Otherwise, you just you just have too much data to deal with. You need more filtering functions for that to work reasonably. Come on. Where's my bug? And we have a decent amount of cases per input, so I'm not too worried about having 90,000 inputs. Doesn't seem to be a big deal. We should be able to go through all of the inputs every like couple seconds, which is awesome. Now, are a lot of those inputs the same cr tr like trash? Probably. Like, it might be actually hurting our fuzzer because we have so many things that are just not meaningful inputs. But it's not something I'm too worried about yet. That'll be something that I'd try to figure out once I get some more introspection and start looking at some of these graphs that we're getting from fuzz runs. I just want that crash repro and see if I can uh, root cause it quick. I don't think we've seen a bug in our JIT. It, like recently I don't think we've seen a, a like something that would cause a bug to be reported like that hey we hit some new stuff yeah look at that 29 28 up to 100,000 inputs that's all right we've done 10 million cases so we've done about 100 cases per input which is pretty good So this fuzzer will probably start perform better late game than early game because it's so it's extracting way too much information. Let's see. Hmm. <laughs> I left and came back thinking you went out sleeping by now. Oh no, nah. it's not even late yet. Twenty nine thousand. Or 2900 uh, coverage. 
I mean, the JPEG stuff might be more fruitful, but I, I do want to see the crash that we found pretty badly. I probably shouldn't have deleted that. It doesn't matter too much. We could also work on getting this to build with uh, libjpg, or maybe we could try and have this build the specific patch version of uh, whatever comes with magma. Um, let's look at... Let's go into libtiff. Okay, and captain, I think is what I want. Build. Hmm. Building magma. Let's see if I can limit what I fuzz. Fuzzers are all of these. Oh, I see one of them is fuzzing TIFF copy and the other one's using this program. I see, okay. Ooh, a little messy. Here we go over 3000 here. I think our corruption is actually too aggro, so I'm going to turn their corruption down. The growth just doesn't seem too great. We're going to do a mod 16, and we'll do an rng.rand mod 128. So we have like a healthy mix of very low corruption and high corruption. And we'll see how this does. Already over 2,000, which is good. Um, all those fuzzers. Can I just do targets? Fuzzer under targets. So if I just say AFL, because I don't care, and then AFL targets is equal to lib tiff. Hopefully, the run, mm, still building that. Looks like our coverage has gone up faster here, which is nice. Perf is dropping a little bit more, but that makes sense. We have fewer cases that are getting clobbered and turning into just early exits. I also don't do any splicing, changing the input size. The, the fuzzer I'm using is ass. So we'll probably work on a, a fuzzer some other time. Just want to see if we get anything out of there easy. Building libpng. Uh, we might have to stop this for this to do anything meaningful. Building libpng. Let's try this. Is this actually doing stuff? Maybe? On like one core. Come on. <sighs> hey, there we go. Hey, container started. Okay, does that mean I have stuff here? There's TIFF copy. Um. Dude, where's it building those things? Where, where are these building to? 
I guess the Docker images. Since it's Docker, you have no idea where things actually are. That's nice. Um, Docker. There we go. Is there like Docker shell or some shit? How do I get a fucking shell in there? Exec, this, bin bash. Is that, is that not, is that not how that works? Is it this? Oh my God. Docker container LS, okay. Oh, did it delete everything? Yeah, okay, so basically it probably deleted everything on control C, which is nice, but kind of not what I want right now. Um, what? Unless I am supposed to use this number. Can I not go interactive? Dash IT, oh, to get interactive. Uh, Docker exec dash IT, hmm. Oh, we in boys. Um, So, so this is that fuzzer. How'd I get this shit out of the doctor image? Um. Docker copy, okay. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Container colon source path. Hey! Hey, we did it. Okay, so this is the libtiff and everything that they use. And this is the way that they build it. Static, enable shared off, building everything static. Okay, let me see if this works. Um... Uh huh. Fuck. Oh, targets a worker. Uh, new work. Target is new work dot slash. Okay, so there's everything that it built. Um, oh, is that supposed to be here? 
We'll give this a quid. Ho! Okay. Okay, so let me see if I can get this to build in the magma folder then. Um, targets. Lib tiff. Okay, fetch. What's pre install? Okay, this is just installing some shit that I might need. Cool, got it. Um, fetch, this is not gonna work. Permission denied, so we're gonna do tar uh, make dir, uh, test build. Target is test build fetch. Okay, so that's gonna clone all of those and then apply the diffs to them. Now oh, we control seed that, okay. Now we can run it again. Cannot stat test build. Ooh, does that, okay. Do we have to copy all this shit into there? Um, CD test, copy recursively everything from below to here, except for ourselves, And then we'll do a fetch target is quid. Okay, so then hopefully we won't have that source problem. I guess it expects that you clone into a copy of this folder, which is fine. I can make do with that. Okay, uh, I didn't complain about anything, which means I don't know what work is. Oh, work is target work, okay. So then we can do target, and then we've already done a fetch. If we do fetch, it will just do nothing. Um, and then we do a build. And this, in theory, is going to build everything and apply patches and shit. That's kind of what I'd expect. Ooh, CMake. Fancy. Okay. We did it. We built outside of a Docker container. Well, we're not there yet, but I'm pretty sure it's happening. Pretty sure it's happening. Oh, autoconf time. So the question is how do I get how do I set the compiler and C flags and stuff? Because I want to do that. Oh, is it not server? Is it computer? Computer, aha, there we go. Okay, building TIFF. Oh. That's likely linking against the wrong JPEG version. Um. That's probably linking against the wrong JPEG. I would assume so. That's maybe why they're using Docker here. It's because they didn't want to go and figure out the correct flags for all these things. But that's... Unless they set the um, library path, that's likely linking against the system one. Okay. Yep, copy this. Pre install, actually, fetch. Um, I should be able to do an LD library path. So we'll try uh, target is, oops, build. Dot sh. Well, 
What? What? Didn't this work before? Oh, build. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, fetch. Okay, and then what I want to do is in build.sh. Does this export anything? Do I need to export anything? No. Um, LD library path is, I'm just going to say dot for now. Just for funsies. Um, LD library path is ASDF. CC is ASDF, CXX is ASDF, flags is ASDF. I just want to see if this fails catastrophically. Mm, that's not a good sign. Okay. Okay. Um... Uh, LD library path is ASDF, CC is clang, CXX is clang plus plus, um, target is PUID. Hey, that's using clang now. Okay, cool. And where's that writing to? Test Zlib. Hmm. I'm just hoping that that LD library path breaks linking. That's really all I care about. But I'm afraid that LD library path is somehow going to evaporate. It's not going to be used. Come on, dude. Come on. God, this stuff is so slow. Check for L LZMA. Yeah, that shouldn't exist. <sighs> I might just need to manually build it. Yeah, it's a link in against likely system stuff. Unless it over overwrote it. But I feel like that's unlikely. Libraries have installed here. Um, unless libtool is working its magic, libtool, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, I, I don't know the best way for me to check. Uh, 
Um, maybe I have source line info. Hey, I do. JPEG decode. Um. I guess it doesn't really matter until I do the final linkage. Uh, bup, 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 bup. Let's get that running again. Um, libtool dependencies. Oh, Librator. Okay. Is that where it's installed to or where it picks up libraries? Kind of hard to say, but honestly, we're probably okay. So let's try and build our fuzz.cc. Let's grab this make file. And system lm and then we'll need a dash i uh, test work include okay include this um library path Use this. And then L tiff, L tiff XX, L turbo JPEG, LZ. Cannot find. Yeah, let's see what you're doing then. Playing for both. What are you working on right now? We're working on a, a Risk Five emulator slash fuzzer. Okay. Trying to figure this out first. Trying to just build some programs quick. User lib. Um, okay. Isn't that the library path flag? Pretty sure. Yeah, just dash capital L. We should be totally fine with that, unless it's not liking the tilde, but I don't think so. Oh, that changed stuff. Okay, it didn't like the tilde. Fucking hate tildes, man. Um, LZ... And this is not going to build because it needs LZMA. And is LZMA just not part of this? We'll just get that from the system, I guess. Kind of don't like that. But that built. Um... Build that clang plus plus O zero G make X eighty six average dump L D M Intel eight out out bim dash and then all I'm looking for Does this have ASAN enabled? Maybe? Uh, 
And then magma log. If def enable fixes, and if if def enable canaries. So if it's fixed, then it adds that. So we should be able to see uh, Pixar log. Pixar log is not something in our current fuzz stuff. Oh, that's the wrong one. This one. Okay. Pixar log dot C at eight oh four. Um Okay. Yeah, I don't see the bounce checks and I don't see the canaries. That goes to E4, which goes to um, BA4, jumps down to here, which zeroes and does a TIFF error exit. I'm guessing this is not enabled. So there's all the patches. And I'm guessing they're not in place. Actually, are those patches applied? No, they are not. Um. Well, that's a bit annoying. Um, well, actually, let's go to this directory. But yeah, I don't think those patches are being installed. Who the fuck applies those patches? Who's responsible for applying those patches? Um. Dude, I have I have literally no fucking idea who applies those patches. Apply patches. Magma apply patches. Okay. Um do it in a target, patches, setup. Okay, let's try it. Targets, libtiff, test, armor of star, copy our everything to here, and then targets. Then here we want to do a, a fetch. And I'm guessing before build, we'll want to apply the patches. Okay. And then we'll do a magma, magma, apply patches. Oh! Woo! 
There we go. What are the canaries? If def magma enable fixes, and I'm guessing that's not enabled by default. If def, if def, if def, if def, nothing here looks like it defines it, which is great. So that means we can now build. This will build with client plus plus. LD library path seems seems to not matter. Maybe. So we'll try this. Oh, there's our crash again. Yeah, same place. 3D670. Pack bits decode, reading a S2. Hard to say what that is. We'll uh, we'll try and... Um, actually, didn't I add like a repro mode or some shit? If we're in repro mode... I don't remember <laughs> what we do. I don't know if repro mode will work with our feedback mechanism. If it's repro mode, yeah, replace the input and then we inject it. So we actually hooked in the right way. So this should hopefully repro. So we do hit the crash, and then I'm guessing repro mode is intended that I use this with uh, enabled tracing. And then I probably turn off the JIT just so I don't have to deal with the JIT bullshit. And then we'll see if the crash still repros in this state. Um, yeah, we'll do this. Uh, we'll just do MU, and then we'll say let MU is equal to if repro mode MU else basically enable the JIT if we're not in repro mode but if we're in repro mode then run without a JIT um, and then make this mute it's by move so we should be fine okay and then we have tracing enabled and explicit panic. Okay, so now we have a log. A PC, actually, we'll look at log.trace. Uh, look at um, trace.txt. Hmm. Let's update our trace and make sure that our trace string also includes. Let's put it at the top. Um, let symbol is equal to this. Ah, oh, fuck. Symbol is equal to this. Print self, and we'll print the sim, and then here we'll print the sim. Okay. This will now give, I might add another new line here. We have the symbol, which is great. Um, I'm gonna add another new line beforehand just to add a little bit of spacing between each of the traces. So it's obvious where the symbols belong. There it is. So now we have a trace and we can see where we crashed and we crashed at uh, 3D670 in both the emulator and the JIT. Okay, and this is probably ready to be built now. So let's try this. Um, make x86. Okay, so that built. And now, if we pop this one open... Uh, Pixar log dot C eight O. Okay, so let's take a look at this now. Eight one three. 
So we have the Magma Canaries. We uh, should have 796. Yep. And then we have the jump not equal here. Um, if it is equal, then we fall through. And the next thing that we do is uh, we set some stuff up and we get ready for a loop. So this is setting up the loop. And then we're about to inflate. So yes, it looks like we have commented out that fix. So that looks good. Okay, back to this. We're at 3D3670, and it looks like we are crashing accessing S2. And S2 in this case is a 14E ADF. 14E ADF. Okay. Um. And I kind of want to figure out where that's getting allocated, maybe. One four E eight E F. Is that in range of the program, or is that in our allocator space? Let's uh, let's see. Oh, we have uh, verbose Alex. Ha <laughs> ha! Woo! Let's turn on our verbose Alex. See what we got. Okay, and then we'll vertically split with the trace. Boop, okay. So we have Malik returning. We are accessing uh, S2, 14, E8, EF. Uh, 14, EO, FO for 800. Ooh, okay. We take this, we add 800 hex. This is the end of the allocation. 14E8FO. We are accessing 14E8EF, but this instruction, um, uh, 3D670, this is adding one byte to it. This is one byte out of bounds. Read. Um, now, there's a chance that we have some emulation fault that's causing us to go down that path, but that is a one byte out of bounds read. So we will see if we can get that to repro. Um, but I'm pretty confident that is a real bug. So uh, to get that to work, we're going to go and uh, oh, fuck that. OK. Um, here's libtiff and. Hmm. So that's building the other libtiff. Yeah, let me um I'm gonna comment that out. We're gonna grab this. We're gonna build uh clang plus plus static fuzz.cc, everything the same, and then fuzz.cc. We'll set this to a one. And I think everything's ready for F sanitize. Okay. Libtiff. Uh, this is fuzz with emus, crashes. Okay. Um. Hmm. Let me see if we're getting deeper. Printf moose. Yeah. Oh, I didn't build it. Tisk tisk tisk. X86 on both of these. Put X86 on this. Pixar. Um. Hmm. Where is I building that then? Shit. Um. 
I mean, we can we can use this maybe as an opportunity to switch over to this version. Although I don't know if this bugs. I don't know. We we need to look at this one first. So. Was this terminal multiplexer? This is my window manager does this. Uh, configure help. C C is clang CXX is clang plus plus C flags is F sanitize address. Uh, CPP flags is F sanitize address. Configure disable JPEG. Disable Pixar log, disable LZMA, disable old JPEG. I don't know, I think that's close. Oh, sorry, uh, you're right. It's CX, it's CXX flags, thank you. But yeah, we gotta get this building at parity, and then we're gonna see if we can get this crash in. Hey, call me. How's it going? Okay. Let's see if I missed anything. Zlib. Bye. I don't trust configure to replace these things accurately. So, are we in the wrong TIFF? Yeah, we are. Lel. Bam. Sometimes I just like starting fresh, you know? Bam. Okay, so in this case, this will be opt RV64 bin GCC. And this will be opt RV64 inulib bin risk VG++. Get rid of the F sanitize. Okay, it's safe to say those are basically the same. Oh, host is equal to this. Make J32. Okay. Um, TIFF 406, XAD6. X86, everything here looks good. Make X86, F sanitize, uh, undefined reference to dynamic. Can I not statically compile? Okay. Edit out. Sweet, memory leaks. Um, Fuzz.cc108. Yeah. Uh, in this situation, free data. Okay. Let's add some stuff here. Um, SST. I think it's negative one. It doesn't distinguish between EO5, F, yeah, yep. If FLEN is less than or equal to zero, uh, pair F read error, F close FD, free data, return negative one. Ah, there's some freeze. Make 
Make X86. Oh, yeah, and we don't need the LZ main shit. Oh, that's commented out. Okay, A dot out. Fuzz.cc. Uh, cool, we got some memory leaks. But uh, that one ain't on me, so I ain't worried about it. Fuzz with emus. Crashes. Hey! 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 Yeah, we're good. We're fucking champs. Whoa! Easy. Yeah, we just had to build everything with uh, F Sanitize Address, and there it is, right fucking there. Look at that! Pack bits decode, pack bits decode. Let's get this uh, loaded in L format. Pack bits 246. Uh, let's make sure we have. Let's do, um, God, I fucking love hacking, guys. Oh, it feels fucking good. O zero G. We're optimizing for debugging right now. O zero G. LD flags is G, just in case that's not set. Make disk clean. Of course it repros. <laughs> of course it fucking repros, dude. No surprise. Whew. Sometimes I impress myself. Question is, is that Ode? <laughs> um Okay. Yep, building O0G on everything. So debug the shit out of everything, and then the linking passes hopefully also are passing G. Yeah, F sanitize on everything. Dash O0G. Make X86. O zero G. Okay. And here we go. Pack bits two forty four. Where do we crash? Pack bits two forty six. <laughs> I think it's I think it's safe to say that's probably just debugger uh, differences there. Um. A read of one at this. And this was allocated by interpreter Malik and to the right of 2048 byte region. Heap overflow. Yeah, there we are, right there. <laughs> that even uses diff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have a point. All right, thoughts? All right, taking over under bets. Over under bets, looking for bets here. Place your bets. Does this work on latest? I'm guessing this is latest. Latest software, 361. Wait, what? Why are these in the fours and this is in threes? Okay, now I'm confused. What am I even fuzzing right now? I have a feeling that this website is out of date. <laughs> uh, this looks good. 
This looks better. One month ago for some of this stuff. Okay. Tags. 410. Eight months ago. Does that look like latest? That looks fair to me. That looks like latest. Um, I want this link. I mean, I can I can get clone this. We can just do bleeding edge trunk. Oops. Uh, lib tiff get. Thoughts? Oh, fuck. They changed their... Oh, no. Please make a configure for me. Yes, we have a configure. Okay. So, we're going to configure it in the same way. Clang, CXX, OG, address sanitizer, disable JPEG, disable all this shit. So, we'll see. As you can tell, no one updates the website. <laughs> yeah, it looks like someone else forked it. Configure.com. Hey, someone's got to run it on DOS. <laughs> All right, let's make sure everything's disabled, but these are the same flags that we use to build it. Make files. External support? Nothing. Everything's internal support. Make J192. Looks like our compilation flags have taken... Looks like we're good. Um, so I'll do a git. And instead of tiff this, we'll do tiff git. Tiff git. Tiff git. Right? Git, git, git. Make git. Ah. Ah, libtiff git. Whoo! Thoughts, everyone? Thoughts? Taking bets? Taking bets? Where is that A out? Thoughts? <laughs> we gotta we gotta take some votes. Thumbs up versus thumbs down. What's the, what's the best way to vote on uh, on Twitch? <laughs> Will this crash? Is this going to crash? Run a poll. <laughs> Straw poll. <laughs> um. Will this be O day? Yes, no. Improve spam prevention. Um, okay. <laughs> There's the poll. All right, bet's coming in. Bet's coming in. <laughs> Will this catch? <laughs> Will this be a day? Oh, that's, there's some confidence here. Keep in mind, we found the crash on the 2015 version, so it's five years old. So will it port to modern? <laughs> Making me click on crosswalks. Yeah, I did. I did add the extra spam prevention with the captcha. Ooh, it's a close race. It's a close one here. There are some. There are some haters out there. These are. These are. These are some haters here. Should we? Should we dab on them haters? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's actually been fixed or do you think it's um do you think it's just changed 
Damn it. Shit. <laughs> uh, let's go take a look at uh, what source line that was on. Wherever it was at. Uh, we can just do make x86, rerun it. We'll have this just tell us where the bug is. So we'll go into um, ibtiff git, git blame this. Ah. Okay. Aw, Vim doesn't format these in a nice, pretty way? That sucks. There's no way to do uh, get blame vim syntax highlighting. Get blame information. Aw, sad panda. Because Swarns Twitch had a non straw poll option, I have no idea. So the bug was at 244, and we'll take a look at this one, see what changed. BP. So that was this. Oh, okay, look at that. Wait. No, this has the bounce check and this. Has something else changed? This code looks identical. I mean, there's this. This has gone away. Oh, is that the bug? Ooh, credit to OSS fuzz. All right, look at that. Lib fuzzer. Well, shit. <laughs> Dashboard, oh yeah, I could add a uh, manage poll, there we go. Okay, I do have a way of doing that, okay. Oh, well look at that. We did it. We, we found a bug that uh, Lib Fuzzer was able to find. Regression, reproducing test case. Well, how about that? We did it. Did we fuzz Chrome? Te like technically, yeah, that's used in Chrome. I'm pretty sure. I mean, this is OSS fuzz, but I, I think Chrome supports TIFF and it uses libtiff. So like, yeah, theoretically that is a bug in, in Chrome. <laughs> or would have been historically. Google stealing our O-days, damn. Raise fist to cloud. All right, let's see if we can get the shit to build an magma. Make der uh, risk V. All right, taking bets on if we're gonna get this t shit to work in risk V. So what do we do here? Okay, we do a fetch. Okay. Google stealing our O days, damn it. <laughs> Asshole. Yeah, it's a it's a bite flipper. I don't expect that to. I don't expect our bite flipper to really have a huge edge on anything. Apply patches. Patches have been applied. Patches deployed. Then we want to do a build. And to build, I think it did honor CC. So we're gonna go to opt rv64i bin gcc. And CXX is opt rv64i bin uh, g++. 
Okay, and that's about what I expected. Unknown command line option R dynamic. Can you not? It made some progress, and then it made not progress. Um... Damn. Uh, what's R dynamic? What is that? Experts the symbols of an executable. This mainly addresses scenarios, blah, blah, blah. For symbolizing the backtrace. Um, this is in lib jpeg turbo cmake lists. Where's that turbo? Test, CMake files. Well, how do I stop that? I mean, maybe I just set some C flags and it shuts up. C flags is equal to dash O zero dash G. CXX flags is equal to dash O zero G. Fuck. Yeah, it wants to use our dynamic here. Not supported. And this is in this ballpark. Yeah, I don't I don't know who's responsible for injecting that. Some of the CMake list file. Uh, bup, 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 bup. Run build command make on this. Unable is not able to compile a simple test program. Fails with the following output. Blah blah blah. Twitch thinks that's a website. <laughs> it's a good uh, good website there. Um, so do I have to tell it, how do I tell CMake, uh, different, uh, host? How do I set the host in CMake? CMake host system? Composite name, CMake host system. Uh, that's where CMake is being run on. Uh, CMake cross target. It's way more complicated. Well, what the fuck? What's the point of a new build system if it can't do basic build system things? Broken. Need to write a toolchain file? Oh my god. Why? CMake. We'll try this. Shit. Yeah. It's actually super, super simple. You need to pass it to CMake. The problem is I don't really know. Well, I guess I know that this is uh, libjpeg turbo. The biggest thing is I'm, this is like 
a build script that builds multiple things. That's not me. I didn't write this. Enable static. Install prefix. So here's the CMake invocation. Okay. So we have a CMake invocation that we can probably uh, party with. I see the toolchain file. Like, I, I see, like, this sort of thing. Well, that's gross. Um... Here's the latest release. Um, Toolchain. Provides the try compile, blah, blah, blah. CMake is invoked with the D toolchain file. Is set to true. Oh, yeah, you know what? That looks fun. Let's uh let's set that one. <laughs> YOLO. That one looks really fun. Fuck. Why is that what got copied? Cross compile CMake cross compiling is one? Hmm. I was hoping. I was dreaming. Oh, it's set to true, but I'm I'm guessing it just needs to be set. Guessing it doesn't actually care. Fuck. Um, CMake risk V. CMake isn't gonna read these. Oh, I see. It only reads D vars value. Okay, well that's nice. That's exactly what I want. God damn it. Well, we'll set this to true, see what happens. I, I know I've done this before. Fuck. I'm gonna see if there's a trick for this, but I just don't know who's injecting that. Um, yeah, it's just probably not supported on this uh, GCC version. Um, let me see how I do this. DC make God, this is gross, man. How is the fucking autoconf script easier than CMake? Like, that's pathetic. Um, system name? CMake. Host system name. This is ridiculous, man. Pass DC make sysroot. Dupe. Maybe it'll be smart and they'll be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh, maybe I should, uh, Maybe I should uh, cross build. Nope. It is using the sys root, which is cool, but it's still passing R dynamic. And that's coming from. Yeah. There's another flag. So you make cross compiling. I love how there's just like no, there's really no actual fucking, uh, we can set system name, but it's on Linux. 
for testing the host system. And do they have the same definition of host, where the host is the target? Because there's a processor. This is, so I can set this. Okay. No. Nope. Um, Linux.cmake may contain this. Shared library link flags. Awful hack incoming. I'm all for it. Let's get this shit building. I could maybe say it's a different target instead of Linux. Let me try this. Fuck. Um, I'm going to try and make it a static library. I'm all for that. Hey, hey. <laughs> Piece of shit, dude. I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's probably not going to build too well when it's building x86 assembly. It's not <laughs> It's not an X eighty six sixty four build. What a piece of shit build system, man. Does libjpeg turbo even support any other architectures? Not from CMake. CMake doesn't print it by default. Nice. Does it, does it just, does it just override it? What is this shit?
Um, if where does CMake store like temporaries? Is it in CMake files? Is it just like temporarily fucked up? Too lower, they lowercase it. CMake cache. Is this the only cache? Is it a problem because we ran it before? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I got fucked, Cash. See you later. Oh! It's doing different things. Oh! So fucking close. Needs log 10. Log 10 is libm. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have some libm stuff here. Wasn't that hard in the end? It was rough. It's about to get even worse. I don't think I have libm. I see a libm. Ooh. I see a log 10. I see a clog 10 at least. Um. Is it using my flags? Is it using my C flags? Let me see if it is. We'll just do uh, a little bit of this. Uh, wait, where is it? That one. That's a good one. That's one of my favorite commands. And let's try and see if we got uh, uh, waffles. Hey. Oh, that's Zlib. Um, Libman. Uh, this is actually an LD flag. How do I put this in verbose mode so I can actually see what commands it's in invocating? Just verbose is one. Find iname thing delete. That's a lot of work. <laughs> oh. Um, let me pass. Let me do this. Let, let me use this as the, um, this should be the, this should be the target. The sys root. Um, generic. What's up? Fuck. Um, 
can I do verbosis one here? Yeah. All right, what's she doing here? We got an LM, and we got a cis root. I mean, I can just give it an L. Like I can I can do this all day long. I'm not fucking scared. Shit's easy. Oh, you piece of shit. All right. It's building it with that. It sets a cis root. We got our C. <laughs> uh, I love how we have our C flags and then it puts C flags after our C flags. That's really fucking nice. That's that's exactly what I want. Mwah. Beautiful. It's exactly what I intend when I've passed C flags is for them to be overwritten by another C flag. Um. So you have the library here. Probably see make list overriding the flags, not see make itself. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, man. Blame libjpeg. I'm blaming a build system that fucking everything is handwritten. It's it's just it's just autoconf again. It's autoconf with minor improvements. It's still way too much control to the end user. How does your emulator even work with floats? It's all soft float. So... Oh, is this the... That's not the one that's failing to link. It's this one. And yeah, we're passing an LM. Um, TC bench C obj, undefined reference to log ten. I mean, maybe there literally isn't a log ten. There's a clog ten. There's a log ten f. There is a log ten. Okay. Go fuck yourself. Gotta delete the cache. Does it have to be later in it? Ooh. Yeah, what the fuck, man? Dot A's have to be at the end. But then why wouldn't it work with the dash LM? Unless it expects a shared object. I mean, what is this bench thing? Are we even gonna use this shit? Probably not. Eh. 
As this is a int main. This is a program. Yeah, that's easy right there. That's uh that's a six. <laughs> that's a six right there, if I've ever seen one. Bye bye! Get the fuck out of my goddamn territory. Bye bye. It's just six. What else would it be? And look at that! We make it. Oh, ho, 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 and it has hard coded GCC. No! No! God! Fuck this piece of shit build system, man! J Big Kit, let's take a look at what you're doing today, buddy old pal. Let's see what you think is the right thing to do. Oh, let's let's find where you hard code GCC. J Big Kit, maybe more like J Big Shit. All right, let's see your make file. Oh, a hard coded GCC, fan fucking tastic. <laughs> <sighs> quality quality build systems and is this gonna fail because some objects don't get overwritten because it gets confused that the make file has been modified probably okay okay that's looking good we passed some host flags how do you get how do we get configure flags passed here Ah, uh, configure. That's Zlib, and this is ah uh, this one. Is this the good one? Is this Tiflib? This looks good. Ah, uh, host is uh, risk v sixty four unknown elf. Ah, uh, looks fucking good to me. Let's go. Let's rip it. Let's rip it! <laughs> we got J Big Lib coming in hot. We got some auto conf coming. We're further than we've ever gotten. And can't wait for this to get to linking phase. Pass some flags to this shit. Will it use my C flags? Oh, there's my risk V. That's a lib tiff right there. That's a lib tiff right there, baby! Oh. Um, work lib. Okay. Well, there we go. There we go. Look at that! That's a TIFF. There's some JPEGs in here. <laughs> There's some JPEG stuff in here, probably, somewhere. Just, I don't know. A couple places. Looks gorgeous. Alright, so now we can go and build uh, LibTIFF. And we can go build this now. <laughs> These commands. <laughs> Oh, buddy old pal. Let's go, let's go here. You got a lib tiff XX? Oh, you got one right here in the home pleb village. Right there, that's where your libs are today. Read and weep, bitches. Uh, what about this one? Oh, lib tiff dot A? That looks good. Oh, there's a lib and a lib tiff dot a here. And we'll set some uh, sys roots here as well and get this all happy. Actually, the lm should work just fine here. Yeah, includes. Yeah, we'll give you a different include directory. This one looks good. Pwid. Looks fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, think. Make. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. That's a risk v statically linked with debug info not stripped right there if I've ever seen one. Ah, uh, dot out vim dash. Let's see if we got some turbo shit JPEGs in here. Ah, somewhere. Okay, JPEG. All right, what's going on in here? Where's my JPEGs? We got some. Uh, we got some debug issues going on here. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if we're gonna be getting a debug flag through that build system today. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. So the question is, is this build fucked? Or is there no JPEG in here? Does it strip unused? I don't know. Well, let's go take a look at one of these bugs. Let's look at this one. They all should exist. OJPEG oh, decode. So this should exist. Uh, let's see what I have for line info here. Oh yeah, yeah. We got some line problems. We we got source line info for our for our uh, libgcc. That's nice. That's good to see. But we just uh, that's C plus plus shit. Yeah, we got our main in here. That's good. And then we got some magma. So it looks like libtiff took our flags. Uh, and if lib Tiff took our flags, then I would expect some refs to JPEG here. This would be, uh, OJPEG here. Yeah, why is that not in here? Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if it didn't find some libraries. Let's, um... I wonder if libtiff configured to not support it. So let's go see what libtiff is up to today. Let's see how Tiffany's doing. Libtiff. Oh, repo. Mm hmm. Cool. Uh, build.sh. Looks like it's configuring like this. Let's see. Uh, let's see how it, how it believes this configuring is going. See what flags we got here. I'm curious if this stuff's getting, if it's not detecting, like the external or some some flags are unhappy here. Ah! Uh, is there a strip during the install phase? So let's see, we configure and then we clean and then we make it and then we install. I bet install is stripping. I bet this libtiff in libs. I bet these are juicy. Um. Yeah, there's the OJPEG. But where's the where's the meat? There's supposed to be a bug in OJPEG. That's that's where I want to be. Let's take a look at uh, what's going on there. We want uh, TIFF OJPEG. All right, let's have a let's take a little squiz at why this isn't building. Let's look at what if def if def OJPEG support. Okay, let's. Mm. Um, doesn't look like anyone's setting that, which is, uh, 
Oh, configure.com's looking good. Um, I feel like there's a good chance that whole thing got if deft out. And that was OJPEG. What did our configure tell us? Let's see if this says anything about OJPEG. Is that old JPEG? Do you think OJPEG means old JPEG? Well, we got old JPEG support. Wait, maybe. <laughs> Pixar. All right, let's see if there's any Pixar references in this shit. No Pixars either. Uh, oh, that's that one. Um, let's go to... Uh, this terminal looks ripe. Libtiff. Obj dump dash D dash L a dot out vim dash pixar no pixars either i i think this shit i add uh, isn't actually wor working yo what's up chaos midge how's it going how you doing today how long you seen it's been eight and a half hours <laughs> God fucking damn it. What a piece of shit, man. Why, why is that? I feel like it's not setting those in the configure. Um, if def. For some reason, that's not getting set. Fin def, undef. Who emits that? AC define. Oh, that's old. That's definitely old JPEG. Um, if test have JPEG as yes, have that as yes, then support this. Check for old JPEG. And then have OJPEG. Maybe it made separate lib files? That... Because, like, that has have JPEG. Have OJPEG. And we have both JPEG and OJPEG, I'm pretty sure. Which means this will do an AC define. But where is that even going? Like, I don't even see where it's putting that. It clearly hasn't placed it in a file, unless it's going into some weird folder. But I don't see a... I don't see where it's passing that. Like, I would expect one of these files, configure AC would end up producing a file that has OJPEG support. And why would that not be the case if it's doing an AC define? Right? I forgot what print I put in there, but hopefully it'll stand out. AC define. Well, I don't see it.
Right, this should be producing make files, and these make files should have those flags. Right, this should have the defines, and I have no idea why it doesn't. Is it host? Is it getting very scared when host comes by? Um... Just clean that shit. Get out of here. Disable shared. Prefixes work. Let's just get rid of all this shit. Clean configure. Let's see what you have to say. Can you sort H files by date? Maybe the most recent one is written by configure. Yeah, I'll take a look in a second. It should be in the make files where it puts it. Okay, then we'll build it. We're building it native. Um, this will go into lib tiff. Lib, libs, and let's see what tiff Oh, JPEG has to talk about today. And there is stuff in there. <sighs> Let's uh, see what we can do here. Um, this configure should fail. It will want host. Good. It's a good sign. I might just go and, um, I might put a pound error in there. Uh, support. This. Bye. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? Why? Things that still baffle me, native programs that take 200 millis to start. Is it Electron? <laughs> All right, we'll, uh, we'll pass in a DOJPEG support and just see what happens here. It's Electron, yep, mm, yep. <laughs> yup. All right, let's see. So I don't know if that's just due to clean failing or what. Oh, there we go, there's an error, yeah. Is something checking for jpeglib.h? Um. Ooh, AC define on quo. With JPEG 12 includer. Okay, we can do this. Um, I can fuck with that. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got this. Shit's easy, man. Uh, with JPEG... Uh, which JPEG is this? <laughs> I'm guessing this will do the trick. Actually, we have it built to, um, work. Include. Let me see if that works. Does that have... This is looking for a JPEG something, something or other. It was mad because jpeglib.h. Yeah, 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 that's in there. Um. Okay. Let's see if that just kind of does the trick for us. Make disk clean it, because I don't trust these build systems. So, we technically might need to specify this for each of the libraries, but let's see if this does the trick. Oh yeah, and um, let's get rid of the dubjpeg support. I'm guessing it's not finding that working directory, and it's reporting that it finds it, and then it and then it doesn't. There's probably another stage. So something probably checks whether or not you want to use it or something. I don't know, some dumb shit like that. All right, let's see that uh, build failure. Fuck. Okay, I'm just gonna add that to the include path then. Does this long jump? Oh, classy. All right, we're gonna do one of these bad boys. And we'll say, C flags, big eye. At least this one respects the optimization flags. And then we'll do LD flags is equal to dash big L. Um, quid. We're getting, uh, we're getting a nice configure uh, invocation going on now. Slowly but surely, this will uh, do what we want it to do. Question mark? Oh, shit! Fuck him good, dude. Is it, what was our error message? Bye. Bye. That's it. Honestly, let's go back to this. Uh, okay, let me... Uh, Okay, uh, history grep sh. Let's make sure we have all this shit. Target quid, GCC, these flags. Not respected by all the build things, but that's acceptable. We'll make it work. Um, we also have... Somewhere... We should have apply patches. Beautiful. So, and we don't need the li LD library path. We just need this. And then target fetch as well. Okay. So, arm rf star. Copy r dot dot slash start here. 
Okay, now we start running these commands. We'll run a fetch. Then we'll do an apply patches. J big shit. Bam. Apply patches. Okay, patches have been applied. They have been hunked. <laughs> um, now let's look at what command we used that was successful. Let's uh, let's make sure we have this bad boy in our C flags, and in our CXX flags and LD flags. We want to be this, All right? So we set the compiler. We set this. Honestly, let's set that sister as well. Um, That's the sysroot, because these will have the libraries and stuff. Okay, so there's our sysroot. We'll throw that in... Nah, uh... eh, fuck it. We'll just throw them in all of them. Okay. Alright, it's in CXX, it's in C... It's here. Okay, let's look for O2s. Nice. Um, uh, libjpeg turbo was the biggest CMake list. Dash O2. Uh, if it's GNU CC. What is this shit? For each C flags, go through and replace it with, wow. How about, how about no? Yeah, how about you go fuck yourself? Thank you, get out of here. Um, Is there any reason to believe this won't just uh, work out of the box here? Uh, how did we fix this again? Oh, we had to change build.sh to, oh, there's a magic string. There's a magic string. The, that, where's that dirty ass hack? Shit. in the chat log. I'm trying to find it in the chat log. Yeah, static library. This. There we go. To build.sh add this for JPEG turbo. Uh-huh. Vim uh, xargs build.sh and then I don't know we had a bunch of flags going but we'll see if this is all we need okay okay mm. one of the other flags we set mattered then Did we set a sysroot as well? I think we had a D, one of these bad boys, generic. And then we had a, we had a, we had a bunch of stuff in there. It was quite a doozy. 
Well, we'll f we'll slowly figure out which ones we need. We got dupes. Don't matter. Come on. Yes. So we have to set the target CPU then. Um. Uh, see, make target CPU. Host system processor. That's what we wanted, right? Yeah, that's the one we want. Oh, no, we want system processor. We just want this one. Dash D. This is RISC V64. I love cross compiling stuff. It's just nice and relaxing. C makes this route. I don't know if we needed that. E maybe? How did we solve log 10? Did we hard code that? Or is that sisterhood? Did we have a clean fix for that? Oh yeah, we removed it. Debuild testing is off. Oh, that'll disable building the testing programs. Oh, I see. And then that will, yeah, that'll solve this problem. I see. And then dcmake sysroot is equal to um this. Nice. So we'll grab that as well. And then I'll stop building the test things, which is what's probably fucking us on um, that log 10. This is the dream right here. Come on. Oh, it's still building these programs, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. 796. Hmm. Uh, this will be an 8 today. It's 6. It's an 8 today. It's, it's completely different now. Come on. Oh, yep. J Big. J Big, you piece of shit. But let's go take a look at our flags. Let's see if flags are being used. I love when things are mainly warnings. It's just a great indicator of quality. Okay, this one respects flags. And then we'll set verbose as true here. And we'll see, is this passing dash O zero G? Oh, there's O three. Ooh. Time to fucking Those are the CMake files. Do I gotta set those too? I don't wanna do a debug build. I just want debugging info enabled. This will do it, right? So the first project, O0G, no other overwritten flags. Okay, so that one understands that flags matter. And then this one, O0G, O0G. Okay, sweet, so they're back in there. And then we have this, this one, which is, um, Uh, J big kit make file. So this piece of shit. Oh, oh, G. We'll just, uh, yoink and yoink. Okay. 
I guess I didn't need to remove that for that phase, but whatever. Okay, and then we have the host issue. Um, yeah, I have to change this to have a host of this. This is it. Okay, it's not, not it yet. What? Oh, that was the wrong one. Um, there we go. It's blasting. O zero G. We're building. It's happening. This is libjpeg turbo. It's turboing. This one respects my flags because it's a champ, and that looks good. Um, work bin, and then we have to build this. Where are we were building that here. Make nice. We we're missing uh, JPEGs, uh, JPEG JPEGs. Um, in function that JPEG, which is good. We're missing inflate deflate, which is great. Uh, hopefully, in here we're we got some JPEG in here, which is good as well. So this is exactly what I want to see. This is awesome. Awesome, 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 awesome. So we're going to add a library path to magma. Um, and I should be able to change this to an lm ltif ltif xx. Uh, what else do I need in here? L Z L Z M A Okay, we don't have L Z M A. Uh oop. L J Peg and J Big. Where the fuck that is. Work lib. So we have L L J big. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, Pixar log. Actually, we'll just uh, yoink this to. We'll send this to eight. Okay. We want to see a Pixar log. Oh, and then uh, we'll Tiff Pixar log. And I want to see something in the 800 territory. Right? 804. Uh, dot C. 80. This might be good enough. Yeah, there's inflate. There's the inflate. And then before inflate, it doesn't look like we have those checks. That makes sense. Nice. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Tiffread.c colon in the ballpark of 490. Looks good. Uh, Tiff OJPEG in the 789 realm. Tiff loving it. Love.c in the 1587 ballpark. 
Ooh, 15. How big is this diff? Not too large. 15, 8? Hmm. Oh, uh, 70 and there's 90. Okay. So I have some rows. Good. Uh, tiff pixar log dot C in the ballpark of 1265. That's in there. Tiff dury dot C at 577. Okay. Tiff next at one twenty two. Close enough. Uh, Tiff dir right at twenty two. Dot C twenty two twenty. Um. Twenty. Right, dot C, 2000, there's a 2047, 19, oh, this is a relatively complex patch, maybe? This looks, yeah, it looks like that stuff is in here. This is in, uh, I guess this is the name of the function. That's in there. Yeah, we can just look for these function names, honestly. Decode compat, it's in there. Ooh, tiff print. No tiff print. I don't know why, but I'm okay with that one. Set extra samples. JBig decode. Oh, I bet JBig's got some bugs. Chop up single. Uncompressed strip. Um, Horak 8. That's it. That's everything. Woo! Let's do this. Leroy Jenkins. Not what I wanted. Oh, that was close. Bam, libtiff. Okay, did we have any hard-coded addresses? I don't think we did. Uh, fuzz one pkm. Is this the same? Yes, it is. So, and this should have jbig in here. Yep, a bunch of jbig stuff. All right, is this gonna have more bugs? Assertion failed, input len, less than len. Oh yeah, we gotta um, change that if def. I can fuck with that. Okay. Bam. Oh, this is in repro mode? Um, some, I guess something has changed about the program that it's not crashing in the same way, but that's fair. Oh, we've built a newer version. So that bug has been patched in this version because it was patched in 2017. We're in a newer version with backported unfixes to bugs, which is uh, kind of how this, um, this uh, magma stuff works. They basically take the latest and then they add the bugs in. So I'm not surprised. And then we'll take this out of repro mode and turn off tracing. 
Everything, uh, oops, compare coverage is solid. This is a last good chance to change anything about the JIT that we want, and I think we're happy about it. Okay, so here we go. So compiling the cache. Oh, you know what? Let's turn off the verbose Alex. Bam. Okay. So we'll see how much more code we have. There's a lot more shit in here. Um, and this should be statically linked, of course. Yep, statically linked. Debug info not stripped. And we should have source line info in nearly everything. Now, we'll probably want to actually fuzz on an optimized build, but this is just uh, a good place to start out. Actually, it probably doesn't matter too much if we fuzz an optimized build. Well, it's more memory accesses. Yeah, this will probably hurt performance. Um, no idea what coverage is going to look like here. Compiling cache. We're just waiting on this for a while. I wouldn't expect any crashes yet because we haven't really completed a fuzz case yet. And we're not splicing and whatever, but this should have those bugs in there. So before we had like 3,000 coverage, so I'll be curious to see how much more coverage we get with this, uh, with this new setup. Looks like a bit more. Wow, we're compiling a bunch of stuff now. Already at 2,500, and we've barely run any cases. Yeah, 3% time in VM. 2,700... Okay. Unoptimized build is going to be big and slow. It shouldn't be too bad. It shouldn't be too bad. Definitely a lot more stuff getting hit here. Still not really fuzzing. Only done a couple million fuzz cases. Looks like it's slowly settling in here. I guess while this runs, we could start working on an optimized build and just get that going. So we'll do... um libtiff magma uh no opt right oops whoa um so i'm hoping that we can probably hack this in j big kits make file now we're going to optimize, but with debug info. And then O0, percent S replaces with o, 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 with an O2, and G. Okay. So I think this is the command that we are running. Oh, yeah, I got to change the um, build.sh. Basically, anything that was 0 just becomes 2 and that's it. Zlib, we didn't change any of the flags, but I think Zlib honored the flags, actually. Um, the question is, is this actually going to build stuff? 
Because I think there's a chance that it won't actually really build anything because it's kind of already built stuff. So we might have to nuke everything. Yeah, it looks like that's using old flags. Oh, because these flags are old. Anyways, um, we're going to just nuke everything here. Uh, copy R. Yep. Now we want to build.sh and in here we have to set uh, host is this. So that's one of the changes we got to do here. And then um, yoink this. And then we have to add this to the C flat or the C make. Now CMake has all that shit. Okay. Then we run fetch. Technically don't need the clang shit, but whatever. Um And then we have to change that one file as well. That was fucked. But we can figure that one out too. So that's up and running, which is good. Okay, apply the patches. Done. Info, and then vim. TJ bench. Change this to a six. Um, vim. J big kit make file. Put that debug flag in there and then make this use uh, this compiler, GCC. Okay. And I think that's everything. And now we just run this command and everything will build and work. So that is O2G, which is great. I don't know if those have O2G, but I'm guessing they do. Yeah, because we set the C flags release, which we know were being used. Nice. Built. Uh, JBIG O2G using the right uh, compiler. Okay. And... Now we're on to building libtiff. And libtiff is... Coming through. And we should have O2G on these. And I, I see that. I see an O2G. Yep, O2G right there. Looks beautiful. And that's it. And then the TIFF copy or whatever. Um. Okay. So we should be able to kill this. <laughs> we actually did that build one, the cores were pegged, so not bad. Make file. Nothing changes here except this changes to no two. Make. And if we get rid of JBIG or something like that, this should get mad at us. Good. LJBIG. Okay. And then we're going to copy... We're going to copy this to here, and we're going to copy libtiff to libtiff magma uh, opt. Okay, so we have copies of all these things, which is great. Clear history. Make sure we don't break something. And everything here should be ready to go, unless we want to set anything here. Uh, OXFF. I actually want to try changing the path hash and the stack hash to slightly different. So I'm going to change these to FFs. So that's it. So stack hash and path hash are now FF'd. Same with it, them here. And then from and to, in this case, yeah, if collisions happen, not a big deal. Okay. Here we go. And then from this point on, I think it's just making the fuzzer better because we are definitely fuzzing this target thoroughly. 
not not thoroughly in terms of hitting or making good fuzz cases, but we are getting through the entirety of the code base. We're hitting a large amount of the, the code. So um, tail f uh, coverage, right? So we're hitting TIFF stuff. We're hitting JPEG stuff. Um, so I'm pretty happy about this. Might be time to make breakfast soon. Okay, got some printfs going on in there. What's for breakfast? Uh, sausage and eggs and pancakes. So actually a pretty full breakfast. I have some sausage I need to use up. I'm actually really fucking excited because I love like a complete breakfast. Ooh, come on. I actually haven't seen any JPEG or JPEG stuff in here yet. But I also am just eyeballing it. And a Pop-Tart. I already had my uh, daily, daily dosage of Pop-Tarts. No chocolate. Oh, shit. I actually don't have any chocolate. I'm trying to think of the last time that I had chocolate. It's been a long fucking time. I guess I had some, like, chocolate chunks in my ice cream, like, a month ago. <laughs> All right. Oh, look at that IEEE 754 doing some floating point. Mmm, there's our perf right there. Look at those. Them's got to be fast. Zip decode. Inflate. So we're decompressing images. Honestly, we probably have to set the timeout to be a little bit longer at this stage because these are now like hitting a little bit deeper into the program. Read their float array. I wonder how much floating point stuff is actually happening. Yeah, looks like it's warming up. Well, maybe uh, our first case per second is pretty ass. Our inputs aren't terrible. We only have 40,000. All right. I'm guessing we have a lot of these dying to time out. I really need to print the statistics of the frequency that certain things are exiting in certain ways. Um, I actually haven't seen any JPEG or JBIG stuff yet. So I would kind of suspect the JPEG stuff maybe goes deeper and our whatever 10 million instruction cutoff is just too, too aggressive here. All right. Hey, there's o, uh, there's OJPEG right there. There it is. We made our way to OJPEG. Our incredible fuzzer. Our bit flipper. Or our bite flipper. And there's a fuzz cases per second climbing. Yeah, read header info. Okay. Holy shit. Where was that bug again? Bug was in um, the first one, or the OJPEG. OJPEG decode. There's pre-decode. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. There's pre-decode, but there's no decode. Oh no, we're getting there. <laughs> I'll leave WD code. 
I don't know. Maybe I need to let it run a little bit deeper. Would you write actual? Would you normally write actual TIFF generators? Yes. If I want to fuzz anything realistically, I will write something to spec and kind of parse everything. Parse and generate. Oh, there's an OJPEG set field. Since I'm not doing any splicing or any like good mutation strategies here, I really don't expect to find that many bugs. Um, so. Set field. I don't know, maybe I need to give it a, a little bit deeper of a, of a run. Seems like it's pretty stable now. So let's some, um, let's see. So we're at 3,600 right now at 8 million fuzz cases. So we're gonna give it a deeper timeout. Um, and we're gonna say, hey, you can timeout. I feel like a billions aggro, but we'll try it. Yeah, we're hitting a, well. It's hard to say how much of this stuff is new that we're hitting. Our perf is honestly pretty good still, which is great to see. Um, yeah, we're honestly not hitting that much new stuff. Ooh, that stuff looked new. That was some uh, color conversion stuff. 3700. And how big is, so, how big is my coverage bitmap? I'm actually kind of concerned that my coverage bitmap might be too small. And that might be, we might be getting collisions on here. 32 megs times eight, 128 million bits and we okay we have uh basically we have maybe 350,000 things in there so our collision rate isn't going to be that high it's probably going to be like a one percent collision rate right now or maybe like a five percent not a big deal I'm fine with five percent collisions it's not uh not that huge of an issue but yeah we haven't yet found our way to ojpeg decode so I'm curious if once we get that, we'll start to hit more surface. That being said, having the compare feedback stuff is probably actually hurting us in the early stages because it's just causing us to generate way too many inputs when we actually want uh, far fewer inputs here. There's an OJ, OJPEG buffer fill. Yeah, look at that VM time, 84, 85% in the VM. That's great. Probably because there's, uh, and we're doing 40 billion instructions a second, 16,000 fuzz cases a second, which is pretty solid. Um, especially since we're effectively running ASAN here. Come on. Eighty thousand, and you know what? I think I can graph stuff here, can I? I think I actually have a folder here that's designed for it, but uh, I've been using SSH or X forwarding recently, and I've been pretty happy with it. So we're gonna go into uh, cookie dough. Oops, not cookie dough. Uh, we are in fuzz with emus today. And you know what? I don't have the plotting stuff here. So. Oh, and I kind of want to make sure. Okay, crash folder is clear. So I think I have like a fuzz results. Yeah. And this will pull down stats and give us graphs. Okay, and then we want to do remove star.txt. Okay, so now we can see kind of the performance of this fuzzer over time. x is pretty cool. A lot of programs. I'd like to run use OpenGL. Yeah. 
It works great for a GNU plot, which is good because it means I don't have to write like scoop scripts to copy things back and forth. Oh, look at that! We got a little, a uh, little uh, set jump going on. Ooh, mmm, mmm, mmm. Well, that's nice. <laughs> Fucking set jump, dude. Okay. I like this. Pretty good setup now. 15,000 plus kisses a second. Not, not terrible. Not amazing. What are we doing? 41 billion instructions a second. Uh, 41... 700, uh, divide that by 96 cores, 434 million per second, clock rate on these, like, you can probably do five, uh, you can probably do five billion instructions per cycle, so this is probably taking about 11 cycles per instruction, which isn't terrible, uh, if we turned off our ASAN stuff, we would likely see a lot of that perf come back. But this is likely about 10x slower than native per core. I mean, we can, we can try... Uh, let's run some AFL because we did build... We did build this, right? Um, here? Yeah, I think we have this built for x86. So let's go uh, try that out. And make x86. Okay. So we want to do the magma. Um, work. Lib. File lib tiff. Dot a. Uh, we'll just do a object jump d. Yeah, that's said x86. So we have an x86 build here. So we can put this. I know this make file's ass. I don't really give a shit. Um, bang include, and then we'll do a dash big L on this, and then everything else is the same as above, which is lm ltif, ltif xx, lz ljpeg, ljbig make x86 oop uh lj big okay and there is a lzma which we don't have so we should probably try to figure out how to get lzma working because if any of the bugs are lzma related or if any of the inputs in the corpus are lzma related we're uh, really nerfing ourselves so we'll probably want to figure that out as well when we turn on ASAN, how much do you lose? About a 2x. So, I'm probably about six times slower than native execution per core, but I scale linearly with cores, so I'm probably still faster than AFL, but we'll see here. Uh, we're gonna change this to an if one, make dir inputs, make dir outputs. We're gonna copy the inputs from Fuzz with emus inputs star to our inputs. So we have the exact same inputs. We have the exact same. Um, we have the exact same binary. Well, built for different architecture. And this one has LZMA support. And then AFL fuzz. I in, uh, we'll do quick and dirty mode. I inputs, O outputs. Um, A dot out, at at. Ah, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, fuck off, AFL, dude. Uh, ooh. Shit. We have to rebuild all this stuff with AFL, don't we? It's not, it's not a big deal because the x86 one is easy to build, right? So we're not too worried about it.
Um, target is PUID. CC is equal to um, AFL plus plus. AFL clang fast. Uh, and we'll home pleb these. Well, some of these things are have hard-coded build paths, so I'll probably have some problems there. But this will get probably the meat of things instrumented. Um, fetch. Right, it'll basically build anything that honors this, which won't get us libjpeg, but it'll get us libtiff. And libtiff is really what we care about. That's the that's the one that we're actually trying to find bugs in. So um apply patches. And then we should be able to just do a build.sh. Yeah, that took AFL. I think this one will not. No, that's taking AFL as well. Yeah, libjpeg's taking AFL. Uh, jbig is not. And then this will take AFL as well. Okay. Oh yeah, and this we want to use AFL++. Okay. So this will do... Uh, AFL++, AFL Clang, Fast++. And okay, that's done and built. That's done and built, and now this should have... Uh, oops, make x86. There we go. It's built with ASAN? Who the fuck? Why is there ASAN? <sighs> oh! Who the fuck said F sanitize? No one did. Oh, do we set do do we set it? Ha 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 ha. Woo! Hey! All right, there we go. So there's AFL running on this and it should be hitting new paths and stuff yeah it's hitting new paths i think it's safe to say that afl is indeed fuzzing this target and i expected to find some bugs here pretty soon so it's actually pretty pretty decent perf here the overhead of afl doesn't matter on this target because this target is very slow so, I wonder if it has a timeout. No, it hasn't hit any timeouts. I wonder how fucked we're getting by, um, so 15, 139. So we're about four times faster than AFL, but that's on the whole system, right? So that's not very impressive. Um... Uh, one over that. Yeah, so this thing were about 20, 20 times slower than AFL per core. Now, if AFL had ASIN enabled, it would be about a 11x. So, we're about 10, 10, 11 times slower than AFL. Watch, 
which honestly isn't too bad given we literally have soft float and we have soft float and soft multiplies and divides. We have no integer multiplies or divides and we have no floating point unit. All of that is emulated uh, using integer operations. And I think, I would imagine for image decoding, multiplies and divides are probably a large amount of our CPU time. So we're probably like, we probably have a 2x by enabling those features. So we're probably like 5x lower than AFL, which lines up with roughly what I see with the instructions a second. So I'd say for, for what we're doing, we're probably like 5 to 10x slower than AFL per core. But we scale linearly with cores, so we're still faster than AFL. Actually, AFL lost a lot of perf there. Well, how long has this been running? Let's compute the actual cases, per, the first cases a second. We're at 515,000 at 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Multiply that by 60. This is... Yeah, 3,200 a second. Okay. Yeah, it's actually getting about 3,200 a second. Stability, 100%. No surprise there. And in this situation, AFL isn't bottlenecking on... Oh, it actually is bottlenecking on kernel. Oh, holy shit. Yeah, then AFL would probably benefit from uh, persistent mode even for this target. God, I thought it could go faster than that. But yeah, I guess I don't feel too bad that I don't find bugs immediately because nor does AFL. Okay. Thunder setup decode. Oh yeah, there we go. We're at 2800 right away. Oh yeah, I'm gonna copy. Let's get a reference. And let's start tuning the fuzzer. Uh, copy stats.txt, stats2.txt. Plot.plot, stats large corp. This will be stats2. Stats baseline, stats three. I'm just making some boilerplates here. Stats no CC, stats four. So now we have, uh, we can start comparing some of these runs that we're doing. Um, so what we want to do is we want to see if we can get a significant improvement to this. And uh, I think one of the first things that I want to test as an A-B test is uh, figure out if we get penalized by having a tighter timeout because that helps us for perf. And I wanna also see, let's change one variable at a time. So we're just changing the timeout. Let's see what happens here. Okay. And wow, we're getting a lot more fuzz cases a second with that timeout. Yeah, and it's not hurting us. It's helping us a lot in the time domain. Uh, but we'll see if we have a cross here. I'm, I'm guessing we'll end up crossing. But we're getting uh, 40,000 fuzz cases a second. So this is now significantly... Like, we were getting 15,000 before. So this is actually pretty fucking good. And then let's see... Yeah, we're meeting up, honestly. Because this is a uh, coverage per fuzz case. So this is... this. Has this is not factoring in the speed of the fuzzer. This is only algorithmically in the fuzzer. So I'm using this graph to tell me whether or not uh, what I changed hurt the ability of the fuzzer to explore. And this graph is the, in the time domain. So obviously, yeah, look at that. We just nessied. Um, fan fucking tastic. So uh, we are slaughtering this by cutting down the timeout. It, it's worth the performance speed up. So far, there might be some situations where you need that timeout, right? So it's hard to always guess that. So this is kind of our new good one. So I'm gonna copy um, stats.txt uh, to stats3.txt. 
And now we have uh, another comparison that we can use here. And let's, uh, we'll kill this, and we're gonna start tuning some other things. So we're gonna disable compare, co oh, we don't wanna disable it there. Um, we're gonna disable compare coverage at this stage. I'm just gonna comment this out. So it's still going to be recorded. This will cause us to not regenerate the JIT, but it's going to disable compare coverage at the uh, runtime level, not the compile time level. So it'll still use things in the bitmap, but this cov will be zero and our inputs will be denser. And I bet this will help us significantly as I hypothesized before. The compare coverage uh, just adds so many more inputs and yeah, we're slaughtering, right? So like I kind of expected before, you don't really want to use coverage methodologies like that until you get kind of later into the fuzz run and you're desperate for gathering coverage because it dilutes your input pool and it causes you to not feed back inputs that are good because before we had, what, like 200,000 inputs? Now we have 500. So now we're doing 80,000 fuzz cases a second and we're feeding that back on just a handful of inputs. So we can visit every input like 200 times a second, uh, which gives us great ability to kind of explore uh, in those inputs. Now, eventually it's worth turning on things like compare coverage and you end up kind of benefiting over time from those things as you turn them on. What I would probably do is I would turn them on with like an and one mask and then slowly up the mask. So you're getting rougher and rougher uh, uh, kind of views. Uh, I would also want to prioritize the inputs that come from code coverage over the ones that come from compare coverage because I think they'd uh, typically be more dense, more valuable uh, for that feedback. So obviously we are slaughtering at this phase. This is just universally better in every way. It's better uh, better in total coverage, better in time to same coverage, better on the uh, performance. It's just universally better in every single way. Um, but there are probably things that we're missing because of this. So we might want to explore a different timeout. What are you listening to? Spotify is just way in the fucking weeds of just random shuffle. I don't even know what artist I'm listening to right now. Ed Sheeran. <laughs> I actually probably would have known that if I listened for a second. Pretty uh, pretty noticeable voice. But yeah, this is looking great. We're seeing fantastic coverage. We're seeing fantastic performance. 61,000 fuzz cases a second on a real target with fully emulated um, floats and multiplies and divides. Pretty fucking good. So hopefully we can get into the um, OJPEG code, but I don't know if we will. Not pop punk covers? Nah. I, I had that plan, and then it just drifted because the playlist ran out, so now it's just on random shit. It kind of seems to be how these streams go. I just turn it on to something I want, and then I eventually forget. Ooh. OJPEG read byte, read word, read header. I feel like we're getting really fucking close. So at this point, this is starting to get to the stage that I wish the compare coverage was on because um, we have, we've done what? 11 million fuzz cases, but we only have 700 inputs. At this point, I would like for a little bit, a little bit of feedback from something else. Oh yeah, that compare coverage is also hurting our perf as well. Just the, the raw perf of having those uh, compare coverage things in the JIT will be hurting our perf a bit, but not enough for me to care. Have you seen the neat Spotify uh, CLI tool written in Rust? Yeah, I have seen that. I haven't played around with it, but it looked pretty neat. I saw it on like Hacker News or something when it came by. All right. Yeah, it's pretty good. This is pretty good. Come on, where's that 4,000 SE? There it is. Oh, it should be here. It should be here. 3995. Give me that 4K. So, I'm going to actually cancel this before we get to 4K because since we changed the variable, it's time to check. Oh, there's 4K. Um, since we changed the variable, 
So stats dot text to stats four dot text. Now we have that as a reference point, right? Basically, every time I get a new record, I save it as a reference point and I kind of replace them in order of shittiness. So we're going to bump up our timeouts because at this point, maybe the timeout being larger would help us. So we're gonna go to 200,000. So we're increasing it by a factor of 20. And we're gonna see if this is outperforming. Um, obviously, fuzz cases a second is dropping, so we're gonna be very interested in the time graph as well, not just the absolute cases. But uh, yeah, it looks like we're, yeah, look at the coverage over time, right? So we're hurting on time, but we're doing better per case, which makes sense. We're getting deeper, more intense fuzz cases when we're looking at them. But um, honestly, it just crossed. So this is basically telling me that there's really no reason to let these cases run that long. It doesn't seem like we're picking up any new coverage when we do this, right? In fact, we're actually underperforming the other one just probably due to sheer coincidence. Um, maybe the, the inputs in the corpus, but we're clearly losing on coverage over time. I think in this situation, we haven't hit this bump yet. So we'll actually probably cross over when that occurs. So I expect that'll happen soon, but honestly, not looking too great for, um, for this setup, wherever we were on five, I think. Yeah, look at this shit, this is trash. It's a terrible run. Okay, so we're gonna change, we had it at 10 million. Let's try a million. So let's go the other way. Actually, that just nessied. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's the that's the kind of shit that happens, you know? Now, is that luck or do you need runs to go that deep? I think what I probably want is a dynamic timeout. Every time I hit new code, I should up the timeout. I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna see uh, how difficult that's gonna be for me to program in. I'm gonna set a timeout at 10 mil. And then what I'm gonna, I should be able to, um, uh, that timeout is checked in the code. And when coverage increases, uh, I'll bump it. So the timeout, when we reset, uh, Restore original timeout. Self.state.timeout is equal to other.state.timeout. So we'll restore to an original timeout value. And what we're going to do is every time coverage increases, we're going to just bump the shit out of that, that timeout. Um, now, is that going to cause issues with us getting back to the same inputs? And the answer is yes. But if we do splicing, which we don't do yet, uh, we'll actually get some of that back. So we're gonna we're gonna say if code coverage, if we're inserting something new, um, then we're gonna say increase timeouts uh, temporarily for this fuzz case uh, to explore more around the new code. So we'll do uh, self dot stats dot timeout plus equals ten million. Honestly, a million's fine. We'll let it run for another million instructions. Every time it gets new coverage, we'll let it explore a million more um, uh, with, a, with a longer timeout. A million more instructions. So I'll bump this up. Now the problem is we'll end up saving things to the corpus that hit coverage that we can't reach because the timeout is not set. So I might actually want to... Uh, I might want to put... Next to the fuzz input, I might want to set a timeout, but honestly, this is looking fantastic. Um, wow. Wow, look at this one. <laughs> looking good. I mean, honestly, this is not very statistically significant. It's only a like 2x improvement over the, the time domain. So it's mm, arguably not that big of a deal. But... Oh yeah, that's slaughtering. Okay, so let's see if I can get the um, 
the timeouts adjusted to that fuzz case. So our so inputs will contain an input and hmm. So is an atomic vector of let's say a U sixty four. Um, well, we only insert it once. I need the ability to overwrite this. I think what I need to do is I need to defer saving the input until the end. That way I know the timeout that got me there. So, um... Basically, self.state, um... Well, we don't need state, it's actually just on self, which is on the emulator. Um... Uh, uh, tracks, if this, ooh, do I want to do it here? Hmm. I have guest state. Yeah, I think so. Um, tracks, if the current fuzz case has generated new unique coverage. Um, new coverage bool. Uh, this allows us to defer reporting the input until the case is complete, and thus we can latch the timeout, uh, which was used to hit the coverage, right? So inputs.push here, and then we're going to do uh, self.newCoverageIsTrue. Uh, indicates that this case caused new coverage. Uh, and where does this go at? Trace colon. New coverage is false. Uh, fork. New coverage is false. And then on a reset, um, Reset that the case found new coverage. So we'll do stats dot or self new coverage is false. Okay. So then, oops, new coverage is false, true, and then we do it here. Um, Enable tracing. We don't do anything to the inputs. Uh, if self dot new coverage. Check if the input for this fuzz case should be saved. Um, and then This will actually cut down on the frequency that we hash the input, which is going to be better for perf anyways. So this is just fundamentally a better fix. Uh, reset that this case found new coverage. Save the input, log it to the hash table. Take our own fuzz input, which we have not reset. Um, and then we're going to push the timeout. Actually, we'll do this right away. So right when we reset, that's basically the indicator to start a new fuzz case. All right, at this phase, we will save. Uh, so this will fail to build uh, expected tuple. Yep, so we'll record self.state.timeout. And this will record the timeout that we use to find the crash. Um, we don't have access to the corpus here. Um, uh, 
I guess we'll make a self hasher. Oh, we, we need access to the corpus if we want to do this. Um, okay. It's kind of annoying that we now have this, but uh, once again, this, this is a playground. This isn't necessarily the way that I'd structure this code. So we'll go and find uh, resets. We'll pass in the corpus. It should work. Okay, I think we just have to ref that and it'll figure it out. Um, input at uh, 463 here. So what we're gonna do is if let sum timeout input is equal to this. Then we'll do emu dot set timeout to the timeout, right? So we're gonna build on the existing one and then we'll set the timeout to the previous value. Um, emulator this. And then we impl emulator uh, pub fn set timeout mute self timeout u64 uh, set the timeout for the uh, uh, fuzz case in number of instructions. Uh, this will be reset to the default value upon a uh, reset. So we'll do self dot uh, stats state dot timeout is equal to timeout. So set the timeout there. And we just have to deref that. It's going to be the best way to handle that. And then 529 main.rs. Here we push, if we had a crash, we save the input. And here we'll just get the timeout as well. Uh, get the current timeout for the fuzz case. Um, and this may change during the fuzz case. If we keep exploring new coverage, we may increase the uh, uh, timeouts. And what's great is all of this stuff, we can just disable the bumping of the timeout and it behaves the exact same as, as we did before. So it's important that we keep that um, same shape. So then here we'll do emu.timeout. And there we go. So now we're pushing the timeout. And 832, we're just gonna need to do the same thing. This is loading the initial corpus. In the case of the initial corpus, this will just be emu.timeout. I don't know if we've created a one yet. Um, we're just gonna create this ahead of time. And that'll allow us to use the default timeout for the emulator. Okay. So yeah, this now just works. And basically as as coverage is found, we add a million or whatever uh, to the timeout, and then that timeout is saved as part of the input. Um, that allows us to go back and retry it with the um, with that size. So we're probably going to see a dip in fuzz case performance uh, because of that, because we're going to allow some of these deeper paths. But the only way that will allow a deeper path to get saved is if it generated new coverage. So it looks like we're outperforming, honestly, not by a huge amount. And time-wise, it looks like we might fall behind. But I think we haven't hit a big Nessie yet. So I think we're just due for a, we're due to get a bump. And then I think we'll be looking, yeah, there we just got a bump. So we'll be sitting pretty here in a second. There we go. It's, it's pretty minor, but there are situations where that could actually be really useful and it could keep pushing an input deeper and deeper into uh, execution. So, I like that. Um, yeah, there's uh, 3,900. So... Yeah, I would say it's performing better. It's not by a very significant margin, and on the time domain, it's actually kind of hurting us. Um, 
So here's what I could do, and this is this is really fucking weird. What I could do is I could set the timeout to something like really low. And try to rely on this. Try to like really lean into this. And see what that does. This might hurt us for some of the inputs in the initial corpus. But as we get deeper inputs, we'll end up saving the new mutated inputs. So I think this might perform okay. Ooh, that did hurt us. Now, is that because our bump amount's too low? Let's try changing our bump amount to a million and see how this does. We're just playing around with numbers here. Um, there's our 3,000. Okay, that's... Our perf is fantastic. But our perf's going to drop as it finds those deeper inputs. So... I don't know. I feel like I can add 100,000. I feel like that should work. Maybe we just got unlucky with that run. Let's try it again. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine. Come on, break that three. There's three, and then I want to see like three, two, pretty fast here. We're just waiting for that Nessie. But this has like a really dynamic. Yeah, in this case, the perf is like climbing a little bit, and we haven't hit that Nessie yet. I feel like this is hurting us for the initial inputs. Um, yeah, I think this is hurting us with the initial inputs. So let me try setting the initial inputs here. I'm just going to set this to like a hundred million. So the, the, uh, the seed inputs we allow to go really deep because they're already valid inputs. They're not corrupt inputs. And thus we just want to let those ones churn as much as we can. Although we're immediately going to fork from them and start using those as the timeouts. So I don't think this really made a big difference other than setting the base initial timeout. Okay, so yeah, that's stupid. So that basically has no purpose. We'll set that to a mil and then we'll set the initial timeout to 10 mil. And I think that's our best combo. Gives a decent exploration at the start and then allows us to build on it if we really need to. And let's see. Yeah, we're already in the 33s. Like, yeah, come on. That's fucking gorgeous. All we're doing is playing around with timeouts. So, well, actually, I think we just got lucky here and this happened a little bit sooner. I don't know if this will reliably happen. Our perf is getting slaughtered. So I think something went really deep. Yeah. Oh, the shit. The problem is we keep promoting that. Once we set that long timeout, the long timeout stays. That being said, I think that means that our timeout will just get adjusted to the complexity of the program, right? We only save an input. We only, we only save an input that has a longer timeout if it took us longer to get somewhere. Now, the problem is if we end up mutating something at the start of that input, and then we inherit the long timeout, even though the new thing that we added doesn't require that timeout. So... The way that we fix this is we actually set the, this to, um, I think our instruction counts are accurate. I need to double check that. These instruction counts have to be accurate. Um, this is accurate. Every single time we start an instruction, we update insert exact. For the JIT, the way that we do it is, um, we update it from the state. Yep, so we flush it through to the state. And then in the JITs, we have it in here. There's our timeouts. 
And here we update it. Oh, we, we literally, every instruction, we update inserts exec. So this is accurate, which means what we can do is, um, oh, I can, I can save the number of instructions that executed when the, um, wow, uh, caused uh, new coverage. Um, if uh, sum contains the instruction count of the uh, most recent coverage increase. So, now, this will be an option U64, and we'll latch the, uh, so it will start off as none, none. If let sum insters is equal to this is new coverage, set this back to none, and then this will not be the timeout, it will be the instruction count the timeout will be the instruction count, and I need to make sure I don't have an off by one here. Um, Insters exec plus equals one. We do the timeout check on a coverage event. So yeah, we should be fine. We should include that because the coverage event will happen in the instruction, like when we do a branch. I could honestly just add a little bit of buffer room to it if I'm really that concerned. But I think I'm fine with that. I think this is acceptable. And then 1380, new coverage is equal to sum self.state.insters exact. And now, the timeout for a fuzz case, um, except for early ones, basically, the initial ones will just have the default timeout. But then subsequent coverage will have the timeout set to the, so to the timeout needed to evaluate all of the coverage for that. And we should probably add a little bit onto there, but honestly, this is probably going to do really well. Yeah, there's a big ness. I think we just got this late. That's all that happened. I don't think it's due to our change, really. Our perf's looking good. Um, but this won't let me explore much around that coverage. So I think what I need to do is add a little bit of room around it. So insters exec, and then we'll take this and we'll just add a million. We'll give it a, a million instructions to explore around that coverage to make sure that it has a little bit of time to explore uh, after that coverage. And we'll see how this does. I expect this will be the best one we've done so far, but variants can still bite us. It is the best one we've done so far, which is great. So now the timeout is dynamic based on coverage. If we, if we don't get new coverage, we don't keep increasing the timeout and we just use kind of a base timeout. And we inherit the timeout from the input that we build upon. And look at that, we're soaring here. Uh, we are basically 4x ahead in, ta uh, in coverage per case, and we're about, it looks like we're also about 4x ahead in the time domain as well. And this is just perfect. This is the best of both worlds. It will keep finding deeper paths that warrant a deeper timeout, and it will allow that timeout to exist, which is really, really, really nice. So, yeah, we just, all we do is we save the instruction count when we get uh, of the the best coverage generated by an input. Um, 
It's pretty fucking good. Coming up on that 4,000, which is often a little elusive. Come on, give me a Nessie. There's 4,000 and new code that we've never seen. So I'd really like to see this Nessie. Yeah, there we go. For the first time, we've we've been at 4,000 on these drafts. I think we hit 4,000 just barely before. There's 40, 35. All right. So I think I'm going to cook some breakfast while I let, just let this display run for y'all. <laughs> so I'll be back in like, I don't know, 20 minutes. Uh, let me do, I'll edit this. Um, uh, that's bink, bink. I'll put this here. All right, see y'all in a bit.
looks like we're getting some cool coverage. I'm going to call it there. I'm going to eat my breakfast. I'll uh, see you all around next time. See you all around.